This is Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Paul and Joe inside the Veritex Community Bank Studios. Our next matchup in our best hitters bracket, we'll do in just a second, but we're still taking your questions, of course. Question of the day, what's the biggest obstacle from the Astros getting back to the World Series in 2024? Um, let's see. Once said they're washed. Who said they're washed? Uh, 8270, the Astros' biggest uh, Oscar obstacle, I'm guessing, is they washed up. Okay, so this person drunk texting. Yeah, come on, guys. It's... 119. You know what? That's Wait till we're at the decoy tomorrow and take some Mexican candy shots with us. Yeah. Or we'll go to Highway Cantina later on and, yeah. and do the same thing. You know, like there's lots of there's lots of options. But uh yeah, I don't think this person's doing very good with the thumbing. So the idea that the Astros are, are washed to me, it's gonna happen eventually, but it can't happen this year. I just don't see how it would. I remember there were a couple of times over well, who's on who's on washed watch? Oh, that's a great question. A Verlander? Justin Verlander. If you're 40 years old, you're automatically on, you have to on watch watch. Altuve? As a pro athlete or not. As Don't be Jeremy Branham and say Altuve. I mean, he's the old. I'm thinking of old guys. Don't to, do to be that. washed, you have to be a certain age, right? Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. I, don't, I, I think his, his uh, he's season not last year and postseason. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that it's fair to, you know. He's on the watch up, list. He's on the up. watch list. Nah, I don't think he's even on the list. Okay. I don't. I don't. I don't so then know. Then it's Verlander. He's yeah. Verlander. Uh, Rafael Montero. Well, he's just on the sucks list. <laughs> Rafael Montero. <laughs> he's on. He's on. He's on two. Di- there's a. There's a, a Kobe wash list. So this guy's still good. This guy was never good. Yeah. And there's this dude's just dog. <laughs> Rafael Montero is maybe the most washed man alive, in, in that he, he probably smells amazing. Like that's how washed he is. Uh, uh, Ryan Presley. That one is a good one. I I, I think that's a good nominee. And look, like 35, speaking 35. of Ryan Presley, pause takes on Ryan Presley. I hate the. the oh. You're going around a long time, around a long time. They're keeping it. They're going to cut you down. Because it's ridiculous that everyone's shining the lights and, and waving them back and forth. So now Ryan Presley comes in the middle of the game in the seventh inning or eighth inning, probably the eighth inning as the setup guy. And they're going to do that. I'm sorry. You got to be the closer. You got to be the closer for that. And on top of that, look, Presley has had an incredible run with the Astros, and I'm not about to say he's about to suck. I'm not. But last year, it did not feel as dominant. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. That's why it's very easy for Josh Hader to slide into the predominant closer role. I love that Ryan Presley is still a part of this bullpen. He has done a lot for this team. He is not bad. But I think there's a good nominee for if somebody is perhaps going to all of a sudden find himself not being the same player he used to be it makes sense for it to be a reliever who is getting up there in age who has been here for a while and, and part of that's also he's going to be in a new role and you, you hear from time to time closers talk about when they're not in a safe situation because they're such psychos uh not being in a safe situation like they can't like perform in the same way as they can when it's like the game's on the line yeah ken giles for example <laughs> I'm punching myself in the face. Yeah, the Paul punches himself in the face. No, the, the nice part about Presley with that though is that he was a not a closer always. Yeah, in, in Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah. So that's you. Ho- you hope that he can revert back. And plus, he knows he's only doing it for one year. Yeah, I will say I am with Paul though. It is a bit ridiculous that the eighth inning guy gets the intro music. I also agree. I think he can get it on nights that he's he pitches the ninth and is going for the save when yeah, hater you know say haters got used the last two days and they want to give him a night off and so presley's the the closer then he, then he can have it but you can't you can't do it in the eighth inning yeah and it, honestly even when pitchers come in earlier they shouldn't use it it should only be for the ninth inning yeah. at all times Agreed. save it for the ninth but they're gonna use it he's gonna, so if you love it and you hate and you hate our takes on this because I, I agree with these guys. It just it should go away. Does this mean that Presley requested to keep it? You think? Mm, I don't know because that's uh, this seems like I an mean, all of brand. Yeah, that's what it feels. I, I was gonna say it feels more like a team thing, being like, "Hey, listen, we're sorry we took you out it. of the role, but we we're gonna give you. You still yeah. get this kind of treatment because you've been here for a also while." Also, the game ops people have to be in the be in the loop, and they're probably like, "Yeah, sure." Well. So what's Josh Hader gonna get? Uh, oh, McTaggart he, put out a poll about this. Yeah, uh, he was down to three, 
I remember three songs, and he was he t- apparently told McTaggart to like put up a poll, and I'll pick whichever one wins the poll. I want to say it was a Little Wayne song. I want to say it was. I think you're right. I think, I think it was a Little Wayne song. Yeah. Little Wayne song. I think it was Fireman, actually. Oh, uh, okay. yes. No, you're. I, 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 I don't know what that song sounds like, but uh, that that sounds that sounds like it would work. All right, who has a better year or hitters bracket? Alex Bregman, Yiner Diaz, our four versus five matchup. Ooh, Bregman. Yeah, I guess all the the top seeds are advancing in this one. I what Yiner Diaz did last year was in uh, what 100 games or so was really incredible. No one expected that. No one expected that, and you're hoping that you get more of that. But I, I mean, if Regman is ever going to be the guy that he was in 2019, an MVP finalist, what was he second? This is the year. I, last year, yes, he wants to earn a ton of money. I, I think that he had some good moments in the postseason last year. He he's been he has a full off season uh, where he wasn't dealing with an injury like he did last year to get better. Uh, Chandler Rome has that article out how he's at peace. It feels like everything is adding up to an Alex Bregman massive season. It does. It it, it the way spring training's gone for him, it, it it leans that way. So you know, Baseball Reference puts out they do projections before the season. So, baseball reference, their projections for Alex Bregman this year are two, hit 262, 22 home runs, 86 RBIs, and 805 OPS uh, versus Yiner Diaz. Uh, they have him at 830 OPS, 20 home runs, 58 RBIs, uh, 276 batting average. So, they have Bregman better in most categories besides overall batting average. I don't... So this is this would be pretty close if if it was that you would give it to Bregman, but I, Bregman's gonna have a bigger year than that. He's not gonna win the MVP. I, I don't believe he's going to, but I think there's gonna be a lot of moments where he's gonna have conversations about if he's in. He should be in the conversation. So I, it's Bregman for me, but I did struggle with this one. Okay, a little bit. Yeah, I, I wanted to lean Yiner, but just. Everything. It's Bregman. It's Bregman. Hey, hey, going yeah. just off the like last year's numbers, Yiner Diaz had a better year than uh, than Alex Bregman. Yeah, and but and he only played a hundred games. A lot of times he was the DH, and now he is gonna like Paul mentioned. I think in the first segment he is going to be the everyday catcher now for the Astros. So his production will probably rise, but also there is gonna be something to. It is gonna, just going to be harder to prepare when you're having to prepare not only the pitching game plan but also your own hitting game plan against the other teams, uh, against the other teams' pitchers. So I think that mixed. It, this is all the stuff that doesn't get baked. I'm guessing doesn't get baked in into the uh, baseball mm-hmm. uh, reference projections. Is that it feels like things are adding up for Bregman to have a good year while things are adding up for Yiner Diaz to take a like half step back or maybe just plateau at where he was last year. Not you're just building an improvement. Sure. I'm yeah. with you there. Yeah. So, right, so we're, Bregman advances. So the top four seeds advance. So Jordan Tucker or Jordan Altuve, Tucker Bregman are your, your four guys in uh, to the next round of our, our hitters bracket that we're going through today um, with, with Yiner Diaz. How long do you think it takes him to really get a feel behind what he's doing behind the plate to earn the trust of the pitchers? I think it's going to be quicker than you expect. And I read that piece by Matt Kawahara in the Houston Chronicle. He's the Astros beat writer for them now talking about how last year they had him work on blocking, Mm -hmm. you know, making sure pitches don't get past him. And he... At the end of the year, for everybody that was qualified, 300 innings as a catcher, he was in the 90th percentile. And if that was something that they thought was an issue before, okay, he improved on that front. Now the real question is the the framing and all the other stuff that you have to do. Because there is an art to making a ball look like a strike. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we still do not have robo-umpires. So there's a little bit of deception in gamesmanship. And I guess he has been working on that. So it sounds like he is a quick learner. And if he is a quick learner, then it stands to reason that things will move pretty quickly. But at the same time, with the way Maldonado was always described, you could scoff at it or be annoyed by it. Mm -hmm. 
But if everybody in the clubhouse is saying the same thing about Martin Maldonado in spite of his putrid numbers at the plate, there is some shred of truth to what they were saying. And it's going to be hard for him to be that guy just based off of the way that he's always been described. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I, I mean, you have to hope that he learned enough last year while watching Maldonado. Mm -hmm. It's It does always go back to the question of like why Dusty Baker clearly never felt confident that Yiner Diaz could make those adjustments and be ready to catch these guys during the year last year when he was so clearly a better player than Martin Maldonado. So hopefully this season... You know, that they're not the, – the biggest thing is I hope we never get a Martin Maldonado call. We will. But I hope we never do about people oh, saying – a that, caller calling in asking that they, about Maldonado. Like, how much they miss Maldonado. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, come on. We don't need a call. We got this guy right yeah. Yeah. Just, Paul, Paul just wait for, for Just wait for the Astros to give up four runs in a game <laughs> and Yiner to go over 3 uh, and Speaking be like, of it, at 2.30, yeah. we're going to do some Astros uh, prop bets, uh, the, but they're my prop bets. And Martin Your Maldonado, prop bets. they're my prop bets. Mm. I am the sports book today. Okay. We're going to try to start some fights. On the other side of the glass. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to try to start some fights with okay. these prop bets. Oh. With maybe the show that's on from three to six. Get the people going. Uh, we're going right. to try to get the people going a little bit. But we'll also, we'll also, and Martin Maldonado will be discussed during these. But our 10-minute drill, that's next year on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Stephen Holder writes for ESPN.com. 
he reported today that the Houston Texans, the team that they stole Daniel Hunter from, was the Indianapolis Colts. That he took less money to come to the Texans instead of playing for the Colts. It does sound like state taxes did have something to do with it. So, Texas for the win. Also, Indy blows. Yeah. Fact. Sorry, Vanessa. First class organization over here. Yeah. In a first class city. Didn't want to slum it over our, there. Our in, owners in, don't use booger sugar. I don't think. Well, oh, what doesn't Jim Irsay to, use? You don't have to push You don't have to walk that one back. Is, is Jim Irsay still stood by that one? Is he still in control? <laughs> I mean, I saw yesterday on Pat McAfee, um, they had this uh, very attractive woman who I guess is the vice president of the Colts who was in there. And it also sent, like, I forget what they had on the graphic, but it, to me, the second title that they gave her made it seem like she was the interim owner or something. I've always kind of wondered how involved he is besides what he tweets. At this point, especially. Because yeah. no one knows what the hell is going on with him. Everyone's talking about Kate Middleton. Let's talk um, about Jim Irsay. So it's his daughter, it looks like. Okay. Uh, and she said that her dad was doing better and uh, people were checking in on him, it looks like. So I would assume at this point he's not really running the show. And that it's it's really all the family that's running the organization right now, which not that's not surprising. Carly, he's kind uh, of Carly or say Gordon. Damn, okay, she's he's been married. going through it. That's <laughs> well, well, you're that trying to you're gonna fly to India and try to get in. Well, she has two last names. Well, listen, I, I'm running out of options. Sugar mama. So why not? I mean, I'd move to Indianapolis for her. Sure. What? You, I mean, it's Indianapolis. I know there's a lot of money. I'm just going to hold but... a boombox up and play uh, uh, In Your Eyes okay. by Peter Gabriel. I I can't. I cannot imagine uh, that would work well for you, Paul. No offense. Why not? So you, never I'm met handsome. This person. I'm ha- hey, listen, just be hot. That's that's the that's the key to life. Just, just be, be hot. hot. Just be hot. It's working so well for you, Paul. Uh, today- <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Tredavious White, uh, who some people wanted the Texans to sign. I was intrigued uh, depending on what his medicals would have looked like. He signed a one-year deal, $10 million worth the Rams. That's a good move for them. Because... I wonder what the actual figure is, too, because they're saying what the absolute north side of this deal is. I doubt it's that. I bet it's even lower than that. That feels... That sounds like wonder a $3 million dollar contract. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Well, and, and understandably so. I mean... The Achilles injury, knee injury, it's it's a lot to come back from. And I know a lot of Texans fans wanted him, but ugh, yeah. I'm not so yeah. sure. Yeah, well, the Rams are an interesting team in 2024. They had a surprise run at the end of the year, obviously make the playoffs. Matt Stafford's probably on his last run. If not this year, may, maybe maybe two more seasons. But we're at the end of, of the road for Matt Stafford. And look, 10 and 7 team, they should be one of the – they're probably one of the best teams in the NFC this year, I would guess. The mm-hmm. NFC, the it NFC doesn't is hard take to much judge. to be one of the I best know. teams in the it, NFC. It's not. It's a, it's hard. It's a hard conference to judge. Like the NFC South, I I got no idea. I know they have. I know the Atlanta Falcons have Kirk Cousins. It feels like it means nothing to me. <laughs> at the same time, you have Derek Carr, Baker Mayfield, Kirk Cousins in a division. Yeah, it's just one of those teams is going to go nine and eight and win the division. Yeah, like maybe Kirk Cousins gets the Vikings. The, I mean, the Falcons the ten wins. And helps them on the way. Um, so the Cowboys have reportedly had contract talks with Dak Prescott, but they have no urgency to do a deal. The reporting on Dak's contract has been all over the place, mm-hmm. where they're uh, similar to what Chandler's story said, that they're basically at, at peace or that they're good with where they're at right now. You have reports that he's essentially gone, and then Jerry's talking about how he can win a Super Bowl. I can't keep track of what's going on with the Cowboys and Dak Prescott. I can't either. And if I was Dak, I'd be annoyed by all this. Yes. I get it. It's a noisy organization to play for. But I don't know. At a certain point, how about let's let things play out Mm -hmm. as opposed to making everything seem as murky as it seems right now. And, I mean, I guess the hope for the Cowboys is that Dak Prescott flackos his way to a Super Bowl this season and that they have to dramatically overpay him in the offseason. But well, is that likely? No, but it wasn't likely with Joe Flacco either. So, so I mean, impossible. if you're a boys fan out there, yeah, I suppose you could say, well, if Flacco can do it, who can't do it? One of the challenging parts about Dak Prescott, I didn't know this. The way that they re- have restructured his contract, if he hits free agency, 
they're still going to have a $40.46 million dead cap next year, even if he just walks away. Wow. Because it's like they made him voidable years. So that's tough. So they have to, they have to resign. You have to keep him then. You, you can't let a guy walk and then have $40 million in yeah, dead cap. Just resign him. Even resign him for one or two years just so you don't have to deal with, the, deal with that after you let him walk. Yeah. Like, just have that out of the contract. Also, I don't. That makes me more confused about NFL contracts, but how a player can walk away in free agency, and you can still have they're dead cap all, hits. They're all so like you have to have like an accounting degree to understand these. <laughs> At best, yeah, you might then. need you might need way more than that to be honest. <laughs> Honestly, to make... colleges colleges should just start offering like NFL capologist majors. Like just, it... you can major in being. And understanding the but NFL cap. Isn't yeah. the key just you happen to have access to lots of cash immediately, and thus you can put money on the back burner? That's how the Rams kept circumventing the cap, right? Because Kroenke's rich as F. Yeah. I, I would imagine that the Panthers would be able to do stuff like this if anyone would actually want to stay playing for them with all the money Dave Tepper has. I, I guess the real exception is what the hell is going on with the New Orleans Saints? But I just assume corruption with everything involved in Louisiana. No offense. Fair. No offense. Uh, uh, former Jaguars Why we employee, love you, Louisiana. Uh, sentenced to 220 years in prison for child pornography. So, Jaguar is hiring some winners. This isn't the guy who's who stole the $6 million for a gambling addiction, right? This is a different guy? I think it's a different guy. It's a different person. But Man. when I first saw the story, I was like, well, this guy's really the scum of the earth. Man, I thought... I thought, I thought it was the same guy, too. They, I thought they were just now. How many of these things are they still going to blame on Urban Meyer? A lot of them. Right, I mean, like, they may as well just keep on doing it. Like, well, Urban Meyer ruined the culture of yeah. this team. Urban Meyer hired this guy. The Urban Meyer defense. What, what if uh, Johnny Cochran, like in the South Park episode, where he provides the Chewbacca defense? This is Chewbacca. Chewbacca is a Wookiee. That doesn't make any damn sense. Urban Meyer should be a Florida Gator coach. He had a heart attack. He likes college-age girls. Did that you, doesn't make any sense. Did you guys hear how this guy got caught? No. Was he doing it so, at work? No. Was it... He Chris Hansen involved? installed the Jumbotron. He helped install the Jumbotron oh in Jacksonville. God. And he hacked into it and was, like, messing with it during the games. Just, like, changing what was on the Jumbotron. So, because of that, they investigated him. And then when they investigated him and him hacking into the Jumbotron, that's where they found the child pornography. So he was just trying to have a couple giggles while a watching. A couple, like, bleeps well, and giggles during the game. While watching the the, the Jaguars go 1-7 and seven to end the season. Wait, is this the Nazi guy? Was this the, wasn't this was it the Jags that put up the Hitler trivia no, during the was, game? that was Michigan State. Oh, Michigan State, okay. I got my team I like confused. where your head's at, though. I, like, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Uh, well, connect, I, uh, connect, connect the dots. <laughs> you're connecting dots. No, man. Again, all... Uh, like we were talking about with all the gambling guys uh, yesterday, these these people get caught in the stupidest, most of av- <laughs> most avoidable ways possible. Yeah, <laughs> truly. Just oh yeah, I just was messing around hacking the jumbotron. Oops, they found my kitty porn. Yeah, oh. Good thing they caught him, but just like what a what a way. Speaking of betting, just on uh, uh, I guess this is a football story, but it's a non-football story as well. Apparently, college athletics, oh, yeah. uh, the NCAA is uh, going to all the gambling companies and saying no prop bets for players. Now, no some player place, props. some places for college players, yeah, some states already don't allow prop bets. Like you couldn't bet on why an Wasn't over like, under because they think the pl- the college players are more likely to get caught yeah, in what John Say Porter. Got like in New in. Jersey, in New Jersey, you can't bet on New Jersey college sports. Just yeah, because, Illinois like, is like that too. You can't bet on Northwestern Illinois. The mob. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> because you can bet on any college team except mob. for your own. But you can literally drive to another state and do the same thing. Yeah, can't you? I know. Mm-hmm. But like, but they can, they hey, on our problem. That's the the state being like, hey, gotcha. we're not allowing. I it. I expect that to happen here. It wouldn't shock me if 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 Texas legalizes gambling. If they say you can bet on everything except for UT A and M Cougs. I just don't think it's ever gonna happen. I mean, it, I, I feel like the, they have misplaced priorities, you know, with, like, an attorney general facing, like, a yeah. six different scandal. Like, they're not going to legalize it, but it's going to get legalized. But gambling, oh, my God. I, they're going to go federal. Uh, this stuff's getting kind of out of control. Uh, not out of control, but 
some of the stuff Man. is the tip of the iceberg. I don't know. I, I think people like to bring up stuff like this as part of some sort of push towards morality. Obviously, there is a very large portion of our country that is uh, Christian, like that obviously has you know religious reasons for not doing X, mm-hmm. Y, and Z. And I think very often that these issues are brought up, stopping doing things like legalizing marijuana or stopping the legalizing of gambling is is brought up to kind of incense these people who have their reasons for not wanting this stuff to be legalized. And I think generally something like gambling, like that's going to be brought up and people are going to be like, we can't have this. It's dangerous. Yeah, I just... It- and it's immoral. If they cetera. if they federally do it, it might be they'll be able to have more control over it. So that's why I think I, I understand federally that. they'll legalize it before Texas will legalize but it. But things so. take so long to oh, legalize 100%. federally. I, I mean, you know, marijuana is still a Schedule One drug yeah. because of reefer madness and Hearst like back in the twenties. Uh, Waka Flocka points out here on the Twitch uh, that you can't bet on rockets at Golden Nugget. No, Golden Nugget. Yeah, that's because Tillman owns it, so it's not allowed. I remember when he when the when it, he took over. I think it was the Rockets were playing the Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. And if the Rockets would have made it to the NBA Finals, they were still going to give credit to all the team, if you bet on the team from the East, Mm -hmm. that advanced, and the Warriors from getting to the NBA Finals. Because they were just like, well, the Rockets basically don't exist now. That's how they do it. So I I sat next to Tillman Fertitta, by the way, at the uh, Ime Udoka press conference uh, on Monday. He's an interesting guy. He tapped me on the shoulder, and he was asking me, like, what what was the last question about? And I thought to myself, I was like, damn, I don't think I was paying attention. Because I was like, why is Tillman Fertitta sitting down next to me? But I was like, oh, yeah, he's asking about Jalen Green. (laughs) Tillman's an interesting guy. Because Tillman once called in to someone who was filling in for my show, Mark Ryan. Yeah. He called into his show. Because I, I think something disparaging was said about the Cougs, and he just and he just was on for a full segment. Guy, guy listens. Shout he, out to him, Paul Gallant show listener. Even though Paul Gallant was not on the air that night. Funny thing, he I, when I was at, also at the flagship at night when you were doing mornings, he called in once. Yeah, I think that was right when he bought the Rockets. Must have been. And we were talking about something, and he just like randomly called in. Interesting. Just, just, Man, Very doesn't even listen to doesn't even listen to the Rockets flagship. Interesting. Well, they don't have any program at night. So uh, what's up, Tillman? How's it going? Hey, Tillman. Tillman. Hey, I have some. I have some thoughts. My guy. <laughs> uh, uh, qu- uh, two other got an investment changes. opportunity for you. <laughs> just, just give me a million dollars and I'll figure it out. I'll be a consultant. Yeah, for, yeah we'll yeah. figure it out. I can be your I can, consultant. I can. You know what? I can get coffee for Ime Udoka. <laughs> That would be a great As, Offer me one more, one dollar more than what I'm making right now. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave. I'll deliver the best Texas pecan coffee there is. Uh, other rule changes we missed uh, very quickly. The NFL approved a rule that allows you to challenge, or the NFL can overturn um, when it, the game clock expires before the snap, and they can, up top, they can stop the play. They can say, hey, we, we missed that one. We messed up. They also, the sky judge, I know that's what they don't call it, can also now, before the next play gets to 20 seconds left on the play clock, can jump in and say that was not or was roughing the quarterback or um, uh, pass interference. not pass interference when, like, the ball doesn't cross the line of scrimmage. What am I looking ball for? Ball spot? Here? No. When the quarterback Ill- illegally throws the ball out of bounds. Oh, intentional uh, grounding. Intentional, intentional grounding. grounding. That's what I'm looking yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Sky Judge can fix those things now as well. Oh, uh, right. Did, did you mention, too, that uh, I, I I think you did. Uh, now they're going to be looking at delay of games, potentially. Yeah, that's going to be. You can review delay of game. That's going to be interesting. How? I mean, that's something that should have been in effect for a while. Because I feel like, I mean, the, the way that they have described how they determine whether or not a delay of game has happened, there is nobody actually looking at the clock when the ball is snapped. Mm-hmm. So almost always delay of game is happening. Yeah, it's like clock, ball, back to the clock. Yeah. You know how much time you have. Right, it's yeah. one guy looking there Yeah, where on the broadcast you can see regularly. How don't they just have like a buzzer in their ear? I don't know, but now, I mean, here's the funny thing that the NFL is getting out of all this, and we touched on this before. Now you have potentially more replay, which is going to lead to more commercials, mm-hmm. more money for the NFL, more waiting and longer games for us. And another not, way- not thrilled with that. Another way the NFL is going to make more money, Albert Breer from the Monday, Monday Morning Quarterback yesterday on the Dan Patrick Show, he said don't expect the NFL to start just throwing out 15-yard penalties for the hip drop tackle this year. He said that he thinks the NFL is going to try to do what the NBA did 
and just find the hell out of all these players first. And p- instead of trying to figure out in what the penalty time. is in real time, they're going to try to solve it by finding these guys and trying to send the message that way. Hopefully that works. That would be actually very nice if it happened that way. Uh, the Texans officially cleared $6.4 million in cap space by restructuring Shaq Mason's contract. So when we get back, we'll discuss what they're going to do with that money, if anything. We're going to get back here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Before we do, I want to tell you guys about my friends at O Athletic. You can check them out at oathletic.com or at 767 North Shepard. Over 100 classes per week from weightlifting, agility, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, boxing, MMA, they've got it all for you. Whatever kind of classes you want to take, a ton of variety of options. They offer personal training. They have all the free weights, exercise machines uh, throughout the gym. They have this cool little soccer field as well or just turf area where you can do different kind of workouts on that as well. My personal trainer, Cam, can't recommend him enough uh, if you're going to go to O Athletic and sign up for a personal trainer. So check him out, 767 North Shepherd. You have your rest and recovery as well sauna steam room they've got that stuff for you that you can use to take advantage to get your body healthy so whether you want to lose weight get fit just lean out a little bit you can do that at o athletic and oathletic.com This is Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Now back to Paul and Joe inside the Veritex Community Bank Studios. Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. We go to semifinal round number one of our best hitter in 2024 for the Houston Astros. The number one seed, Jordan Alvarez, versus the number four seed, Alex Bregman. Who has the better year in 2024, Jordan or Bregman? I think it's going to be Bregman. And part of it is because I think that Bregman's going to play more games. Bregman regularly plays more games than any Houston Astro. Hopefully no injury happens. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood for that. He's in a contract year as well. If it's ever going to happen, another huge year for him as a Houston Astro, one that we haven't seen in, amazingly, five years, this is the year for it to happen. I think it is going to happen. And I hate to feel this way with Jordan Alvarez, but 
I just expect him to miss time, especially if they're going to do something, Joe, that you aren't thrilled about, which is putting him in the field on a more regular basis than they have in the past. Now, one of the advantages that Bregman has here is Jordan's going to bat second. So in terms of RBIs and, and coming through for your team, if Alex Bregman's batting third or fourth, because it does look like there's going to be times, if not pretty often, that Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker are going to hit back-to-back 2-3 in the lineup with Bregman hitting fourth. Bregman's going to have a lot of opportunities to drive in a lot of runs with those three guys in front of him. I mean, it... It's going to be interesting to see them with this lineup this year, too, because it's just going in the modern direction that so many people were pissed that Dusty Baker wasn't doing last year to have one Altuve leading off. Okay, you've done that for a while. That is a terror to have as the leadoff batter with his home run potential, Mm -hmm. you know, just like George Springer before him. But Alvarez at the two spot, theoretically, Alvarez has more at bats. And that's what it's for. You're playing a numbers game here at that point, but. I, I So you're going Bregman, Bregman, huh? I'm going to go with Bregman, yeah. Wow. Um, well, Sean, you're going to have to break the tie because I, I'm going to go with Alvarez. I know he, he will play less games than Alex Bregman. Even if he doesn't get hurt, he will play less games than Alex Bregman because he will just take days off, and, and Bregman really just does not do that. I I, I really believe Jordan Alvarez is going to hit 40 home runs this year. 40. <sighs> He's just going to hit tanks, and he does, and he needs to stay healthy to do it, but I, I think Jordan Alvarez is going to hit 40 home runs this year, and and even though he's not going to have the RBIs potentially with you know only Altuve in front of him, that bottom of the order should be better to where it should help him to be in position to drive home you know Jeremy Pena, Chaz McCormick, Jake Myers, and Altuve, whoever's at the bottom of the order before it turns over. So I, I'm going to go I'm going to go Jordan Alvarez. Jordan Alvarez has never hit 40 home runs. I know. In his career. Okay. But we all know he can. But why Why hasn't he? Because he's not been on the field enough. Guess who has hit 40 home runs in a year before? Alex Bregman. Yeah, he and did. And guess, uh, I'm just going to start saying some numbers. 155, 157, 156, 91. 155, 161. Do you know what those are? How many games what? he's played? Games played by Alex Bregman. Yep. So, almost always in the 150s. He played 161 last year. <laughs> he missed one game last year. So you're going with crazy. a a health risk versus uh, the opposite of a health risk. Again, only one year since his rookie year has he has been impacted really by health. Um, and he's in the best shape of his life. Best shape of his That's life. That's at least what he's saying. Playing for his contract. Yeah. Had a higher war. Give that man year. his money. <laughs> yes. Had a Thank you, uh, Teddy KGB. Uh, yes, I'm from Russia. <laughs> he had a higher war last year. Speaking of Russia, mm-hmm. so I think <laughs> I think Alex Bregman in a contract year. I think we have our first upset wow. of the draft or of the bracket. I'm shocked by this because even last year, or you're this on is Alvarez, the be- well, this is the best matchup. Like it the, is. The thing is, yes, it's the and it's the worst matchup for Jordan Alvarez because also true by all the rate stats, Jordan has him. It's just the Man. the cumulative ones and the 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 avail when v- availability comes into question and he's playing a guy who's literally never hurt. I know, but Alex Bergman played 161 games last year. He had 98 RBIs. Jordan Alvarez played 114 games last year and had 97. Yeah, because he was driving in Alex Bergman. That's a good point. Good, <laughs> good. Touche, <laughs> touche. He had you know he had six more home runs last year than Alex Bergman in 50 less games. Yeah, Bregman's going to be better, though. Do you see that tank he hit off of uh, J.P. Frank? And he's, he's just ripping tanks right now. And I, I'm so <laughs> excited about Bregman. This is – it was – I this is why I, I looked ahead at the bracket when I made it, and I, I knew there was a chance this was going to happen. But, all right, you guys outvote me. Alex Bregman advances yeah. in the bracket. Jordan Alvarez eliminated. Mm. Can you be the best I, player in baseball or even closer if you get knocked out in the semifinals of your own team's bracket? It's tough. Well, the thing is, he's, you know, the other best player in baseball. It's like, it's J- Judge, huh? going to miss some time. Otani might go to prison. So, availability <laughs> against those guys is not not an issue. It's just against Iron Man, Alex Bregman, who we all think is going to uh, 
have have a great year and hit the ground running. All right, we've got lots of questions about the Astros rotation. We'll get to those next year uh, when we return to start hour number three here on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. First, let me tell you about my friends at MyBookie and MyBookie.ag. Big time showdown for the Houston Rockets tonight. They're looking for their 10th straight win. And interesting news today, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Oklahoma City Thunder's best player, he is out. He's not playing tonight. The Rockets, as things currently stand at mybookie.ag, and you might want to jump in on this when you can, are four and a half point dogs. With the way they're playing right now, you got Jabari Smith Jr. back in the lineup tonight after he got suspended for Monday's game against the Blazers. It's a tough test. It's the first tough test the Rockets have really faced over this stretch. I mean, this is one of the best teams in the Western Conference, currently the two seed, but can they cover that four and a half? If you feel that way, mybookie.ag, promo code BET975. As soon as you enter that promo code in, put in a deposit. They're going to match it up to $1,000, and you get to play with it right away. So if you're feeling the Houston Rockets right now, the Ime Udoka era, the Jalen Green hot streak, if you think that I am going to be painting my fingernails at the end of the year, mybookie.ag, promo code BET975. Again, the Rockets are four and a half point dogs. Put some respect on their name. If you want to pick it, it's mybookie.ag. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with mybookie.ag. Once again, we saw that if Paul Gallant just loses this bet, we would have the best radio show in Houston because last night, Ronel Blanco proved that dad strength is a real thing. So if Paul just got three baby mamas, but our YouTube the, numbers would go through the roof. But that means the Rockets would miss the playoffs. That's true. This is, this is something that you want me to do, and it also means I would go in all of the debt. That's also true. I don't uh, listen. Having one kid. What do you mean, John? Well, because if your performance goes up, yeah, boom, we're the number one. We're the number one uh, station in America. Yeah, we'll be raking it in. I mean, look at Ronald Blanco. Has a kid with his family all day. Ten strikeouts. Makes now he's the rotation. Jalen Green. That strength. Jalen Green now going to get a max contract. Was going to have to play for the Pistons or something. Look, Paul. When I had a kid. I went from making $12 an hour, being a miserable human being, to coming here and almost doubling, uh, and more than doubling my pay. Almost doubling, you said. <laughs> it's, it's more he than doubling. He said almost doubling. It's more than doubling. The man okay. cannot do math. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. We learned that today. Okay. Yeah, it's double. <laughs> double of 12 is $24 I, I, an hour. I'm, I'm sorry. I would be such a horrible father. <laughs> no, you'll I be fine. I forget to feed my cat regularly, you know? Well, sometimes the kids just don't eat. The, and the good news is if you're having three baby mamas, you're not going to be spending time with a lot of them. Yeah, no, just I'm just going to all... be spending money with alimony checks on all of them. Why can't they just be friends? What? Is this going to be Big Love with Bill Paxton? I mean, I think the that's show how... about the Mormons that all live in a block. It's three houses next to each other with, yeah. with his wives, and they're all just hanging out. Just get one 
set of apartments all the kind of yeah i can i can afford that that sounds like a great I think, idea i think that's actually what the mormons do just get a sugar <laughs> Listen, mama make someone, one of them make one of them a sugar mama and you're fine it, if you're gonna have tons of kids you better be one a successful celebrity nick cannon or a successful athlete whether it's antonio cromartie travis henry adrian peterson philip rivers had them all with one significant uh, yes, other though he still has like i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna go and uh spread the proverbial oats you better have money otherwise those kids are not going to have good childhoods and i and good conscience cannot do that so this bet addendum that you guys have tried to add in to shame me into doing say the rockets don't okay okay make the playoffs you know what? Fine, fine, i find fine, fine. i find it to be honestly joe as somebody who grew up uh, in, in high school i was living thousands of miles away from my dad yeah, I'm going to guilt trip you now. I don't want any other kid to feel that way. Okay, fair. <laughs> so let's alter the bet. You are have to be just like Jalen Crean and have three kids if they don't make the playoffs, which means you have to get two more cats. At some point in life. Oh, two more cats. <laughs> I don't hate that as much. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want... I rescue don't want, some, like, 13-year-olds. No, but no, I don't I want, want people to... That will really ruin your sex life. Well, I if mean, a, some if people a girl like comes, cats. If, if some you, women like cats. Paul, if, if someone, if a girl comes to your house and she goes, "Oh, you have three cats." Hey, I'm seeing this guy. He's got <laughs> three cats. So. Yeah, one cat. The fine. one cat. The one cat already doesn't help me out. Like, yeah, I, if, I, you go, if you go to three, which is so dumb, I don't get it. I, <laughs> cats are such an easier pet to take care of, and so many people have terrible dogs. And I get, oh, it's a doggo, my pupper. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. The, the things like humping people's like he never does that. Bites a toddler. Oh, he never does that. So, uh, Ronald Blanco's in the rotation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he was with his wife uh, all day yesterday. She had a baby, so congratulations. Then he came out, and he, he dominated the Space Cowboys. Got the Astros back got to 500. Strength. Yeah, like J.P. France is throwing at Jose Altuve's head. He tried Ronald to kill Blanco him. going out there with 10 strikeouts against the uh, Sugarland Space Cowboys, which uh, we could have used that the night before, by the way, when the Astros <laughs> lost to the Sugarland Space Cowboys. Do you yeah. think? Do you think Joe Spada actually made his decision on who's going to make the rotation like in that moment? No, but when when J.P. France threw high and tight at at uh, Altuve, like this dude's got honestly, go. I'd want like, him on the rotation if he did that. <laughs> the, the, that no, that's a guy who competes. Yeah. Iron sharpens iron. I like that. France Don't obviously do it to Altuve. That's my that's my he's that's just, my thing. He's Don't just do it practicing. To he's just practicing for when he throws at Aaron Judge's head. The, the thing that would be at his like kneecap. I know. <laughs> oh, I would love it. As I said that, I was like, uh, Aaron's much taller than Jose, Jose Altuve. I would love an Astros Yankees brawl tomorrow, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, but game one, let's just go to to bring it Drop to bring it blood. back. France, you could tell, felt horrible about it, and obviously the World Baseball Classic last year. Who who was it? Wasn't it an Astro that that uh, 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 Luis Garcia didn't hit him? But no, wait, Luis close. Garcia was on Venezuela. Who was it? Oh, I forgot who was it was. Hector Neris? No, it was a uh, rando. He was a- okay. It wasn't an Astro. No, I remember he, there he was pitched, a he pitched for the Rockies. I think it was. Oh, okay. oh yeah, it was Daniel Bard. Yep. It was on Team USA. He had zero control. He yeah, he was ever, walking everywhere. It was everywhere. brutal. <laughs> right. Um, so that's why you're concerned when it's up and in on Altuve. Yeah, right? but Blanco's in the rotation. He's looked really good this spring, so I, I don't he know. He was good last year as, as far as the many next men up for the Astros last year. He was very good. And that's, I think, the real question I have about this coming season because they're going to have to do a lot of next men up. It felt at times like it was like, what the hell's going on? They are incredibly lucky as far as the guys who are stepping in and doing well. J.P. French and Ronel Blanco are two perfect examples of that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you, you know, you, you could also point at Mauricio Dubon the first month of the year. Is that likely to continue? There's a part of me that thinks, yes, maybe that's just part of being on this team, that the people that are in the clubhouse feel confident that they're going to be able to step in there and continue what the guys ahead of them on the depth chart are doing. But there's another part of me that almost feels like, okay, at a certain point, you know, baseball evens itself out. Baseball, The baseball gods say, okay, you've had a little bit too much favor with these guys who are not everyday players. That is not something that should happen. Uh, Credit to the Astros coaching staff if these guys who are going to have to step in, specifically the pitchers, and continue to do what they were doing last year. I mean, hell yeah. Joe Espada, manager of the year already. He won't get it because he's an Astro and no one on the Astros can win anything, but uh, I, I, I like this. I, I I feel much better about Blanco having a very a good year and being a, a staple part of this team than I do to J.P. France. J.P. France's stuff just never, when you watch it, it never screams like nasty or elite or 
He doesn't even have like those those moments. He does have a cool glove though. You see the glove? He does. The glove has uh, his sunglasses and, or excuse me, not his sunglasses. Where his, his prescription eyeglasses yeah. and his uh, mustache on it. Like it's just it's it's like stitched into the webbing. I love it. Yeah, it's pretty. It is very cool. I, I enjoy that. It's actually much. cool. I, I wish there were more customized gloves out there. Those things are expensive. I remember getting like custom gloves when you're growing up, and they're mm-hmm. pricey. I, I mean, still I still have mine. Big old outfielder glove. I just bought I bought a new glove. I think, or I guess my dad, my dad got me a glove when my son was born. So you're gonna have a catch with your son. So I can have a catch with my son. How many oh. years do you have to wait till you can have a catch with your son? Well, we show we, him off how we to play catch every day. Every day. Yeah. How, how old is he? He's three. He's three. Can you play catch at three? He doesn't have a glove, but he, you guys remember those, uh, like these like cylinder like yeah. circle things with Vel- like, it's Velcro. Yeah. Oh yeah 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 we yeah. We play with those every day. That's okay. good. That's yeah. Start them young. Exactly. It's like you know, try not to hit him in the face. You know, and accidentally hurt him a little bit too much. The other day, I I, I, I spanked him because he got he got in trouble. Uh oh. He went Whoa. straight to my wife and he goes, "Daddy hit me," and I was like, "Oh boy." Yeah, it's a good thing he doesn't have social media. Yeah, it's good. Th- you know, yeah. Maybe, good, maybe, good, not he learned, great. He might learn to call. A yeah, service it was or not great. Hey, we we had someone. The getting, way he said it, I was like, "Oh, that sounds way worse than it was." We mm. had someone's uh, words get taken out of context last week on the station. It'd be a real shame if this clip yeah, made its way. Yeah, it'd be a real shame if Turkey came after me right now. Well, in that moment, I don't think they care about the. Yeah, I think, I think Turkey. I mean, let's I, be honest. What do you think? How do you think Turkey handles careful, these situations? Careful. Well, I'm just asking the question. How do you think they handle these situations? <laughs> I don't know enough Probably about a lot Turkey worse. or their culture to speak on their parenting uh, Good techniques. Good answer. Good answer, Sean. But I think different people might have an issue with what Joe just confessed Whatever. to doing. Uh, yeah. Soft. Okay, if you Corporal do. Corporal punishment. You're super soft if you have an issue See, Joe it. is a Southern man. He is not from <laughs> Chicago. Well, I, I didn't, say, he I read, didn't, he I didn't use the, a belt. He read the Adrian Peterson book on, <laughs> yeah, like, on parenting. Like, this is well, not the same. Listen, Adrian, Adrian Peterson, I mean, he's provided for his kids, so come on. That's true. Uh, Parker Mashinsky made the opening day roster, according to Chandler Rome. He did. How do you feel about that? I don't. He's uh, got a cool last name. He's not very good. So, someone's got to make the roster. Right, someone's got to make There's got to be, what, 12, 13 pitchers? Yeah. And Throw just a reminder, they won't have Brian Abreu the first you know, two games, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, when do you expect Justin Verlander to be back this year? So he threw Good what, question. Uh, less than 30 pitches. He wants to get to 85 mm-hmm. you before read, he comes back. You read these articles, and the pitchers always just say the weirdest stuff about, like, how where they're at in their recovery. But yeah. um, I, I think they need him back by June. That would be bombed if we don't get him back till June. But 85 pitches, that's – because. If he's at 30 right now, I don't know what the ramp-up period is, but I'd assume the next time you throw, you what? It's like 10 more times, then you go five days, 10 more pitches, then five more days, 10 more pitches. I, I don't know what the ramp-up yeah. process is, but this sounds like a month away. Yeah, you're, I, I guess. But it's would, always tricky because they're like, yo, I'm feeling good. Okay, then get back out there. Well, not that good. I think best-case scenario, he's got two more. He's got two starts where he goes to 50, and then he goes to 85, and that's a, that's a big jump. Mm-hmm. So that's maybe best case is he misses two starts. So he's back in three weeks. Yeah, I mean the it, what what's the actual date that he's available? It's like April fifteenth or something, or I guess it'll be April like twelfth. Yeah, that one. It's probably going to be a week or two after that on the on the br- sunny side of things. Yeah. So think. yeah, first week of May, the the latest. Is- and we don't know if he wants to come and do some of the ramping up during the season, where maybe that first start he's only available to pitch X amount of pitches. And so he only goes four innings in his first start. That's and very true. He could do one start in Sugarland or in Round Rock or or in Corpus Christi, and then just come up to the Astros and just pitch less. Yeah, which I I wouldn't. I I'd be like, do your rehab starts in AAA? Like, yeah, like you, he'll be back at some point. But it, it's none of it's a a red flag or anything like that. I just I was hopeful as well that he was going to miss one start, and yeah. then. But it's so hard. It's impossible to know because every rehab goes so different. And some of them go on a much faster pace. And Justin Verlander said that at his age, it's not going to go as fast as it would have in years past. So take your time. Again, he's he's at the age that Roger Clemens was when he just started doing half seasons. Like yeah. that is, they are the same age. So it's not it's not uh, unprecedented that guys take a little bit longer uh, to get ready. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, well, Justin Verlander, he'll be back at some point. Uh, we need to do our next semifinal match. Okay. So, We're doing a bracket. Who's going to have the best Astros hitting season? Yes. We went one through eight. 
And in the last matchup, uh, our uh, four seed, Alex Bregman, advanced, beating the one seed, Jordan Alvarez. So uh, now we got two left. So Jose Altuve versus Kyle Tucker. Better season in 2024. This one is tricky. Altuve. Regular season. <laughs> trying uh, try to try to poo poo Paul a little bit here. Yeah. Oh, I, I was yeah. gonna be on the same page, dude. Okay, well, we haven't discussed this. No, for no, 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 no. Six I, rounds. No, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. P- playoff baseball, small sample sizes. You know, whatever, whatever. Altuve just had one of the best years of his career in not 162 games, obviously. But if you were to take what he did in. Um, however many games he did, which is, I think, 90-something? 90 90. Mm-hmm. It was 90. 90, okay. I mean, we're talking about arguably, like, the best year since 2017. And, honestly, from that four-year stretch from 14 through 17. So, he's the best second baseman in baseball. Fact. At least as far as hitters go. Uh, fielding, yeah, a little bit to be desired these days. Base running especially, too. Are we bringing fielding into this? I think... No, well, I mean, with with T- Tucker, Kyle Tucker won a gl- Gold Glove in twenty twenty. Tucker yeah. as a fielder, but we are talking about the hitting perspective. Um, hmm. it seems like it's more likely that Tucker has the better year just because Jose Altuve is in his mid thirties, mm-hmm. and there is in the back of my mind as someone who used to watch the Red Sox, just remembering Dustin Pedroia, who as a hitter was very similar, small guy but a lot of power. There is a part of me that wonders if the wheels fall off or Altuve earlier than than later. But I feel like I'd be sacrilegious in picking Kyle Tucker to beat Altuve, even though there is a world where I could see Kyle Tucker having a better statistical season. Statistically, some of the categories, because Tucker is going to bat third or fourth, he's going to have more RBIs than Jose Altuve. Uh, Probably more stolen bases. Probably more stolen bases. And Joe Espada said this team is going to be more aggressive this year on the base pass, and I would hope that's – Everyone but Jose Altuve. Yeah, but Altuve's a terrible Altuve, base runner. But Altuve's been Altuve's yeah, got true. some some he's got some bags in spring training, so they have included him in that. I mean, he led the American League amazingly in fourteen and fifteen in stolen bases. Yeah, people yeah, forget he, about that. It's, but it's like because well, somehow he forgot how to run the bases, guys. Yeah, twenty eighteen. There's a pretty hard line of demarcation of when he stopped stealing bases. Yeah, I I he became a made man. That's basically. I'm gonna say collectively, even though the stats will in some ways listen or be bigger for Tucker, Jose Altuve will have the better year still than Kyle Tucker this year. So I'm going Altuve. Is that All what right. you said too? Uh, I said Altuve, yes. Okay, so Altuve advances. So our final one, our final matchup, which we'll do in about 30 minutes, will be Jordan, I mean, nope, Alex Bregman versus Jose Altuve, who will have the better year in 2024. Uh, how are we feeling about tonight? SGA is out for the Thunder. How hyped are you? Plus, Warriors Watch continues. We'll do that next year on ESPN 97.5 and 
You're listening to Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul Gallant and Joe George. Reminder, tomorrow we will be broadcasting live from the decoy. So when they open at 2 o'clock, come hang out with us. The Killer Bees will be there till 6 to watch Astros opening day. Uh, they have $10 Shinerbach, 100-ounce towers, $2 Mexican candy shots. It's a great spot to watch games like playing volleyball. Paul might take his shirt off and play volleyball for you tomorrow. We'll see how, how many Mexican tomorrow candy shots. Tomorrow's going to be tricky because, again, I, I right. do want to run to opening day downtown right afterwards. But, yeah, I will. How about this? We split a beer tower. Okay. We got to take that bad boy down in the 2 o'clock hour. Yep. And we do a Mexican candy shot at the tail end. Can't wait. Can't wait. I'm probably going to stay and watch the Astros game with the Killer Bees. So if you guys want to come there out, go. join us at the decoy. Watch the Astros opener. Some tourney uh, action later in the afternoon, yeah, exactly. too. I forgot the tourney even starts tomorrow. Forgot that it's back. I know. Well, it's Friday, our beloved Coos. And like 8.30 at night or whatever. They'll start I playing. know. What the hell, man? It's going to be so late. <sighs> yeah. I feel like an old man right now saying that even. But it's going to be late. You guys are. Shut up. <laughs> stay up whenever. Oh, I'm Sean. I can't even drink yet. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm not at the the decoy. Yeah, that's yeah, 21 and up. In. Decoy is 21, 21 and up. And that's, up. Why, that's why Sean can't come with us. Yeah. He's not allowed in. Also, our question of the day: uh, What is the biggest obstacle stopping the Astros from winning the World Series in 2024? Themselves. Uh, three nine nine nine. Biggest obstacles for the Astros: One, Minute Maid's batter's eye; two, the Valdez yips. Uh, the Valdez yips. Or something. The Valdez yips are they are important. Yeah. Uh, so the Rockets tonight play the Oklahoma City Thunder. Now, Shea Gilgis Alexander is not going to play. Huzzah! Which is a, a good thing. I like it when players miss games, but at the same time, I also wish that we were getting a true feel for what the Rockets are doing. And you can't quite get that true feel for what the Rockets are doing if SGA is not playing for OKC. Y- you can't, but th- it's disappointing from that perspective. You're a game I, I, back I, I, of the Warriors. Yes, I will say. What's more important is just get these wins, baby. Yeah. Just get these wins. Just you'll win. Get, you'll get tested in April. You're going to play plenty of playoff teams in April. Yeah. I know, but I still would prefer. They are a measuring stick, especially that, especially Oklahoma City. Is this a can't be a measuring stick game if SGA is done in there. It, it can't be. No, it I'm can't. Say, I'm saying that they normally are. Right. Like they're they're right, a right, team right. Okay. because of. A, just the way the drafts have gone where it feels like they've, they're they always kind of near each other the last couple of drafts mm-hmm. in, the, in these rebuilds that uh, that they're, they're someone that the Rockets, that you look at, you look at them and the Pistons, funny enough. You look at them and the Pistons. Better than the like, Pistons, at least. Better than, raise the banner. Uh, and, and that's how you kind of judge, like, where this Rockets rebuild is going. And so we won't get a, uh, a look at that, but again – their April schedule, it's like, I'm I'm fine with catching a break on this one. How yeah. far away are they, in your estimation, from OKC? Obviously, OKC has, in SGA, a top 10 bare minimum player. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, in Chet Holmgren, one of the best rookies in the league and young players in the league. So that's almost having two on the Houston Rockets. Is there anything that the Rockets have on OKC, just overall totality of talent? Are, are there more good players on the Rockets? If you if you add in Amen Thompson and Jabari Smith, Jalen Green plus, Brooks, Fred Van Vliet. I still like the Rockets' young core. Easton healthy, Shangoon healthy. Yeah, I, I, I like the Rockets' young core as much as I like the Thunder removing SGA from the equation. If they don't have SGA, yeah, okay, because SGA was drafted in 2018, so exactly. he's not really like he's he's still young, but he's not part of the young core. I mean, shoot, he played a year on on OKC in the playoffs. Yeah, so he, this is a little bit different than you know the Rockets don't have yeah, and a what, guy like that. And he's what he's on the Thunder because the Paul George Paul George trade. So yes. it. And there was that Doc Rivers. Was it Doc Rivers who said he tried to hey, tell Kawhi do Leonard? Guys. Don't do it, guys. Yeah, d- yeah. Uh, hey. Garbage. That's nonsense. Doc Rivers was not saying. That's like when Greg Pop. I don't know. Wait, what are you guys talking about? I need I need. Oh, to... uh, uh, Doc Doc Rivers did an interview during the All-Star break. Uh, well, so, while somewhere this around year, that. This yeah. year while he's been a coach. In which he told, he claims he told Kawhi Leonard it would be a mistake to trade Shea Gilgis-Alexander 
for Paul George because they let Kawhi Leonard make the trade apparently. Also, yeah. also, what? There's yeah. no way that like they were just like Kawhi, whatever it takes to get you on this team. Oh, you want to trade all of our picks and Shea Gilgeous Alexander for yeah. Paul George? Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> No, literally, no one has regretted the trade until this year. And even then, I do you regret that trade if you're the Clippers? No, because it's just a different timeline thing. Like yeah. the the Clippers' failures weren't because they didn't have Shea Gill. They had Paul George instead of Shea Gill Alexander on their team. Yeah, that's so not why they failed. I I I like the Rockets' young core. Uh, and I if if you could take SGA out of the equation, it's it's on par with what they have. You know, you know, Chet versus. Jabari, I don't think is that different, honestly. Still, Shangoon is a very talented player, in which what you use the Thunder draft pick or you traded with the Thunder so you could acquire Shangoon. Yeah. I, it's the Thunder's <laughs> core is better. There, it's more developed, but they've also sucked for longer, and that's part of it. They they had a better 2021 draft. Yeah. They they drafted Jalen Green and Alfred Shangoon, and the Thunder drafted uh, Josh Giddey. Yeah. Boom, boom, Fact. roasted. Got him. I mean, honestly, even Forgot like all, about the, Josh Giddey. all the Josh Giddy stuff aside, like <laughs> it's hard to put that to the side. No, but I'm just saying, like on on the court stuff. Yeah, like Josh Giddy is not. He's not good. He's not that good. Okay, like, he, he's a guy who gets played off the court the first time they play in a playoff series. Yeah, they're, they they are the deal. the core players for the Rockets. I'm good with. Now the Thunder play better clearly as a basketball team, and it's not just because of SGA. They just they figured out how to play better basketball as a group where the Rockets you're seeing Jabari, Shangoon, Jalen Green yeah, there's a have just... these peaks where they're not all doing it at once. And part of that is this is year one of Ime Udoka after right. two years, for all the young guys, two, except for Jay Sean Tate, mm-hmm. uh, two years of Steven Silas. Jay Sean Tate had three years of Steven Silas. Pray yeah. for him. Um, Overcame it on Monday, where, though. Whereas, um, Big game for him. I think it's Mark Dagnault. I always forget if it's Mark or Mike It's Dagnall. Mark, yeah. Mark Dagnault. He's been uh, the Thunder coach for a few years now. So there is some more continuity of the system. They obviously have a way to play that's like very uh, top-down. That's how they want to play. They want to play with a big man who can shoot to really open up the driving lanes for everyone. Huh. Huh, who's that sound like? Uh, and so that's why Shea is able to do the things that he can do is because there's n- typically no one standing in the paint for OKC. And that just comes from years and years of building the team with this vision in mind, where the Rockets, because they hired Steven Silas, because they wanted to, someone to get the most out of James Harden and Russell Westbrook for like... The, you mean kiss their ass the most. For the two months that they worked together. Uh <laughs> The their their plan has not been able to be as top down organization. That makes total sense. A another follow up question on this front. This is I guess more OKC related because again I I think as you said Sean yeah this is this is who you're comparing yourself to, obviously with SGA being the, the difference. Are the Thunder a legit title contender with SGA healthy or is everyone in the West? compared to Denver, a complete afterthought. Because it does feel like this is Denver's to lose yet again. I mean, That's, I, it's killed the Celtics. Like, the, the times I've watched Denver play Boston, I'm like, oh, my God. Because Boston, this is the best Boston team they've had. Yeah, I I think that's it's, it's so hard to answer that because you have the Thunder and you have the Timberwolves who are led by two young emerging superstars. And, like, SGA and Anthony Edwards are awesome. Right, and the difference with the Timberwolves is I just do not take Carl Anthony Towns seriously. Yeah, and, and they've been and they've been just, just fine without him. And I mean, they've right. turned Rudy Gobert around uh, surprisingly. He's not hated by his, his the whole NBA anymore. anymore. Yeah, yeah it's, now it's yeah, or at least not his teammates anymore. So there, there's those two teams are a threat, but they still seem farther away. I would still think there's a like the Pelicans, the Clippers, the Mavs, the Suns. Oh yeah, those guys. Are, they still, have, they, but they have so much talent. It's. I could very easily see the Nuggets not winning the championship, but it's hard not to think that, or at least getting to the finals, it's hard not to view the Nuggets as a team that's just going to run through everybody. Yeah, I mean, the Nug- the Nuggets should be the favorites. They're going to be the favorites in every series, uh, at least in the West that they play. We'll see if they play Boston in the finals. Maybe that's. Maybe they're not favored in that. But, I would pick Denver over Boston. Yeah, but um, as far as OKC, I, I guess it depends what you call like a legit title contender. Like they OKC should make the Western Conference Finals. They, okay. They should do it. Wow. And so does that make you a title contender, even though while I'm saying 
uh, you should make the Western Conference Finals. I do not think that, that there's a world specifically because of who Denver's center is versus who your center, center mm-hmm. is. I don't see how exactly you stop Denver with uh, with twig man Chet Holmgren at center. Like, that's who you're depending on to stop Nikola Jokic. That seems like a tough sell to me. Yeah. And, and you mix in a lot of the this is your first time in the playoff stuff, which I, I imagine will kind of rear rear its head in the couple early of just boob moments by some young players. Yeah, it yeah. Just, it'll rear its head in the early, maybe in the first round if they do get like Phoenix or LA in that first round matchup, two veteran teams. Sorry, I could see the Thunder losing. It wouldn't stun me if they lost it in would, the first I'd round. I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if they lost in just, the first round. Just because the, the the veterans and the talent, you, you might be playing a team with Chris Paul. I mean, not Chris Paul. With Bradley Beal, oh. Devin Booker, and Kevin Durant, like, yeah, something's still up with them though. Why, why I know. Are they the seventh, or why are they the eighth seed in the West then? <laughs> you know, right. I, I know. Something's I know. up. I know. Something's up with they, all these teams. Like it's the, the, name the, brand more than it's actual it, it is, quality. It is they're, they're all brand. Boeing right now, right? Like minus, you know, have, having uh, uh, I don't, people I don't, disappeared. I, I, I don't know. Has, has anyone seen the Jordan Clarkson dunk on LeBron? No. Uh, <laughs> I have not. <laughs> no, but the the Suns, they also are one of the worst uh, fourth quarter teams in like NBA in the last like 10 years of the NBA. That's yeah. amazing when you have yes. Durant and Booker. Especially when, the, Joe, your selling point is, well, they're a bunch of veterans. They know how to play. I know. It's like, but they constantly get their ass kicked every night in the fourth quarter. Yeah. So I maybe – Maybe a Denver or a, not Denver, a Dallas matchup with OKC that because they, they're probably the more serious of the teams that I could see being in the play in games because they just uh, don't play defense. Yeah. And you're it. But how are you going to stop? I mean, yeah, you're say, going shot for shot with Luca and Kyrie. Yeah, yeah, that that is pretty scary. Like they, they can have just like a stupid night, both of if, them. If and you're going to lose both of them to play defense for one series. <laughs> they just like they. <laughs> Most some of the best defensive players in the NBA at this point are the guys who just try. Like that's why Curry doesn't get crushed for his defense because he, on most nights, shows some kind of effort versus James Harden and Luca and Kyrie. I mean, Kyrie's Damian Lillard. Kyrie tries a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Luca and the Luca is the, is the most zero effort guy I've does ever make seen. Slovenia look soft as a country. Yeah, that's fair. It does. You said that. Oh, you said what? that. Down there. I was uh, pulling a lot, Slovenians. Play some defense. Uh, Boston Celtics are the betting favorite right now, plus 200 to win the championship. The Nuggets are second, plus 290. And then it what goes. What are the Rockets? Uh, the Rockets are plus 75,000. Ride it, baby. Uh, put, a, but, put a dollar on that. But then the next. <laughs> five of a bit of a. <laughs> uh, of the next three teams, the Clipper, it's the Clippers, the Bucks, and then the Thunder. Are the next three okay? Teams. So it's sleeping on our rockets, and they're sleeping on the rockets. Feel really? pretty. The Clippers getting that much respect is kind of because it, I mean, when they went twenty and five over a twenty five game stretch at one point this year, but now they're just kind of falling apart. So mm. I think it's remnants of of that. I've been loving that. I, I would say at this point, it's getting annoying. Everyone's like, "Oh, hey, we have to apologize to James Harden," and then he like doesn't make himself available hey, after a bad. R- Russell loss. Westbrook's coming back. Honestly, they need him back. That's the sad and thing. And that's why I don't take them yeah. too seriously to win the West is because you just yeah. said the sentence, they need Russell they Westbrook need Russell to Westbrook come back. back. And they, they have Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, James Harden. Yeah. And they need Russell Westbrook. Uh, after playing on a one-year, $2.5 million deal last year, former Houston Texan, Jadavion Clowney, his new home. He's going to play for the worst team in the NFL. Uh. Jadavion Clowney, two years, max of $24 million for the Carolina Panthers. I was going to say he's coming home. He's coming home. For the Texans, but he actually is coming home. Coming home. Yeah, he's going home. Going back to Kakalaki. Yeah, well, I think he's from South Carolina. But, but yeah, it's all one Kakalaki. I guess I guess they are Carolina Panthers. Mm-hmm. Where is where are the, are one are the Carolina. Carolina Panthers? Is that stadium in North Carolina? Charlotte. Oh, okay. I, I so, yes. yes. I honestly had no idea. Yeah, but uh, I think Charlotte, from what I understand, I think Charlotte's uh, like close to the South Carolina border. Okay. It's a border city. Uh, what uh, what is the biggest uh, obstacle stopping the Astros Astros from getting to the World Series? Uh, our final matchup of the hitters bracket. Who will have the best year for the Strohs in 2024? And some some prop bets that I've I've made up for the show to discuss. That's next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
You are back with Gallant and George on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Paul and Joe. Reminder to join us at the decoy tomorrow. We'll be there from noon until 6. They'll open up at 2 so you guys can get in there and get ready to watch the Astros on opening day. Come out and enjoy some $2 Mexican candy shots, 100-ounce uh, Shiner Bach Towers for $10. Paul Hell and I yeah. are going to smash one of those in an hour. Uh. I think in my mind, I'm like, how much is 100 ounces? Because, you know, after today's show, no, I'm not so it's sure anymore. Pro- it's, it's, it's six pints. Should we each try to do one? Do our it's own? It's six pints. Should we do our own 100 ounce tower? No, you have. A, you no, have, to, has I'm to driving. <laughs> to rush his way to downtown. Yeah. No. I can stay for a little bit and. and and let it Mix wear off. Water. Yeah. yeah, enjoy some water. Six off. pints, because it's Back thirty-two. What? Sixteen ounces. Shut up. <laughs> sixteen ounces in a pint. Yep. Two times sixteen is thirty-two. Yep. Thirty-two times six is ninety-six. Okay. Excuse me. Thir- thirty-two times three is ninety-six. <laughs> yep. Sixteen times six also ninety-six. All right. Um, Math. Our final. Our our final matchup in our who have the best year hitters bracket. It's just it's the OGs. It's Jose Altuve versus Alex Bregman. Mm. This is, yeah, I, I don't know where you guys are going to go with this because I really didn't think Bregman was going to make it past you or not. So I, I'm curious that what direction you want to head in this one. Are you going to go, who has the better year, Jose Altuve or Alex Bregman? I'm going all in with Bregman having the year of all years. Okay. Alex Bregman, best year for the Houston Astros as a hitter, says Paul Galan. Swan song. We're talking batting 400. We're talking 65 home runs. We're talking 158 RBIs. It's all on the table. The final, the final, the final countdown. The what, greatest what he, year of all time. What if ever. he broke Barry Bonds' home run record? <laughs> That would be sick. And then Jim Crane would have to give him fifty million dollars. You'd have to extend. He gets it. tested like, after every game. Yeah, you, you'd have to. <laughs> right? What if he set the record for the eighth most home runs in American League history, and everyone makes a really big deal about it before every single baseball segment on ESPN mm-hmm. with the added conversation about how the Astros cheated back remember, in the day? Re- remember when they broke into the Cougs game? They did that with Judge. I, I, they they, pa- they 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 split screen a Cougs football game. Yeah, for Aaron and they, it was also right. they did like a Florida State Clemson one too. Mm-hmm. Like where <laughs> it was so <laughs> stupid. He has the seventh most home runs in American League history, was, and think, he's a New York Yankee. I think it was like him just like chasing like sixty. Like, I, I think I, it was, I don't even know if it was for I, those, the for that the was record break. Yeah, but, that was the sixty run. But what it really was was ESPN chasing nineteen ninety eight when they mattered yeah. well, more. They're telling ESPN you Radio, 97.5 and, and 92. And when five. baseball matters. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're literally about to back, back out of their baseball contract and not have television on baseball on TV anymore after 2025. So Wait, that's really happening? It got reported yesterday that, that by Andrew Martian that the that ESPN can opt out of their contract, their baseball contract, and wow. that they're considering it. Can you be the worldwide sports leader if you don't have baseball? I mean, though? this is what did they, this is what they did to hockey. They made hockey more relevant because hockey was on ESPN. And then they said that we're not doing it anymore because they want more NFL. Well, think they just signed a multi-billion-dollar contract with the college football playoff. Yeah, I mean, there's only so many billions to go around for these sports. They have, the, they probably want more. They have the Super Bowl now, so I guess Fox. Oh take, yeah, they're gonna get the Super. Like they're Bowl getting the there. Super Bowl in a couple years Ew. on ABC. Oh, it'll be on ABC. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I was but, like, it's gonna be on ESPN. What well, are we doing? Here? The McAfee broadcast will probably be on oh, ESPN. I'll Ew. call my shot on that one. Oh no, the Manning cast too. Yeah, you have the Manning cast, the McAfee cast, just Troy and Buck, uh, Troy and Joe, like doing the Super Bowl. So, so you say Bregman? Yeah, I'm with you. I, w- I would have picked Jordan Alvarez to win this whole thing, and not just because he's the one seed, but I think he's gonna have a monster year. But Alex Bregman's gonna have uh, a, a big year, and I'm gonna shove it in the Killer Bees' face that they told me that I don't know what I'm talking about Whoa. by just saying that my gut says Alex Bregman's gonna have a good year. Wow. So they're still bullying you. Yeah, just wait until we get to these prop bets. Uh, Alex Bregman goes off this year as a better year than Jose Altuve, and Jose Altuve still has a great year. It's possible, but it's not good. Yeah, this is a this is a pro Alex. What's Bregman wrong argument. with Dusty's lineup? Yep. It's me, Jer Bear. Since 2021, every single year, uh, Jose Altuve's had a better OPS. Don't care. Than, okay. Don't care. Okay. 
<laughs> don't care. All right. Well, Does it look like we care? No. What, no what, wait, what, hold on. What, what the numbers I'm nerds looking, say? I'm looking at, looking at Paul. No, it doesn't look like you care. Alex Bergman, I, better year than Jose Altuve. I know I started a sentence with OPS, so Paul does not care about what I don't know what that is. <laughs> All right, uh, I got some Astros prop bets here. Hit me. Uh, number one, uh, there, I have five of them. One is serious, uh, four are less serious. Uh, number one, days until Jeremy and Joel complain about Joe Espada's lineup. Tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. ha, uh, Literally well, during tomorrow's two, show. 2.45. Uh, <laughs> on the air. 2.45 on your guys' show. <laughs> yeah, he's going to call. He's going to stop. They're going to come to the side. He better give me my what's wrong with Joe Spada's lineup tweet. I think he will. Sure, people want it. Yeah, he'll, he'll have that tomorrow. Better. Uh, he might even give you a what's wrong with Joe Spada's opening day roster. <laughs> that one I would enjoy a little bit more. It's a little outside the box. He, he's going he's gonna to do that. Uh, so so days until Jeremy and Joel complain about Joe. Less Spotify. than zero. Yes. You think it's less than zero? I think he'll. They will be complaining about it. Yeah, in 24 hours. Chaz, this is when the tweet will go. So out. if if Chaz starts in left if, and Myers is in center and Jordan's your DH, I don't think they complain tomorrow. I think if Myers is in the lineup, they should complain if they were about that life, but they're not. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the over under is a half a day, <laughs> and you guys are taking under the under <laughs> under because by 243 tomorrow the lineup will be out yes all right minutes into today's show on the killer bees that joe that joel blank says he hates that parker mashinsky is on the opening day roster who's his least favorite player on the ash why is he his least favorite player he calls him mashinsky because he does get mashed pretty <laughs> often it's a, honestly it's a, it's a for, for joel's defense it's a very fair complaint he's not very good he pitched nine innings in spring training, though, and gave up no runs. Yeah, he's been working on it. Yeah, look so. what he's been doing in the spring training. I, yeah. I don't know if Joel knows ball like we do, so I don't know. Uh, I don't I'll, know. Set the, I'll set the over-under at 33 and a half minutes. Oh, I was going to. You know what I'm, <laughs> I, I think I think that uh, Joel's starting to understand baseball like me, mm-hmm. and uh, he understands that spring training numbers do matter, and uh, I think it's going to be a couple of shows. So uh, I, I have some faith in in okay. Joel, who's learning Under. ball from baseball minds like myself. He's, you're, you, you think he's going to wait until Mashinsky gets mashed? Until yeah. he complains. Until until he is mashed Shinsky. Because he is right I now, th- he is Mushinsky. I think within the first 32 minutes of the show, Joel Blank says that he hates that <laughs> Parker Mashinsky under. is on the opening day. <laughs> I'm also going under. So we're thinking I the think under. They're gonna yeah. <laughs> I think they're going to lead with Astros. Yeah. I think they're going to lead with Astros. It'll come up. J- Jeremy will do a good job resetting and be like, also, Parker Mashinsky made the, made the team. And then there's a comment yeah. by Joel. So uh, I, I would have gone like under on like if he was said 925. Like... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, times, you know, you guys are going to have to help me with this. And we okay. haven't heard from him yet, so maybe he doesn't know about the lineup change, even though it's a couple weeks in. Times that Tab will call in to brag about the Rangers. Well, hopefully, my friend Tab is still kicking. Are we concerned that that's possible? I haven't talk? heard from him. Okay. In in months. Now, okay. is, is Tab, Tab is not Total Dallas, correct, on the Twitch? No. Okay. I just want to make sure I don't know. it wasn't the same person. I miss Tab. I already miss him. Even I mean, he's the only tolerable Rangers fan. He's he's a good sport. He he seems to be a nice fellow. So I hope that Tab calls in the first Astros Rangers series. But obviously, with uh, you know some shakeups here at the station, does he know that I still exist as that's well? A, that's a good he, question. He might, he might call Dell Show, and then if so, I'll I'll point him in the. He's right be like, hey, dude, you're okay. calling the wrong show. Oh, I'll just feel like Please give him a warm embrace. Just tell, just tell the interns. The yeah. If, if Tab calls, tell him call back. Tell, at tell, tell Delhi better treat him with respect. Yeah. Okay. Put some respect on his name. Yeah. So we're gonna say like like two and a half calls this year because we're a little worried about Tab. Four and a half. Yeah, and I want him to call once. So I'm gonna so, go over. I want him to call tomorrow. I do too, actually. I I mean, I he hasn't talked to any trash yet. I mean, they're they're gonna raise. We need their... a chip on our shoulder. Yeah, no, tomorrow's. The, t- are they actually opening up at home, or are they opening? Yeah, up just on the remember road? for the next three days, Junior Bronco. We're all Cubs fans. Uh, as they uh, take open, I take on the Rangers. I still can't root for the Cubs. Yeah, yeah. Loser organization. We want you want the yeah. Cubs to beat the I don't Rangers want that on ring night. On me, just for just for four days. No. Who's the opening day starter for the Cubs? Uh, Justin Steele, I think. Mm. Wait, is it not Kerry Wood? Uh, no, that was. What about Mark no, Pryor? He's on the IL. He's on, <laughs> Kerry Wood and Mark Pryor on the injured list. Oh, uh, yeah. Dusty Baker ruined their lives. What about the other guy? The the, the guy that uh, you know the the guy who was the pitcher. The one who threw the no hitter against the Astros. No, the Ryan one. Dimster. No, the, the other guy in the Cubs. You know that John guy. John Lester. Greg Matt. That other. Yeah, well, that other guy. No, Raleigh, not that guy. Raleigh Fingers. No, 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 not that guy. The All other right, guy. Num- number four. <laughs> uh, days until Chandler Rome triggers Astros Twitter for the first time in the regular season. I don't know this article about. 
No, uh, it's reg- Bregman the today. Season. Saying so that start- Bregman is tomorrow at three o'clock is when it starts. <laughs> so we're we're not we're taking the offseason out of this. So starting tomorrow at three. I'm or looking, after the opening day lineup I, comes out. I'm looking at their schedule to see if if there's a rough stretch <laughs> it's coming the up. Star, I, I think it's, I'd say, under five days that he, like, sets I off Twitter. I don't get why everyone gets so mad about Chandler. Because he, oh, it's Princess Day, it, Minute Maid, and he made a joke about it, a bad joke on Twitter, and then everyone threw a temper but that's tantrum. Not, that's not, so- that's not. That is 100% where the Astros Twitter hate goes to Chandler Rome. Because it's of- because he made a weird comment about it apparently being disney princess day at minute Maid park and then ever since then people have been what was the weird comment i don't it was it was just was he talking about like what was it like hottest disney princesses or something like that he he was was like they're actually all 15 he was like it's disney princess (laughs) day and he made a comment i think it was just like you gotta you gotta give us more than i think he said for like for those that care honestly i think that's all it was and then people started going after what's wrong with that let me Nothing. see if I can find There's, it. Because I doubt he would have put out something that was like no, some it, of the stuff that we were discussing on the uh, air. 100%. <laughs> yes. Don't do that. Uh, don't, do, don't do that, as my godson, uh, Richie, says. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't uh, do that. I'm trying to. How do you spell princess? Like prince? <laughs> G, geez, Louise Joe. <laughs> This is this is just. I can't big. believe we're doing a show with this. I mean, well, Illinois, it, it, um, clearly Illinois, uh, you know, uh, budget deficit, not going to the schools. Yeah, it's clearly not. It's going um, to Lori Lightfoot's hair gel. Uh, so I'll set the over under uh, a f- five days for Astros tr- Twitter to get triggered at Chandler. Rome. I don't. Get, I I just don't get. It. Like, see, the reason he gave is not even a good reason. It's because the people think that he brings up stories in the clubhouse that like mean there's clubhouse issues. Like the Chaz McCormick versus Dusty thing, but okay, I mean, like, look at this it was tweet. a logical explanation for Chaz not, not playing. This Twitter, this this tweet had ninety seven thousand views. I regret to inform you that tonight is Star Wars night at Minute Maid Park from last year. He's trying to create engagement, and the people are just freaking out on. Well, Star Wars people are the like the most toxic fan base that there is. You think the Twitch is bad? Imagine if a bunch of Star Wars people got in there. These I, people I are think, animals. I don't think it was. Where are the comments? Are the comments being like, uh, actually? I it's like, almost just like Chandler, you're the worst. I don't, I don't even like two Star Wars of, anymore. Uh, Mandalorian better. I don't even. I don't even like Star Wars anymore because Star Wars fans have ruined it for me. Uh, over under um, six and a half playoff games won by the Astros this year. Over eight and a half. Let's over. Push it a little bit. Over. It's eleven to win the World Series. Mm-hmm. If well, don't, if you don't play in the if you don't play in the wild card, yeah. they're going to win the division though. Eleven and zero postseason. It's going to happen. Sweet. They got mad when I asked them about that. <laughs> I think I asked Alex Bregman about that when the World Series opened in 22. Yeah. I was like, it's like, hey, so you guys have a chance for a perfect uh, world's, uh, perfect playoffs. And I asked them all about it, and they're like, we're not thinking about that. And I was like, yeah, but no one's done it. Uh, I'll take the over as well. Astros won the World Series this year. 11-0 and postseason. Let's go. Sean, you taking the over? Yes. Or are you going to be a De- the- Debbie Downer? No, I'll take the over. Mm. All right. I Astros win the World the Series this year, official from the show. Yes. And uh, Alex Bregman will have the best year as a hitter on the Astros. Tomorrow we'll go through the pitcher. Yes. Everything's oh. 162 now. We're gonna have to, I gotta figure out that bracket, how we're gonna do the, the starters. The pitcher, I feel like the pitchers is gonna get nasty. Yeah, it will get pitchers nasty. is gonna be much more contentious than hitters was pretty obvious. Like the first round, there was not a single upset. Because we well, have like dice roll, like, oh, did Fromber Valdez get upset? Yeah. Uh oh, in yeah. this matchup on any given day, you never know what Mount Fromber is gonna do. All right, garbage time wraps up the show next year on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
Garbage time. So, I don't know if I should believe this post from Reddit. It's in the Bengals Reddit. Wife doesn't want me and won't let me dress up as Joe Burrow when we are intimate. Do you believe this is a real story? Yes. Or a pranker? This is real. Backstory. My wife and I have been together for eight years. Married for four. Our sex life's always been good, but it's gotten stagnant. Oof. We've been in the process of trying to spice things up over the past few months. In the midst of it, she happened to buy me a Joe Burrow jersey. I took it as a hint. I already have blonde hair. So I slicked it back and shaved my beard, threw on the jersey, and my full-size Bengals replica helmet, and got ready to go. I even asked her to call me Joe Burr. She hasn't talked to me in three days. How can I save my marriage? TLDR, wife backs out of Joe Burrow's sexual role play, now won't talk to me. That's tough. I think, I think this guy mis really misread the room. Yeah, I don't think that buying your hubby a Joe Burrow jersey is something that you're doing because you want him to wear it all mm. the time, especially in the bedroom. The replica helmet, <laughs> the slick back hair... If the anything, fact that you shave your beard and maybe your face is not the best face. Some people need beards. If anything, wearing the helmet, like, I, I feel like that's a mark against him. Because yeah. I, I don't think if she was fantasizing about uh, Joe Burrow, I'd imagine it wasn't with a helmet on. Right. <laughs> she probably, like, you may as well put a bag on your head yeah. if you're put a helmet on. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how, how your face looks. And Thanks some, for you're blonde. And some married couples are into that. So I mean, some of them, some of them like to you know do a little bag of ruski. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, especially Lions fans, I'm sure. Oh yeah, that's it's just just uh, wow. The <laughs> well, sadness what? is an aphrodisiac. Like Look at Joe punching down, <laughs> but forgetting so the that the Lions made the NFC champions. I'm champions. currently I'm punching up currently actually. <laughs> uh, yes, this story seems super legit and real. You think it's real? Okay. Yeah, what an idiot. <laughs> I, I kind of like it. You just got. You clearly don't know your people. I know. Your wife. I that's why that's why I kind of don't believe it. I'm like, has this guy ever met this woman before? I mean, how much of like Reddit do you just believe in general? Very little. Stuff like that, that seems like it was fake. It has to be. I just don't buy the idea that this person actually tried to do this seriously. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh one last uh story. This is this is in garbage time. People saw a UFO in Houston. This was uh, a couple days ago. They believed that it was non-human intelligence. Apparently, it was the SpaceX Falcon 9 booster doing a deorbit burn and coming in for a landing. Mm -hmm. Joe, do you believe in uh, the in UFOs? Aliens? Yeah, the NHI. The... Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Definitely real. Little so, among us. Good. I'm, I'm going to have a lot of stories to tell you about over the years. For example, this story that MI6 has made public, British Special Forces in the 80s downed uh, recovered a downed non-human craft in northern England. 20 to 30 special force operators were sent there. This vehicle was obviously non-human. It was also obvious that occupants fled the scene mm. on foot. Do you believe this? On foot? Were they uninsured? Probably. Yeah, probably had to run. Of course. Maybe. Uninsured alien motorists. Maybe that's who hit your car. Well, a lot of uninsured <laughs> alien motorists. All right. Uh, that'll do it for today's show. We'll be live at the decoy tomorrow. 100 ounce, $10. 100 ounces for $10 a Shiner Buck. Mexican candy shots. So come out to the decoy tomorrow. We'll be broadcasting there from noon till 6. Noon until 6. They open up at 2. So come watch Astros opening day with us tomorrow at the decoy. Uh, the Killer Beast with Joel, Jeremy, and Brian are up next. Goodbye. Peace.
Ooh, what up, H-Town? Hey, how we doing? He's Blank. I'm Branham. It's Brian behind the glass, and it's a Wednesday edition of the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. At Pac-Man Joel on Twitter, at Jeremy Branham on Twitter, at Sack by BMAC on Twitter, 713-780-ESPNs, the HRMP listener line, 713-780-3776. Blank, are you excited for opening day yet? I'm getting there. I, I mean, I kind of lost sight of the fact that it's tomorrow night uh, until we started talking about it yesterday. But, you know, I'm glad that real baseball that counts is going to be here because, you know, we've been kind of, aside from co- the college basketball and the Cougs, I mean, and the Rockets, it's just like it's always nice to have baseball back in the uh, in the rundown. That sounded uh, that sounded super wet blankety. I'm not going to lie. The opening days in 24 hours. Wet yeah, blank. There. Itty, okay, yeah, that maybe maybe it didn't sound appeasing to you. It's how I felt, and that's what I expressed. No, I just it doesn't sound like you're very excited. Like it, it sound, eh, you know, he'll be here tomorrow. He'll just be here tomorrow. Brian, are you excited for opening day? I'm ecstatic for opening day. <laughs> okay, okay. You can analyze that one. Why well, it's he's more excited than you. Oh, okay. It doesn't take much analysis. <laughs> like it, it's pretty simple. <laughs> so um, so we, I guess we have to add that to the list. We can't hire Joel to be our defense attorney, and we can't hire him <laughs> to pump us up about opening day. He can't be our hype man for opening hype day. Man. There you go. Yep. In front of uh, if before game one of one sixty two, which is in less than twenty four hours, aka six oh five first pitch tomorrow night, uh, admitted made part game one of the four game. I, I'm excited. Um, it, it I will admit that it has snuck up on us. Uh, I think that it uh, it got here. Than you know, quicker than it usually feels. I think there's two things, at least from in my world, that that kind of lead to that. One is the Texans went deeper into the playoffs, so it feels like okay, less less distance between the end of football season to the beginning of baseball season. And quite frankly, prior to this season for the Texans in the previous three years, the season was over before the season ever began. So we were probably looking forward to Astros opening day like week three of the NFL season. Mm-hmm. And then March Madness, you know, if you still have a team in it, you know, you're still clearing that hurdle, I think, before you turn. No, I mean, obviously 100% attention is on opening day, but it's like, okay, it's one of a few things. It's not one of the only, but I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think the Astros are going to be very, very good uh, yet again. I've been on record to say I think they run away with the American League uh, West, and we're going to have Todd Callis on for our first of his weekly visits with the Killer Bees coming up at 345, uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. you got 45 minutes to get excited before Todd Callis uh, joins us, Blankers. Uh, I think the Astros are going to be good. If we're assuming like just breaking down all of Major League Baseball into tiers and you have like your championship tier uh, you have your contenders to the championship playoffs however you want to break down those tiers where do you think you would have the Astros relative to the rest of Major League Baseball I honestly have them you know on that top tier there's a there's a few select teams that are on that top tier I, I don't think they've anything done anything that would lead me to believe anything different I like the addition of Hader. Uh, I, I like the fact that this team is, is really solid offensively. And even with all the, the question marks on the starting pitching while they fight through some injuries, I think that they have more to choose from than just about any other team in baseball when it comes to other starting pitchers. They'll get the, the, the a good portion of them back throughout the season. And I feel really good that they're going to be in the same kind of position they've been in in the last few years. Yeah, I think they're going to be – You didn't, which, which tier? Was that at the top tier yeah, for top you? Yeah, top tier for me. I have them in the top tier as well. Uh, Major League Baseball presented nine tiers uh, to all of, like, Major League Baseball. And they had the first tier they had as the big two, which they didn't have the Astros in the big two. The second tier they had World Series or bust, which is kind of weird. Like, that seems like part of the big six or whatever. Uh, the, the third tier they had making the postseasons the minimum bar to clear. The fourth tier, they had the Yankee zone, which is just the Yankees. Go figure that one team gets an entire tier, and it's the New York Yankees. Surprise, surprise. Uh, tier five, big winters, competitive summers. Uh, the sixth tier that they have is uh, young and extremely interesting. The Reds are one of those teams. I think the Reds are going to be the best of those young and extremely interesting teams. Tier 7, they have competitive, probably. Tier 8, they have direction unclear. And then the ninth tier, they have looking to the future, which you have like your A's, your Nationals, your Rockies, your White Sox. They have the Astros in the second tier here, which is World Series or bust, which is, you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have four teams in that tier. The Astros, actually, I'm going to ask this the other way. Who do you think is in the big two? Uh... Gotta Bra- be Dodgers Braves and Braves, and Dodgers. right? Yeah, Braves and Dodgers. You're exactly right. You can click the link. That's fantastic. The Braves I and the Dodgers. I didn't click the link. I guessed. 
I didn't say you did. I just said you can. Uh, the Braves and the Dodgers are at the big two. I find this a little bit surprising. I think it's disrespectful to two different teams. I think it's disrespectful to the Astros. Uh, the Astros have proven that year in, year out, that they're Final Four teams ever since 2017. Uh, I think the Braves are a little bit better than the Astros, but I don't think the Dodgers are. And then the, the other team that I, I actually think it's disrespectful to is not really the Rangers, not the defending champions. I actually think it's the Baltimore Orioles. And I know that they don't have the resume of, of those other teams, but if I had to pick the best four teams in baseball, I would have the Braves, Dodgers, Astros, and Orioles. And I think that those four teams should be on the top tier, not just two of those four. Yeah, I, I think that everybody would probably assume, and because of their bank account and their payroll, put the Yankees in there. I don't believe in the Yankees starting pitching. Uh, and with Garrett Cole having the issues with his arm right now, it, it lessens them even more. Sure, Soto added to that lineup is going to be interesting. Yankees aren't in those four. I know, Yankees, I'm saying. Yankees, Yankees but I'm saying a lot of people would expect the Yankees. close. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to say is a lot of people, which I started this by saying this, is a lot of people would think the Yankees should be in there and that they would be in there. And, and I just I, I just don't put them in there. I, I think that you're, re, you're legitimately right about no the Orioles. Did because of the fact that they actually made a savvy move this offseason to add a starting pitcher, which they needed, which we saw. That offensive lineup has, with some of the young guys and some of the guys that had career years has to do it again. They're as talented as just about anybody in the American League. That's a good young team. They're going to be there for a while. Yeah. Do you, do you think that the uh, second tier for the Astros is a fair one and not being in that top two tier? Now, the second tier is labeled World Series or bust, so it's like super complimentary for a second tier. It's like as good a name for a second tier as you can give. Like, if you're going to say a team's second tier, you're not like, oh, this team's a World Series team, uh, but they do. I, I just have an issue What's... with them being behind, specifically the Dodgers. Like, I'll, I'll give you the Braves on paper or better than the Strohs. I'm mm -hmm. not giving you the Dodgers. I, th it, what's the title of the first tier? Uh, the Big Two. The big two. Okay. Well, two. yeah, I mean, I guess the big two is also World Series or bust, and they just busted bankrolls and did got all kinds of creative to get there. Look, I don't believe in the Dodgers pitching all that much. Um, I, they're out, their lineup is pretty pretty uh, in, in, impressive, uh, especially at the top part of it. But I, I don't think that there's any kind of separation line where I wouldn't put the Astros right in there with those two teams specifically. I, I think if I was going to do a top tier, it would probably be the Astros, Dodgers, and Braves. Because I think the Orioles still have some things to prove, and their pitching and, the, and their youth has to keep continuing. And they're, like I said, the guys that had careers keep stepping up. I think the three proven teams that should be on the first tier are the Braves, Dodgers, and Astros. Yeah, um, Brian, what do you think? Do you think it's just a little disrespectful to leave the Astros off of the uh, the top tier instead of a big two, not a big three? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I'm with you guys. I don't believe. I get why people put the Braves uh, in the top tier. They certainly, I think, on paper, have the most talent. I think they have the most, you know, uh, like talent that could take an, a, a leap up from where they even were last year, and they still had a lot of talent uh, on that team last season. But the problem is, with it's a team going back now a couple of years, ever since they won the World Series in 2021, is disappointed. So I don't see how that they've separated themselves necessarily from the Dodgers and the Astros. And I would make that top tier a three-team tier with the Astros, Dodgers, and uh, and Braves. Yeah. Who do you think the best team in baseball is? On paper, I would say the Braves. Uh, I, I don't disagree. I, I think it's between – I honestly think it's between the Braves and the Astros. And, and right now, you know, because the Braves are healthier, I'd probably say the Braves. Yeah, I think that the Braves are the best, too. The, the Dodgers, to me, are super, like, star and scrubby. Like, I don't love the middle of that team that much. Like, they gave Will Smith $140 million this year, and it's like, okay, he's a pretty good player. I didn't realize he's their middle-of-the-order guy. Like, he hits cleanup for mm -hmm. them at times. I, I don't think he's a very good cleanup man. And, like, who they have at the top is obviously very good. Uh, Mookie Betts is one of the best offensive players in baseball. Shohei Otani is one of the best offensive players in baseball. Now, those two have been stained in controversy, Shohei Otani with the recent stuff and then Mookie Betts with his video guy. But you can't take away from their production. Like, they, they are really good. Outside of that, like, it's kind of a bunch of mediocrity. Ooh, and I don't love their one. pitching staff. I think you're forgetting Freddie one. Freeman. Yeah, Freddie Freeman. Yeah, Freddie the, Freeman's a damn stuff. good yeah, hitter. Yeah. I did forget about him. You're yeah. right. Uh, I would throw him in the mix there, too. But everything I mean, else is just kind of meh. Yeah, there's just three guys, though. That's the problem. That's three guys. Yeah, I mean, the, I like Will Smith, but he's, I mean, at, at best, he's a guy that hits about, you know, 285, 290, 20 home runs. He's not this massive difference maker in the heart of a lineup that should be hitting fourth in a cleanup spot. Their top three with Betts uh, and Freeman and, and Otani is, is probably the best 
uh, top three, other than maybe the Braves, I think, can make an argument with, especially with the Kuna there in the top three. Uh, but after that, I don't, I don't love their lineup. After that, and you got a lot of question marks with the rotation, including, I mean, I think a lot of people are penciling, penciling in, uh, you know, at least a, a strong half season for Walker, Walker Bueller. But he's coming off of Tommy John. You don't know how he's going to respond. So there's a lot more question marks, I think, on the Dodgers than people are willing to admit. They get, they're, they're hoping Carrot Top comes back, too, to contribute. They got a lot of hopes coming on guys coming back from injury as well, and their pitching wasn't that good. They got some young arms they tried to work into the rotation last year, too. I, I just I don't believe in the Dodgers pitching much at all, as good as their lineup is. And then, they, you know, they keep overspending for guys that have maybe had a year or two somewhere else. Now it's Teoscar Hernandez they've added. Um, I, I don't. They're, they're top-heavy in their lineup, for sure, offensively. All right, so we think that the Astros should be in the conversation with the Braves and the Dodgers. Do we think now they they have the Astros, the Orioles, the Phillies, and the Rangers in their champ their World Series or bust? Is there anybody in that foursome that does not belong? I think the Phillies and the Rangers definitely belong. I think the Rangers, when they start getting some of their pitching back, we talked about how strong their offense is going to be, and and you made the point that they're with the young guys they're adding, they they had the potential to be better. I think they belong. I think the Phillies definitely adding pitching to a good offensive lineup. They belong. Who are the other two? The Orioles and the Astros. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I think all four of those teams belong in the conversation to have a chance to win the World Series. The one that I would poke holes in are the uh, the Rangers. I, I just hate their pitching staff. Their pitching staff's atrocious, and I know that they won a World Series last year basically with that pitching staff. But probably. Yeah, I mean, probably I, I, so. Yeah, I mean, obviously their offense is going to be lead. It's it's there's got a they got a great chance to lead the league and run scored, but especially now after having lost out on on Jordan Montgomery, you don't know uh, the timeline or even when they get back for Degrom and Scherzer, how great those two guys will be. I mean, I I think they could slug their way to a winning record to you know eighty five plus, maybe even ninety, but I can't see them as quote unquote World Series or bust based upon the pitching staff. I, I think, think that they lost their best guy from last year. They, I mean, their best guy was Jordan Montgomery last year, and he's gone. Uh, Degrom obviously is super talented. I don't trust Degrom to be healthy. Uh, Max Scherzer has been injury prone in the last couple of years, and is older. He's like in his forties now, and I know that Verlander's in his forties too, but he's not shut down for like the first couple of months of the year. Uh, and the Astros also have other pitchers aside from Verlander. Uh, the, the Rangers really don't like they're they're counting on Dane Dunning, and they're counting on Michael Lorenzen, uh, so Heaney. Yeah, there's just a collection of mediocrity. Now, their offense is going to carry them, and their offense is good enough to get hot in the postseason mm -hmm. and, and make a run and win the World Series like they did uh, last year. Uh, a texter saying Branham is already throwing his negativity towards the Dodgers. Why Why wouldn't I? Like, what have the Dodgers done other than winning a lot of regular season games over the year and winning a bubble World Series? Like, they've been a major disappointment. The fact that they've won one World Series in the millennium, is that right? Yeah, the last World mm -hmm. Series they won before the COVID World Series was in 1988. I was three years old. So the Dodgers have won one World Series since I turned four. I was it 30. was during the COVID year. <laughs> it was during the COVID year, and they've spent more money than everybody in baseball just about. Like, they're always top three in payroll. The Dodgers, to me, have been one of the most major disappointing franchises in all of Major League Baseball this century. Yeah, no, I, that's why I call them the Utah Jazz of Major League Baseball. They're great in the regular season. They don't do anything in the playoffs, and they don't win titles unless it's a COVID year and a 60-game season. I, you can... Throw all the money in the world at whatever you want, and the Yankees are starting to look like this too over the last several years in the fact that money doesn't buy you chips the way it used to. And and the Dodgers, hey, you know, yay team. This is coming from a texture that's also a big Patriots fan. I guess front runners are the, the pick of the day, but I, I don't give the Dodgers too much credit because they didn't come home with the, uh, the prize at the end of the year, and that's what you're supposed to do when you're a good regular season team. We don't throw parades for regular season wins right. around here. 24774 says, sounds like spoiled Astro fans are back on the three to six time slot. It's not so much spoiled because I, I, I do think there are spoiled fans. I'm not a spoiled fan. Uh, it would be more of an arrogant Astro fan, maybe, uh, maybe a bit pretentious. I see what Scotch is talking about now yesterday. <laughs> it's starting to come it full circle. Hours later. <laughs> yeah, it's starting to come full circle. Uh, 9648, I agree with Branham for once. Hey, thanks. Outside of LA's big three, the rest are mediocre. Uh, six eight five six. Oh, it's the Dodger fan. Y'all act like the Astros didn't cheat in 2017. We don't act like the Astros didn't cheat. We're just not ignorant to the fact that everybody was cheating. Yes, the Astros did things that technically were frowned upon in the Major League Baseball circle, as did other teams. All of the other teams. There's no you're you're ignorant here a little bit. Uh, seven four seven seven one three seven. Where is that zip code from, by the way? Seven four seven. You know, on top of your head. Zip code or area code. 
747 is California, I believe. Somewhere in California. And you wonder why I get snappy with you. Uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> what do you know? It's an L.A. County area code. Yeah. What do you know? Uh, 713-780-ESP. And I, I hope you like that COVID championship. It's a lot of fun. Uh, 713-780-3776. We're on the uh, Twitch, twitch.tv slash ESPN 97.5. Everybody's, uh, everybody's invited, including L.A. Dodger fans. Uh, we're on uh, YouTube at ESPN Houston. You can find us there. Blankers is at Pac-Man Joel. Brian's at Sag by me by uh, BMAC. I'm at Jeremy Branham. Uh, Todd Callis will be joining us at 345. More fights in the Fight Club bracket coming up in the 4 o'clock hour. Uh, Brian makes faces on Wednesday for whatever reason. And we'll get to the worst coaches that the uh, Houston sports has seen over the recent years. 713-780-3776. Also, when we come back, Jordan Montgomery has signed a deal. Should the Astros have done the deal, assuming that Montgomery would have signed with the Astros? And what does it say about this Astros pitching staff and confidence that you have in this rotation? It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. You're listening to The Killer Bees with Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios. Uh, 9618. Didn't know Blankers was that old. That's mean. That's I'm the one that the said it. It's fine. You are. You are the one that said it. I like self-deprecating uh, humor. <laughs> Uh, someone said, like Houston, they have no national titles. Fight fire with fire. I can respect that. 
Uh, 60-30, let's get real. This Astros lineup is not strong. The Rangers have a strong lineup for sure, even if their pitching is not good. I think the Rangers lineup is fantastic. I, I disagree wholeheartedly, though, on the Astros lineup not being strong. I think the Astros lineup is very good. They finished top, what, seven last year in baseball, yeah. uh, and they miss. 70 games with Jose Altuve. They missed 40 games with Jordan Alvarez. Yeah. You had Corey Jolks making a ton of starts, and Chaz McCormick was not. And then you upgrade tremendously at the catcher position offensively. So I disagree. I think the Astros lineup is going to finish top five in the American League. That's what I, I read the text of Brian in the in the break going, I mean, you eliminate Maldi, and you eliminate injuries, and you're already talking about a team that's worthy of being – you know, a top 10 offense in baseball and everything else you mentioned. It's like that's just kind of a ludicrous statement. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's a little bit fear mongering, uh, to be honest. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN three two zero nine LAFC MLS trophy is bigger than Dodgers and Lakers bubble championships combined. Uh, yeah, there you go. Let's I do it for the MLS. Both the Lakers and the Dodgers were bubble titles. Wow, yeah. way to go, LA. Yeah, four five one eight. I think Renault Blanco was surprised us this year. I'll have some thoughts on that a little bit later. Uh, Keith from LA, keep the heat coming, B Ham. Uh, I'm all I'm at the cheating Astros all year. I don't know what that means. And in the words of Dylan Brooks, y'all old. How old do you think Keith from LA is? Just from the sound of his text messages. Thirty five. I think he's forty three. Keith from LA, be honest, honest, honor system here. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. How old are you? How old are you? Can you, you can ask another man that, right? That's trustworthy. What's that? That's trustworthy. Asking someone on on one of our uh, like platforms to be completely honest when we can't do any fact checking. There's some guys that I trust. Uh, there's some guys that I don't like. King of Twitch because I've won two bets with against him and he hasn't paid me once. I uh, don't trust him as far as I can throw him. Um, and then, but I do. Cut, I, I would trust Key from LA. I don't know but why. He's, but he's from LA. Why. why would you trust the guy from? I LA? don't know why. I, I, they just I, the tenor of his text. I've never seen the dude. All I know is that it's Key from LA. That's all I know. But from the tenor of his text, because at times he can be honest uh, with like, or he can be like truthful with like where the LA state of sports are. You know what I mean? Uh, I just have a feeling he's an honest dude. I, I just I get that read off of him. I don't know why. I just do. I'm usually I'm usually a pretty good judge of character. Mm. Okay. Did you know that? I did. I did not. I am. I'm usually a really good judge of character. You don't just. You don't agree with that. Acknowledge me. Really good judge of character. You disagree? I, I'm just. I'm just amazed that you're patting yourself on the back for it. It's just. A, it's a. It's a very random, weird pat on the back. Uh, especially it's when you. Well, it's one of my best traits. It's one of my few quality traits. But you're basically a really good judge uh, of character. Man, really I, good judge of character. I'm, take, I'm not I, talking like this specific. I'm not talking about in this only instance. I'm talking about my entire life with everybody that I know. I'm a real good judge of character. Like P. Diddy, he went down, saw it coming. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I was, okay. I was biting on the bit for a while, but you lost me when you brought in P. Diddy. Uh, Jordan Montgomery signed a uh, one-year $25 million deal. It's got a vesting option for $25 million uh, next year. First off, as we like to play, uh, whenever these players sign these types of contracts, and we just assume that, you know, if you give him the contract, he's going to come play for you and not go where he went because maybe he likes it there. Uh, but would you have given this uh, this deal to Jordan Montgomery? Uh, I would have considered it. Uh, I, you didn't have to uh, – correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't have to give up anything to get so is him. Is that a yes or a no? Jesus, you are on one today. I'm just curious. I asked you the question, and you're beating around the bush. I, I, I can't. I mean, I guess I have to answer and follow follow in to whatever form you want me to answer in. Yeah, uh, you're I, supposed to have a strong stance. I, I would consider it, but at the same time, I still feel good about their starting pitching. If this was something that they had done a little earlier, the the deal make it's it's not it's not what Blake Snell was. I think that. It would have been nice to have him, but I don't think that they need him. And at this point in the season, I think I'm ready to roll with what they got. Okay. I would have done it. I would have done it. I think it's a very affordable deal, like $25 million for one year. Like, that's – okay, cool. And he doesn't carry I, – I don't believe – I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong because I think we looked it up one day during the show. Uh, he doesn't carry draft pick compensation like Blake Snell did, did. I don't think that he has the upside of Blake Snell, but I think that he's immediately one of your top – three starters Ooh. I would I would bet on Montgomery having a better year than Javier uh, but I would argue but so I would also say that Javier, and only yeah and I also think I mean it, it wouldn't shock me if Montgomery has a better year than Verlander to be honest like he's an older guy he's had a couple of injuries these last two years um, what was Montgomery's ERA last year it was low Rangers? threes but I'll look it up yeah it was probably it might have been better than Verlander's last year 
So, like, if you went off the last year's numbers, Montgomery would have been one of your top three starters. Uh, so he he fix he 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 is part of like, and even if he's not your top three, he's your top four. How many guys are you starting in the playoffs? You're starting four guys. Uh, so I I would have done this if you're considering Blake Snell at upwards of nearly thirty million dollars. I would have given Jordan Montgomery twenty five for one. Uh, Montgomery can opt out of the twenty five deal if he makes ten starts in twenty four. So maybe it's just a one year deal, and then the salary vest at twenty million with ten starts is like very complicated. It's escalated up based on how many starts that he makes. It could be upwards of fifty million for two years. So it's not a long term commitment. You don't lose the draft pick. He fits squarely into the middle of the rotation I, I would have been in favor of the Astros doing this deal and again it's not my money because they didn't I'm not calling Jim Crane cheap though so his ERA overall last year 320 but just with the Rangers which was 11 starts 279 and then he and was phenomenal a, in the postseason and he was too. phenomenal in the postseason too I'm, I'm with Jeremy in this one I've, I would have absolutely done it just because it's, it's one year like some of the I mean I get why potentially uh, Jim Crane pushed back on Blake Snell because Blake Snell wanted the second year. And maybe you want to reset and, and assess what you're going to do next year, next year, and not lock yourself in to uh, some more money that will put you in obviously higher and higher tax uh, tax brackets. But with Jordan Montgomery, he's a proven uh, guy in the postseason. Hell, he did it against you last season. Uh, and he alleviates, I mean, the problem, the questions and concerns we have about, you know, Javier's consistency, the guys like McCullers and, and Louis Garcia coming back, when is Verlander available? If you add Montgomery to that, not only are you making your your starting rotation super deep when everyone is ready to go, but I think you alleviate the early season uh, question marks you have about the starting rotation until everyone's ready to go. So one year, I would sign me up. I don't care if it's $25 million. It, It's totally worth it to me. It's, a, it's definitely a more affordable deal. We talked about that at, at the time when we were kicking around what Snell was looking for. But but to me, the bigger thing, too, is Crane's already gone over the tax. He, he, went, he extended himself on – on uh, Hater, uh, I understand it. If for a one-year deal, he doesn't want to add twenty-five million to the bottom line right now, and it, and still leave the possibility open that you can still do some things, have some flexibility as you start the season, getting from now until the the trade deadline. The the issue with that though is now you're losing some of a depleted minor league system, and that's actually the benefit of a Jordan Montgomery, not a Blake Snell, is you don't lose your draft pick. So like that's one of the cons of signing Blake Snell. That doesn't exist yeah. with Jordan Montgomery. I'm not saying I didn't want Blake Snell either, but I, I at the time I was considering Montgomery. But based on what what I've seen and the fact that the, from what we're hearing from a medical perspective too, I don't think that he needs to spend any more on starting pitching. And there would be just like almost a glutton of starting pitching once when we start getting guys back. And yes, Brian, you're right. It would make the bullpen in the middle of the bullpen probably a lot stronger. But I, I think that it still gives you options now without adding 25 million that if they do want to make a move or feel like they have to make a move, whether it be injury-related, bat-related, whatever it is, that they still have – that they're not going to go blow it out of the water, but they could add someone. But Now, Blankers, you say you can't trust McCullers, though, right? Like, you, you've said that many times. Right, absolutely. Okay, but – so I can't allow you to say that you're adding the starting pitching in the middle of the summer. Like, you're adding Luis, sure, but you can't count on McCullers if you're somebody that says you can never trust but, but McCullers. You're, it's, it's not just – you're getting Verlander back. You're going to get Garcia at a certain point. You're going to get Urquidy, I think, at a certain point. Is he an upgrade over Montgomery, Urquidy? I'm not saying he's an upgrade over him, no, but I'm saying that you have enough options to get to, to that will get you through the majority of this season, and then you'll set up your top four for the playoffs, mm -hmm. and I think they'll be just fine. I'm actually not that far off from you. Like I'm a, I'm like at a six. I, I wish they would have done this deal, but I'm not like mad at it. Um, uh, probably a little bit more upset at the Blake Snell one because I think Blake Snell gives you more upside at the top of the rotation. So I'm not like crazy, like banging the table for this. I wish they would have done it, but I'm not losing my mind that they didn't. Um, the only negative I see though is the finances, and like the finances are a big deal for Crane. Mm -hmm. uh, not calling him cheap, like he's going to have a top five payroll in all the baseball, and he's paying into the luxury tax. You can't call him cheap. Uh, but I, I really don't see another negative other than the finances. Do you? No, no, the, I understand That's it though. The deal breakers, yeah, the yeah. finances. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm cool with that because he's already went over it, and I don't think he wants to go. You know, th there's another level you can get to. He obviously doesn't want to get there. Yeah, I, I just think he. He's probably feeling like I've spent enough for right now. The the pushback would be though, I and mean, they were clearly in on Blake Snell, and it sounds like they were in on to a point where it was two years, fifty million. So we're talking about basically twenty five per year, and now yeah. you get that guy on the one year deal. I mean, 
I, I'm not, I'm not like you know, red line, super mad level, you know, nine out of ten. Sure. But uh, I would might maybe go a little bit higher just because if you're in on Blake Snell, I don't see. Um, and this is a conversation we had in the weeks right before Blake Snell signed. I don't see a massive drop off from Blake Snell, especially when you look at his overall consistency in the, in the years between the Cy Young awards. I don't see a massive drop off. So if you're willing to go two years, about fifty million for Blake Snell. I mean, right here, Jordan Montgomery, one year, 25. We don't know if Montgomery wanted to be here, so that might be why he ended up in Arizona. But if he was willing, the Astros, Astros should have been uh, willing as well. I have a theory on Crane where he's willing to spend, but he's he's only going to spend on, like, top-level talent or t- players that he thinks are top-level talent. I mean, he's uh, so like I, I agree. front, though. I agree with What's Jeremy, that? but I'd take it another step up. I think it's not only top-level talent, but that name – recognition cachet yeah. means something I, I to him too. Like I mean, cachet, he saw, right. he yep. saw Jordan Montgomery, you know, up close and personal in, in the ALCS last year. It's not like this is some unknown guy that came out of, you know, out of nowhere. It just only last season. It's a guy that's been a, a, a good to pretty good starter for a number of years. And you saw him in I think person. Solid. I think you saw that had a he, career year. Now, how many Cy Youngs uh, does he have, Brian? I was just see that's, I was going to say, <laughs> you're making my point because yep. to him, Jordan Montgomery, we saw up close and personal. Did the rest of baseball see it? Because the rest of the baseball knows, knows Justin Verlander. They know Josh Hader. They know big names. Yeah, that but he's, we're talking he, about Jim Crane, though. We're not talking about the rest of the baseball. But Jim Crane likes those big names so that everyone in baseball Man, takes I notice. He does. I, I, I he is know, a big name guy. There's that, no doubt about it. That that feels like a miss. I, I mean, that feels that kind of feels short sighted to me. I get it. Blake Snell's the the bigger name. He's got the two two Cy Youngs. But in between those two Cy Youngs, he had two seasons with an ERA north of 4.20. Jordan Montgomery's consistent. You saw him in person doing the playoffs. Sure. Two year team last year, and you get him on a one year shorter deal. I, I think it makes absolutely no sense to pass on him. If indeed that's what happened with uh, Jim Crane and, and Jordan, Jordan Montgomery. Where does Jordan Montgomery slot into your rotation? I think he's third. Uh, Where does uh, Blake Snell slot into your rotation? Fully healthy. What about Verlander? I mean, is that with or without Verlander? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where does Blake Snell fall into your rotation? Fully healthy third. third. Yeah, I I would have Fromber and JV one, two, fully healthy. And then Snell and Montgomery would both be third. The way that I look at it from Crane is that he views Snell as his top of the rotation guy, like either one or number two, and he's willing to spend on a top two dude. He's not willing to spend on a middle rotation dude. And I think that's the difference between Snell and The only reason why he would be – the only reason why he would be three, Brian, is because Fromber might they, they might feel like Fromber might have a breakdown if he's not one or two. I think I think Blake Snell, in their mind and thinking, if they if they had gotten him, would have been top of the rotation. Seven one three seven eight zero ESP and HRMP listener line. He said he was forty, so I was closer, but you win because price of right price is right rules, right? Because you said thirty. I thirty five. Oh yeah, so I yeah I said forty three, so I was closer, but I was over. So, if we're playing Price is Right rules, you won on that one. Um, I can't do the Price is Right noise when you go over. 50-46, Dodgers and Yankees last year. World Series title is back in the Flintstone days. Uh, 1604, I enjoy listening to you, Brandon, but you're poo-pooing everything Blankers is saying. Not really. I'm just making them answer a question. Ease off a bit. That stuff turns an enjoyable listener, uh, though I don't want to turn this off. It's Killer Bees, not the Jeremy Knows Best show. No, I'm just forcing him to answer a question. That's it. Uh, 713-780-ES. P and HRMP listener line 713-780-3776. I have three pitches, three pitches that will make or break the Astros season this year. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. ESPN 92.5. Mike Holly, U of H class of 1990, go Cougs, has been protecting the interests of businesses for nearly 25 years. HRMP provides comprehensive human capital management services, including HR compliance, benefits administration, and payroll. HRMP will also work with you to customize a plan for whatever you need. There's nothing cookie cutter about HRMP. If you need a little help, a lot of help, anything in between, HRMP will create a plan for what you and your business needs. Also, their customer service is second to none. You'll never talk to a stranger on the other side of the line. You'll be calling someone that's familiar with you, familiar with your company. I can speak to that customer service. Anytime I have a question, I always get a quick response. It's very easy to understand. Let HRMP take on the demands of human resources and eliminate your HR burden so you can get back to growing your business. Call now, 281-880-6525. Let HRMP get started on customizing a plan for you, 281-880-6525, or just check them out online, hrp.net. That's hrp.net.
You're listening to The Killer Bees with Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. On ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios. He's Blank. I'm Branham. We are The Killer Bees. ESPN 97.5, ESPN 92.5. 713-780-3776. I have three pitches for you, Blankers. That's going to make or break the Astros season. And, and poo-poo it all you want. Uh, break it apart. Three pitches. Let's start with... Framber Valdez. Mm -hmm. Framber Valdez's sinker is one of the three pitches that will make or break this season. We can go back to last year and talk about everything that happened, uh, whether it was the All-Star game, not getting the start, didn't even go to Seattle to participate in the All-Star game because he didn't get the start that he very much wanted. Uh, But his his sinker started to gain velo in the second half of last year too, added velo to Fromber's sinker. Now it doesn't get the movement. Now you're not getting the ground balls. In turn, it makes Fromber a less effective pitcher. I want Fromber to get back into the low 90s with that sinker, get the downward action, get the movement, get the ground balls, and if Fromberg can do that, I think Fromberg can be back to being a top three, top five Cy Young guy. If he can't, I think we're going to get a Fromberg that we saw in the second half of last year. No, I, I agree with that because I have, I'm on record as saying I think he's going to have that bounce back. I think he's going to be where he needs to be, and we all know he lives off the ground ball, and we know he has to have control and, and live down in the zone. If he can be down in the zone, and, and obviously that's the key pitch for him, if he's down in the zone, then he's going to be effective. He's going to have a good year. So I think that's that's a that's a good one. Yeah, so that's the first one for the uh, for the top three pitches that are going to make or break the year, the three pitches that are going to make the break the year for the Astros. The second one's Christian Javier. And I want Javier to develop the changeup, and Javier's mm. working on that changeup. Javier showed the changeup more in spring training. But Christian Javier will forever be – determined it will will he'll always be judged and always get production with his fastball Mm -hmm. his fastball is his best pitch the invisible as we've known to you know we've come to know it and it's that high fastball up in the zone that looks like it's rising Javier wasn't getting that vertical movement like we saw in years past and he was also about a two to three miles per hour slower with the fastball the reports in spring have been promising I think if Javi can throw that fastball like he did in spring and two years ago Javi again can be that high strikeout guy that can shut some teams down if he doesn't Christian Javier is going to be a a bad contract because he's going to have a high inflated ERA just like he did last year is it fair for me to say that my pushback would be because of how how effective the invisible has to be and we've seen the velo up as you mentioned that I think that's the pitch I think that when he has that pitch no matter what else he has in, in his arsenal he really seems to have a distinct advantage on hitters when he when he's on the hill I, I I think it's – I forget how you normally break it down, that we're just looking at it from a different perspective or we're kind of nitpicking a little bit. But for me, it would be if he has that pitch, that pitch is better than a lot of the best pitches in a lot of pitchers' arsenals in baseball, that, that mm-hmm. that's the key to me. Yeah, that, that one to me is is massive because I, I, I don't think Christian Javier is an above-average starter in Major League Baseball if he doesn't have that pitch. I, I think he throws BP if he doesn't have that pitch. Mm-hmm. Like, his slider is pretty good, but he, does, he has trouble throwing a, stri- a slider for a strike. It's more whenever he's up in the count trying to get a punch out. Uh, he has trouble – like it's, it's, a lot of pitchers will have like a get-it-over curve or get-it-over slider where you're just showing it early in the count because you know the, pit, the hitter is not going to swing at anything other than a fastball. And you just you know, throw it up there, you jump ahead of the count 0-1. Javier doesn't really have that pitch. Uh, the changeup, I think, can help his arsenal, but he's forever going to be what his fastball is. Mm-hmm. And then the final one for you, uh, for you guys is Hunter Brown. Uh, I, I was I listen, I watched this YouTube about Hunter Brown's that hard slider that he throws, and a lot of people just call it cutter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was that you know hot, like one of the highest velo sliders in all of Major League Baseball? Some people call it a cutter, but it wasn't very effective. Like he was he was giving up a lot of contact in in like the opposing OPS and stuff was very very high. I was reading a video where he's turned that hard slider into two different pitches. So he has an extra pitch in his arsenal now. He, he's, he's kind of forked in the road them two different ways, where now he's throwing a slower slider, and this is a get-it-over slider so he can get ahead of the count, just show on the slider. Now you start to count 0-1 and you can really attack. And now he's throwing a true cutter, which isn't as hard, but it's getting more 
uh, more movement. He's getting more swing and miss. He's getting more, you know, ride away from a righty. So that's something that I think is going to be a, a huge factor for Hunter Brown as well because that cutter, you know, we, we, it's sexy. You know, it's a 96-mile-per-hour slider. It's really a cutter, and it's not moving a whole lot, and hitters aren't missing it. Uh, I think that's going to go a long way if Hunter Brown can master those two other pitches and how he wants to use them in his arsenal to attack hitters. I think that can turn Hunter Brown into a pretty good pitcher. Yeah, I, I had read articles early in camp where they said he was working on a slow curve. I guess that's uh, essentially turned into him creating these two pitches and the slider replaces the off-speed curveball. I, I don't know if that to be the case for sure, and he doesn't have a slow curve in it or a, an off-speed curve as well. But I, I agree with this because my thing was, and I was thinking about this, and I didn't know obviously who, what your three pitches were, but he has to develop something that's a little bit more off-speed. The biggest thing was that everybody knew that the hard slider and the fastball were coming within a mile and an hour or two of each other. If he could just get the hitter off balance and he could create something that really throws the hitter off with more of an, a, a legit off-speed pitch, he could probably become a better pitcher no matter how strong his arm is. So I'm with you. I mean, look, if these things work and he's effective with it and it gets more hitters off balance, then that's exactly what he and the team need. Uh, Brian, any pitches that stick out to you? That, that yeah, will, if going the, uh, you know, with the pitch off of this list that wasn't included, I would also throw in Justin Verlander's fastball, not because it's necessarily the pitch he has to have to be successful or the pitch we're most worried about, but when you have a guy who's 41 and that velo starts to drop a little bit, kind of like similar to the conversations we've had about Javier, obviously for different reasons, but that fastball velo, you know, as you age, coming off the shoulder, the uh, concerns that delayed the start of a season. If that fastball velo comes down, maybe he's not locating uh, quite the way we had hoped he would. Then I think the effectiveness of everything else in his repertoire would could possibly suffer. So uh, it's it's it'll be interesting to watch. We have, I don't think we've got had any radar readings obviously on Verlander so far because he's only been throwing bullpens and simulated games. We, don't, we haven't, haven't seen them in a spring training game. So I'd, I'd like to see the velo on uh, Verlander's fastball and make sure it's not dropped off too much from last year. Yeah, I, I don't – you know, guys that once they turn 40, they usually don't add to their fastball. Like, that's yeah, what I would right. be not, too optimistic about. I'm not asking about. for an ad. I'm just I'm – just, it's, it's got to stay consistent because we've seen his, his strikeout numbers drop three – or at least strikeout per nine – dropped three years in a row, and he's a, a smart enough pitcher, a veteran enough pitcher to be able to figure out ways to pitch around that, around maybe a decrease in his stuff. But if that fastball velo takes a big drop coming off the shoulder injury, then I think we might have a problem. Is it fair, guys, to throw in any kind of secondary pitch for Montero? Uh, Montero throws like four pitches. But I don't think he throws them well. I think he lives and dies a lot of times on his fastball. I think if he could just get a true, legit, like a strikeout type pitch, like a, a slight, maybe an off speed I mean, pitch. His slider's a swing and miss pitch. Mm, I don't, I, okay. I, I just, as an honorable mention, I would like him to either tune that thing up or find another pitch that could maybe create, again, something, something a little bit more off balance. I mean, it's a, it's a tale of two tells. Last year was horrendous, and 2022 was really good. Yep. So it's like, yeah, let's let's tap back into that 2022 slide piece. Uh, just pulling up that slide piece numbers, uh, last year his slider had a 500 WOBA, which is not good. Mm -hmm. um, and then the year before it was 188. So it's it, two years ago it was fantastic. Last year it was not good. So I guess you could go with that, like, a, like another pitch that will – you know, make or break a certain pitcher for the Astros. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Because yeah. two years ago was great. Last year was not. Needs to get back to it being good. Let's talk to Tad Ka Todd Callis, the TV voice of the Houston Astros on the shin. He's making the first of many appearances with the Killer Bees. Todd Callis, the voice of the Strohs, next on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5.
You found the killer bees. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Let's go straight out to the HRMP guest line, being joined by the TV voice of the Houston Astros, Todd Callis, making his first of what will be many weekly visits with us. Todd, thanks so much. Excited for the new season. How did you spend the off season? Get any rest and relaxation? Yeah, some R and R. We did uh, some travel before the new year. Not as much once 2024 hit, but uh, ready to go. It's exciting to to be here on the eve of opening day, and uh, I was just at a memorial. Park golf course today, and they're about to kick off their tournament, the Houston, uh, the Texas Children's Houston Open. So, yeah, a lot going on in the town this weekend. TK, I'm curious, right off the jump, we know that Verlander's going to miss some time. We obviously are watching the starting rotation uh, very, very closely. A, a guy like Blanco comes in. He has an unbelievable spring. They, they've already penciled him in as being in the rotation to start the season uh, is this the year? Is this the is this the guy? Can he can he completely find it all and put it together and be a guy like a JP France from a year ago? It, he looks the part, and his numbers were not you know just spring training numbers against B level players. He was pitching against some A lineups uh, when he went 15 plus without allowing a run. Finally gave up a run last night to the first batter he faced, Quincy Hamilton, in the uh, Sugar Land Astros game. But yeah. Um, he's 30 years old. He's not fully stretched out, so I'm not anticipating a guy that's going to eat up innings. He's not going to be, you know, in the 160 to 170 innings mark. But uh, he's a guy that if, if Dana Brown transitioned him from a reliever to a starter last year, if he can give you, you know, 130 to 150 solid innings, they'll take that. And his stuff has been playing. Uh, it, between him and J.P. France, one of those guys uh, may eventually lose their spot in the rotation just because, Verlander's coming back, or Petey's coming back, and then the second half, you're going to have McCullers and Luis Garcia as well. So it'll be interesting. The, the, the pitching rotation at the beginning of the year is thin. There's no way around that uh, with the injuries and with, um, you know, some guys that are still being stretched out. J.P. France hasn't been fully stretched out yet. So it's a little thin early, but if they can get survive this little gauntlet early of 20 games in 21 days, featuring a lot of good competition, they'll be really set up well for the rest of the year. The, the rotation, but the healthy guys and the injured guys would be a pretty good seven-game series. The, the four you have healthy with Fromber, Javier, France, and, uh, you know, Blanco, and then Hunter Brown, of course, and then the injured guys with Verlander, Keedy, Luis Garcia, Lance McCullers. You, you mentioned the, the stretch to start the year in the first three weeks where you're playing 20 games in 21 days. Uh, I saw some quotes from Espada, the most interesting manager in the world, where he, he said that it's probably unlikely they go to a six-man rotation without Justin Verlander. So this little stretch is just hang on for dear life, try to patch these innings together however you can, waiting for that help to finally get there? Yeah, I'd say that's probably a good assessment of things. Uh, I know for sure Joe said to the media yesterday that they're going to go through the first home stand without a six-man rotation. He didn't commit to what's going to happen beyond that. So – Seven games, you're going to see Fromber Valdez go on four days rest. You're going to see Christian Javier go on four days rest. And after the off day going into the Texas-Kansas City road trip, uh, we'll see how they play it. At that point, they may elect to stay with a five-man. They may elect to go with a six-man. Uh, doesn't sound like they're going to have Justin Verlander go with a full, you know, four- or five-start rehab assignment like as if he was going through spring training. So they may have Verlander come back even if he's only stretched out to 50 or 60 pitches. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how it works. But you're right. Um, early on, they're going to go with a five-man, but I don't think that's going to last forever. I think you'll eventually see six guys in their rotation when J.B. comes back. DK, you look at what everybody's pointing at now, which is just the middle of that, that bullpen, because we know that the, the, the 7, 8, and 9 is, is all wrapped up. Uh, how important is Montero finding somewhat, even if it's a happy medium between – uh, two years ago and then the second half of last season because of him being that one veteran guy that you know they can count on if you need a guy earlier than the seventh inning? Yeah, he's critical. Uh, huge. Uh, you're right. I mean, you feel good about 7, 8, 9, even though Abreu you didn't have his best spring. You're, he's a guy that just dominated the league last year. You really don't have too many concerns with him. You'd like to see him have a couple of back-to-back -back good outings, but it's, you know we're ready to go now, so hopefully he's ready when the when the bell rings. Presley and Hayter, as good an 8-9 combination as you're going to find in the game, 
And then you've got Montero. And, yes, last year was a struggle. And this year was up and down in spring training. Somewhere in there was a guy that pitched in 2022 and got that three-year deal because of how well he pitched two years ago. Uh, he needs to be, if not as good as that year, like you said, somewhere in between. Because, frankly, the other four guys other than those four, Montero and the back three, are really guys that in the past might not have made the roster on opening day, and they're all on this year's opening day roster. So um, they haven't named who that roster is. We have a pretty good idea of Belak's going to be out on that roster. We think Seth Martinez will probably be on that roster. We'll see what happens with the other two spots. But, um, you know, those are – Belak and Martinez are guys that were fighting for spots in, in the on the pitching staff in the past, and now uh, they're definitely in, and there's two more spots behind them. So, yes, so a long-winded answer to your question, Montero is going to be critical – because of the unproven nature of some of the other guys that are making the team. Todd Callis, voice of the Houston Astros, joining us on the HRP guest line. Uh, Todd, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the offseason, if you will allow me, when the Astros hired Joe Espada. And universally, it was a move that was given a lot of credit. The, the Strohs getting you know, Espada, giving him the promotion, have been the right-hand man for Dusty Baker for so long. What makes Espada the right man for this job? He's been in the trenches, and he knows the guys really well. And he's been here through two different managers, A.J. Hinch and Dusty Baker, two different styles. Um, the guys trust him. They know him. They communicate well with him. Um, but they know no matter what happens, he's going to shoot it straight for them. And uh, that goes a long way. I mean, last night and today, I'm sure there were some difficult conversations with Joe. Uh, having to call guys in and say, hey, you didn't make it. We appreciate how hard you worked. We'll see you at some point during the regular season. But the guys, it's, it's basically been the whole time A.J. was here and Dusty Baker was here and Joe was the bench coach, uh, he has been that guy that has, was the conduit. So he was talking to the players. He was, you know, the manager delegates a lot at, at the top, and Joe was always that guy who was involved with the players and been in the trenches with them. So it was a seamless transition, about as seamless a transition as you could have just based on Joe knowing these guys as a veteran group that has been around Joe for half a dozen years. TK, I want to look at center field a little bit too because you've uh, had the eye test up close and personal. You've seen this spring's version of Jake Myers, which seems more like the Jake Myers when he came up, when he showed he had some pop, when he showed that he could be the center fielder of the future, and now they're relying on him to do just that. Uh, your feelings on what you've saw, what you've seen so far uh, of Jake, and the fact that it, your confidence level on him being the everyday center fielder going into the season? Yeah, more confident now than I was not seeing him before spring training because he did come in with a different attitude. He was hit the ball on the screws for the first two or three weeks. You know, everybody, it's hard to maintain that for four or five weeks of spring training games, but uh, he was really good for the first two or three weeks. Hit a, a little bit of bad luck in the second half of spring training. Uh, didn't hit the ball quite as hard overall, but uh, he looked ready to go. And, uh, you know, we all know Jake can go get the ball, but his bat looked really good. If he's your number nine hitter in your lineup, uh, you're in a pretty good spot. And whoever that is, whether it's Pena eight, Myers nine, or vice versa, or, um, you're going to be in a pretty good spot leading into the Altuve, Alvarez, Tucker, Bregman, Quartet. Uh, I really, really like this lineup this year. Uh, I think this is going to be a team, even though last year they were third in the American League of run scored, I think this is a team that's going to be much better offensively than they were last year. And, I, you know, I think you, part of that is Bregman. He'll probably be better than he was last year. Abreu coming off last year will probably be better. Pena will probably have room to grow this year. And then you add Yon or Diaz to your lineup. So, yeah, I, I, I'm excited about the lineup. And I think Jake Myers being a part of that in the number nine spot could bode well. And he, he He's got pressure, too. I mean, even though they've handed him the starting job in center field, let's not be fooled that if Jake doesn't get out of the gates in April and May and perform well, it's not like they're going to sit there and say, this is your job up until the all-star break. There's a lot of good candidates sitting there behind Jake, and um, if one of them is hot at AAA and Jake's struggling at the big league level, you, you could see Jake lose from playing time. But for now, I'm glad he's the everyday center fielder. I think he's ready to run with it. And I, I haven't seen any better version of Jake Myers than I did in 24 spring training. Todd, we always appreciate the time. Uh, best of luck with the uh, call tomorrow, opening day. I know you're excited for the year, and uh, you're going to have a little bit more homework because Brian McTaggart uh, just uh, reported the Astros claim Penn Murphy off of waivers. So maybe he's one of those two unknown names that maybe you already knew uh, in the rotate in the uh, in the bullpen for the Strohs. Todd, uh, appreciate the time. We'll chat again next week. 
All right, guys. Always good talking to you. Talk to you next week. Todd Callis joining us on the HRMP guest line. Yeah, Brian McTaggart just claimed that the Strohs, or just tweeted that the Strohs claim Penn Murphy off of waivers from the Braves. Uh, has never pitched with the Braves other than spring training. He, his his numbers are pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's only pitched in the last two years, uh, 2022, 2023. He made 80 appearances with Seattle, and in those 80 appearances, he had a 270 ERA. It's weird that this guy is on waivers. Uh, he was he was with the Braves, didn't make their club, and they're really good. Maybe that's why. But uh, surprised that an arm this caliber was on waivers, and he lasted till the to the Astros. This is a, at least on paper, without knowing too much about you know post two thousand twenty three. Seems like a pretty good move for the Astros. I love it looking at the numbers, and then Greg Rajon throws out that his claim to fame was he gave up the 18th inning home run in Game Three of the 2022 ALDS in Seattle to Pena. So he's uh, he's uh, he's been an Astro winner from yeah. uh, way back then. He's been helping should, out the should Astros. Should be a fan favorite from the jump. Yeah. So he the Braves claimed Murphy off waivers from the Mets on November 14th. So this guy's been around. His numbers are far better than the respect he's been given by Major League Baseball. He was on waivers claimed by the Braves on waivers claimed by the Astros. Uh, Interesting to say the least, but Penn Murphy has been claimed by the Houston Astros. All right, 713-780-3776. It's time for three more fights in the Killer B Fight Club bracket. Who won yesterday? What are the fights today? And we'll make arguments for everybody. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, we know that, hey, we're a day away from opening day. We're a day away from more NCAA basketball. We've got NBA basketball on the docket just about every single night. And then on the weekends, we've got golf. UFC and so much more. There's only one place that I always encourage you to go to if you're going to put some action down on any of these games. It's mybookie.ag. Mybookie.ag is a one-stop shop for all your sports betting and your casino needs, complete with a real-life Vegas experience right from the comfort of your own home and your own phone. Simply put, live dealers standing by if you want to get into casino games. But now you can take your viewing experience to the next level with real-time live betting that lets you stream and bet the games right from the mybookie.ag website. Sign up now. Take advantage of a generous welcome bonus on your first deposit all the way up to $1,000. If you put $200 in, get $300 ready to play instantly using our promo code BET975. If you listen to us and bet with them, it pays off when you use the code Bet 975. And the fun doesn't stop there. You'll get up to the minute odds, props, and this week's expert predictions that all can help you decide who to put your money on. And of course, those dealers are standing by if you want to play casino games in between games or at off times when there aren't any games to be played. Best part about my bookie, you can bet on anything, anytime, from anywhere. Just use our promo code BET975 and secure your welcome bonus today only with my bookie.
better chin than uh, than Vince Young. I think that's pretty apparent. Ooh, boy, for... sucker punch though. Two days in a row, you going with that joke? You uh, going to come up with some new material? Yeah, that's the that's the line that I always say. So I could say the same thing. <laughs> um, it, it, I mean, did it, you think VY saw it coming? I man, it, it was it looked like a sucker punch to me. Like it, he was definitely on the side of him. And he kind of like looked like he kind of looked to his left, and it, maybe he caught it at the very—I mean, literally he yeah. caught it. But maybe he caught it at the very end when it was too late. But yeah. I will say this: I don't disagree with you that it seemed like for that one punch to do what it did to him, his chin ain't—I'm ex- not saying it's glass, but I don't think it's very sturdy. Uh, he's got a glass jaw. He yeah, went, I mean, well, definitely, definitely a sucker punch. There's, there's no doubt, no doubt. that it's a he sucker punch. Down. I just wonder if he saw it coming. I mean, he, he didn't just... have to take a whole lot of hits at Texas. He—he uh, he was, he was standing up going into the end zone most games, so. <laughs> maybe maybe hasn't had a lot of uh, uh, hits right to the chin there. He All right, went yesterday down fast. He went down quick. He went down fast. Uh, three fights yesterday in the Killer B Fight Club bracket. Sean Salisbury beat up poor Tyler Milner. And Milner never stood a chance. Poor I disagree Salisbury with bullied their voters him. again. I, th- I think they got some of these wrong. Sa- Salisbury beat Milner seventy four to twenty six. Yeah, that's wrong. That's, that's big. Down. Blowout city. That's yeah, just, I've seen our voters. That's just our voters, recognition. They our voters do vote for name value, and it seems like they vote for age over youth. <laughs> I have noticed that. Uh, the second fight yesterday, here's another example of that. Lance Zerline blew out Ross Villarreal. Bigger yeah, name. Another bad pick. Older. Yeah. He beat him 66% to 34%. Just ran away with the vote in wow. that. Wow. And then in the final game, another example of what we're talking about. Glenn Davis upsetting Brian Love Muscle. Uh, he beat him 51%, 49%. Glenn you, Davis over Brian La With one Lee leg. Muscle. You called yeah, it. You leg. guys called it. Jeremy, you said his followers were going to get behind I, I him. I thought so. Yeah. I thought so. So, Glenn Davis advancing on to the Killer Bee Fight Club bracket. Uh, three matchups today, the first of which you can vote now at Jeremy Branham. It is the first fight in the Kenny Hand region. Features Landry Locker from the Highway to Hell and Stan F- Norfleet from cardiac arrest i've never met stan me either uh, i know what's that i haven't met either guy i've met I've, i know landry um who's arguing for Hugh here well Brian? i was about to ask you if either of you guys knew stan so you could give a, a passionate argument i'll for give that a side. go because i'd like to go against the guy that he's fighting <laughs> oh, oh well that's fair and I, w- I i would lean to that side because jeremy at least knows landry so jeremy uh you'll argue for landry locker and uh joel will argue for stan Okay, Stan's bet. a guy that's coming from the trenches. Stan's from, from he's coming from a place where he wants to just get in and get grimy, and he wants to kind of do what he's supposed to do. He's a guy that looks across uh, the the to the other corner and realizes there's a guy that's soft as the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man that's going to block a, another guy if he gets into a conversation and we're both in sports radio. I think that's the kind of guy that goes down with a glass chin and a half. He's quick to throw one out. He's not quick to take one, and that's why I think Stan is the man. He's going to come in with a plan. He's going to beat the crap out of it's got very the locker. Personal, very quick. Blaker's got bars with Stan. <laughs> There you go. You went more anti my guy than pro your guy, but that's it doesn't fine. matter. Whatever gets it, it done. Like, it, feels, I, it feels like that was just uh, air, airing laundry more than giving a take for Stan. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I enjoyed it. I don't I'm care not, what I'm it feels like. It. I think it felt great for <laughs> no, me. I'm not good. bad at it. For me it personally, it felt great. I just know. I don't know if it made Stan. I enjoyed it, but I don't know if it made Stan's case. Go ahead, Jeremy. He's a foot Landry's, locker. And he's going to get stepped on. There you go. All right. But Landry's uh, taller, so he's got a reach advantage here. He's younger. So he's got a youth advantage here, which hasn't been necessarily a positive for our voters. He, he's now also a uh, father, so he's got dad strength now, Ooh. an early dad strength, which is the best because you still it's a, it's a combination of dad strength, but it's also a combination of your youth. And those early fathers are the ones that you really have to watch out for. So Landry Locker is going to defeat Stan Norfleet in the first matchup in the Kenny Han region. Yeah, Brian? so Landry Locker is 6'8". He's going to have the reach on he's everyone. He's 6'8"? Yeah, he's 6'8". He's, uh, he's, I didn't know he was that tall. You, I mean, you stood next to him. That guy is a huge, no, tall guy. Tall. So very tall. He, he's going to have the reach in every matchup, like you said. He's also got the youth, and I'm not going to pick against a Longhorn, so Landry Locker, 10'9". Okay. I thought, he, I thought he was a Red Raider. Well, there's there's a little bit of a story <laughs> there. Yeah, he actually he did go to Texas Tech, but he doesn't claim them as his fandom. It's it, he's a Longhorn fan. Yeah, right. Another a, bandwagon, huh? He's a he's a he's a Tech grad, but he's a Longhorn T-shirt fan. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The second matchup. <laughs> 
Uh, Brian got handed a 16 seed. That's how he advanced. <laughs> oh, see, still sour grapes. Look, as the only member of this show who is one of fight, I think I could speak on these these matchups with more authority. But go ahead. Well, this was, I was Talk. I was segueing. I was oh, it was a segue. You were segueing. Really you were segueing by throwing <laughs> shade though. You speak no, on listen, the matchups with more authority segue. than the guy that made the damn bracket. Yes, because well, I random. actually won a fight. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, I've been in the arena. Fight. You guys are getting run out okay. of here. Are you, are you ready for the segue now? I guess. The, the Brian good got fed. Brian got fed a 16 seed, and John Granado has been fed a 16 seed because the second fight in today's Killer Bees Fight Club tournament features the godfather of Houston Sports Radio, John Granado, and he pulled a little strings because he's taking on Ben Gary, the producer of PP on the highway to hell. Who? <laughs> I have no idea who it, that it's, is. That's that's a that's a positive. If you don't know who Ben Gary is, there's a better chance that he has of winning the fight if you than if you know who Ben Gary is. Oh really? Is. Brian's probably the closest. I like Ben. Love Ben. I've ben, worked with Ben's, ben. A, Ben's a very nice guy, but uh, yeah. What are, I, what are what are Ben's measurements here, Brian? Uh, none of them that would make for a good fighter. He's uh, I mean he's probably what six one ish. No, no, I would say five eleven. Five eleven ish, a buck twenty. Ish. Uh, Who wins a fight between 40. him and Ben DeBose? Oh, I would take I almost anybody go. in the city over Ben DeBose. <laughs> that whiny Sheesh. little bee. I love that, Brian. Ben Gary, Ben DeBose might be, it might be a slobber knocker. Okay. <laughs> ben Gary would wipe <laughs> the floor with Ben DeBose. Ben, uh, I wish we had a picture of Ben Gary. Love Ben Gary. Love Ben Gary. You can ben find Gary's, it. Just search his name. His, his his LinkedIn photo will pop up. His LinkedIn picture. He actually looks a little beefier than he is now. That's though. true. That's true. He looks he's slender, much skinnier. He's, than he's, he's more slender now than in that picture. How much would you say he weighs? Because he's five eleven. I would 11. say one forty, one fifty. Yeah, he's very, very skinny. Very, very. Why am I thinking skinny. that guy from Road Trip? Uh, that's not a bad call. Okay. <laughs> it's not a, Tom, wait, it's not a bad Green? call. No, no the, on the road trip, one. the real skinny guy that, that goes and does oh, the dances does on, the stage. Dance on stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, not a that's bad kind call. of Ben Gary, but he's uh, that guy's taller than Ben Gary. Okay. Okay, who's arguing who here? Uh, Joel, or, well, I mean, Jeremy, you know, you, you've actually met Ben Gary, so you're going to have to okay. argue the side of Ben Gary, and that means Joel will be arguing for the Godfather, John Granato. Blankers, go first on this one. Okay. Uh, this is easy. Uh, Granado's bringing, calling out all the stops. He's bringing in all the peeps. He's bringing in all of his Italian friends. The fact is, is this thing's going to be loaded. There's going to be threats made if anybody even attempts to to, to take down the the Godfather. There's going to be uh, violin cases. There's going to be all kinds of ammunition. And there's going to be no way this man can lose because he is who he is for a reason, and he carries the clout and the pinky ring to prove it. There's no way that anybody takes down the Godfather. I, I, I think I could sum, uh, summarize Joel's uh, take there as Italian stereotypes. Maybe. All right. <laughs> Whatever someone, works. Whatever someone, works. See Jake Asman. Don't mess with the Godfather. I wouldn't mess with the Godfather. Go ahead, Jeremy. As someone who respects the sweet science and has the best interest of my client in mind, I'm throwing in the towel. No mas, <laughs> no mas there before you go. round one even begins. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, that's smart. This, this, is a, this, is a, this is a referee stoppage for John Granato. John Granato from the main streets of Chicago. All the Italian stereotypes, as Joel pointed out. John Granato takes this one over Ben Gary. Easy. We're making, uh, we're making Granato look strong. He's not afraid <laughs> to call on those stereotypes either, by the way. <laughs> No, Final matchup of the day. It, I think this one's going to be another uh, blowout. Do we do even really need to debate it? Seth Payne versus Adam Wexler. No, maybe we save oh, the Seth no. Payne votes for uh, the, the oh. defense for a better fight down the road. Yeah, this this is a squash match here. Yeah, it's an it's a hundred percent love may be, Wex, is this but he's the, not beating up Seth Payne. Is this the most lopsided round one fight? The only way that Wexter can win this is if he goes like Bobby the Brain Heaton and then like hides under the rope and well, wins in like a sneak roll up. I was gonna say Wex is gonna put his track shoes on, but then you can't run and you can't hide. So I, I think that this is. I don't is know if a, he can outrun Seth Payne. That's, that's kind of where I was going with that. Yeah. I don't think he can run or hide. He's in trouble. This one's a bit lopsided. Yeah, there's this one. This one doesn't need an argument, right? Let's just go straight to the yep. judges. Agreed. Yeah, it's Seth Payne by a knockout. I, I, there's no reason to belabor the point. There you go. All right, that does it for the uh, Killer Bee Fight Club brackets today. You can vote on them right now at Jeremy Branham. First one's up. 
Uh, second one will be up shortly, and the third one will be up uh, probably around 5 o'clock. All right, 713-780-ESPN. What is the state of the defensive line for the Texans? And did D'Amico give a clue in regards to the offensive line? It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, a minute for my friend Doc Linville. Doc Linville, best in the business at the Neograph procedure. He's a guy that has a plan that can make you get you feel great about your hair again. He's absolutely fantastic. It's not the sprays and the creams and the foams that I always tell you only mask the problem. This is an actual solution to hair loss. It's phenomenal. Uh, Doc asked to talk to me one day and said, I just want to kind of explain some things to you, see if the neograph might make sense. I said, all right, what do you got? He said, bottom line is you're never going to lose the hair on the sides and the back of your head no matter how bald you go other places, and that's genetic fact. I did not know that. So now I'm immediately dialed in. I'm intrigued. I'm interested. I'm listening. The more he went on to tell me, he said, look, I'm going to take some of those follicles, every third or fourth follicle. I'm going to put them where you need them most, in your case, in your hairline in front. And you're they're going to grow immediately. They're going to stay because he said 95 to 99% of those follicles are not going anywhere. And because they're coming from a place where they never go away, you're going to have hair where you need it. But then in six to nine months, when the hair has a chance to kind of settle in and, and really lay down the roots and get stronger and longer, you're going to find the uh, the absolute best results, and you are going to be ecstatic. I'm like, you know what, Doc? Sign me up. Let's do this. I did the procedure. It literally was painless for me, and I came out with a different attitude because my hairline was back. It was phenomenal. It's still there today, and I can't say enough good things about Doc Linville and his staff. He wants to work with our listeners, so therefore, if you go right now to 975hair.com and make an appointment to have a consultation with Doc and his staff, it's absolutely free. It's 150 bucks for people off the street. You get it for free. You go in, ask questions, get answers, get everything explained to you, see if you might be the next in line to get this great procedure. Check them out today. Tell them I sent you by. Go to 975hair.com. Live in the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Killer Bees. Now back to Joel and Jeremy. Join uh, Gallant and George, the Killer G's, and then the Killer Bees live at the decoy on Thursday as the Astro season begins. While the Astro season gets underway, you can get $10 Shinerbach, 100 ounce towers, and $2 Mexican candy shots. Uh, go watch the Strohs and hang out with the Killer G's, Gallant and George, and then the Killer Bees uh, this Thursday at the decoy. Blank and, uh, and Brian will be out there. Uh, game tomorrow beginning at 3.05, I mean 6.05, 6.05 is when the Astros play tomorrow. Um, yeah, so that will be tomorrow. 
D'Amico Ryans was talking at the owner's meeting. Uh, this happened over the last couple of days, which this is where the picture of his big muscles came out. Is it uh, legit? Which, Have we decided yeah, on it's, that? It's, I think it is legit. I was I was critical of it. I was like, this is this looks shopped. And then I went and I watched the video of it, and yeah, he's got massive. Mm. I didn't realize his arms were that big. Yeah, I think like off season, pythons. plenty of plenty of time to spend some extra moments in the weight room. Yeah, he was trying to like he was also like I posted a little video of him. he was like trying to cut it, like cover them up. So I think he's even a little bashful. Like he thinks they're too big. I think. Hmm. Yeah, he's Crazy. a workhorse. Um, Pin Murphy, I-, I mentioned that the Astros claimed him off waivers. He's been on waivers three times since like since the end of last season. He is coming off a of Tommy John surgery, and he won't be available in the first half of the year. So just want to clarify that oh. he won't be up with the Astros they'll, they'll have to place him on the injured list but they'll have to carry him on the roster because they claimed him so uh, there is that just wanted to update that so D'Amico Ryans was talking about you know the new additions some of uh, what he expects going into the draft and camp and things like that it's always interesting to listen to D'Amico to try to find hints with what he's going to say because he's, he's given some stuff away like he yeah we're going to draft a young quarterback but is basically what he said before they drafted CJ Stroud didn't say who but he alluded to having a young quarterback what was the most recent one this offseason it was boosting up the defensive, the defensive line. line yep yeah, it was boosting up the defensive line and they've signed like seven defensive ends alone uh but they traded away a one tech and they don't have a real one tech on this team a couple of journeyman guys but here was uh D'Amico and I'm, I'm wondering if this is a clue about how they're going to handle the offensive line here was D'Amico talking about uh, the state of the OL uh, we, we struggle with injuries all across the offensive line and I was just looking for some consistency there with guys being able to stay healthy and everybody being in their spot. I think Titus is one guy. I just showed just unselfishly moving over to left guard when he had to play guard. We had you know, camp playing tackle. We had a lot of guys moving all across the board. So, you know, we're excited to see if Kenyon can come back and what he can do for us, how he can compete to show that he belongs in there. Getting Titus back healthy will, will help us. Laramie is another one who, another guy who pushed through injuries and battle injuries all throughout the entire year. Uh, really uh, proud of him for pushing through what he pushed through to go out there and play on Sundays. But uh, hopefully our guys can be more healthy and we can have a, a dominant offensive line. All right, here's what I hear there. I think it is a D'Amico clue, and you tell me if I've lost my mind, and that happens a lot. 713-780-3776. To me, that is a clue, and that's D'Amico saying we like what we have in-house and we will not be adding anything significant to this offensive line. No, I heard the same thing, and I heard it kind of take it to the level that I was at with, these last, with the last couple of seasons before we even got into this season, which is he's done playing musical chairs. He'd like to just see Titus Howard at right tackle. He'd like to see Laramie stay at left tackle. He likes the guys that he has, uh, and he wants them to stay playing their natural positions. Juice is going to be interesting, but – um, I would think Juice is going to be your center. Um, but you look at that, and I hear the same thing you hear. I hear a guy that's going to stand pat and make sure and hope that because of health and other reasons, you're going to be able to have these guys play the natural positions they're supposed to play, and that in itself should make the line better. Yeah. Um, I like. I don't think that he ever wanted to play Titus Howard at left guard. I think he was just forced into it. Like, mm-hmm. this is our hand. What gives us the best chance? Because, I mean, they either had to play Michael Dieter or Fant. And it's like, do we want feet, do we want Dieter at left guard and Titus at right tackle, or do we want Titus at left guard and Fan at right tackle? Like they were screwed. It was it was damned if you do, damned if you don't. Like pick your poison between those two. So I don't think they ever really wanted Titus to play left guard, but they felt like their hand got forced to having to play uh, Titus at left guard because it gave you your best five. Now you could argue that it didn't give you your best offensive line uh, because I do believe that you know five fingers make one fist type of deal. Uh, but he was trying to get his best five guys out sure. there. I, I don't think he's going to add – I don't think they're going to add a significant piece, which I don't really love because if you're going into this season as a team that, that you can knock off the Chiefs, you, you feel that way. And, you know, they're not thinking that way. They're just trying to build the, the best team they can and develop and get better each and every day, blah, 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 coach speak. But if you're going into the season with Kenyon Guard, uh, Kenyon Green, or Jared Patterson as, like, your contenders at left guard, maybe you throw in Kendrick Green – I think that's a problem. I think it's an issue. Now, can I ask you, the thing that I'm hearing, too, is that, because I agree, I don't think they're going to spend any money and go out and find some kind of a, a bigger name or or better positional player at, at left guard, but I don't think that precludes them from, from going out and getting one in the draft. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be in the first round, 
but maybe they get, uh, you know, we know linemen a lot of times, you know, fall through the cracks where a lot of uh, GMs think you can get them in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. But can you get a guy that's not necessarily a first or second round pick that could still be in the mix at left guard? Uh, I mean, Jared Patterson started games at center out of necessity. Six, he was yeah. a sixth rounder. Uh, Juice Scruggs, you traded up into the second, and he started a bunch of games for you. Patterson was like, he held his own, but he was below average. And then Juice held his own, but was below average at left guard. Mm-hmm. I, I, to me, he's a natural center. Um, I, but I hear that, like, I hear from, from that soundbite from D'Amico, like, yeah, we're probably not even going to draft one. Like, this is this is what we have. And if you're going to go to war with what you have, then you better hope that Kenyon Green's good at football because we saw Kendrick yep. Green. He was super average. Some people like the idea of Jared Patterson at left guard and Juice Scruggs as your center. Okay, like that's putting a lot on a couple of second-year players. And Jared Patterson hasn't played a whole lot of left guard and has never played left guard in the NFL and was a six-round pick, so he's kind of limited in talent. Uh, I don't love that. I, I think it's ignoring a potential spot where you could be weak on the offense. And they really haven't, other than Joe Mixon, well, done a whole lot in free agency. I guess you brought back Dalton Schultz. You can throw him in the mix there, too. But I, I look at this, too, and I think to the point that you just made, the name you brought up, look, I think you upgraded at running back, and you're expecting to do a lot of running between the tackles. That means that you're going to have to get the most out of green, and if you don't, then you're going to have to see what's out there, even if it's on a bargain deal where there's got some veterans that, like they found in the past, that can kind of fill some time and do what they need to do possibly at guard because I don't think they have enough. And I don't think you want another Kenyon Green situation from what we dealt with last year when they didn't have an immediate backup plan knowing, as Nick Casario put it, that it wasn't if, it was when Green was going to go down. You don't know what you're going to get out of Kenyon Green, so you best find some kind of insurance policy in case he ain't the guy. The other thing, too, is like you've talked about improving the run game, not you, but the Texans. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you got a running back that can do that, but you didn't really help out at an offensive line spot that you could upgrade there. And then also you're trying to protect your franchise. You're trying to protect uh, C.J. Stroud. You have a, it's, the left guard to me is a big question mark mm-hmm. right now. And it didn't sound like – and maybe they fool us and maybe they draft, you know uh, – Cooper BB in the second round. And it's like, okay, cool. He's your starting left guard. Uh, but to me, I just didn't get that read. Here was uh, D'Amico and Danico Autry because we, we've spent a lot of time, like the signing, $10 million a year, gives you versatility. We, we've wondered where he's going to fit in, where he's going to play. And D'Amico addressed that at the owners' meetings. For D'Amico, I think he does a, a really great job of rushing on the interior. I think so in passing situations, we'll try to move him around to where we feel like he'll be most effective, whether it's on the interior, but also he does a great job as an edge rusher, uh, setting the edge in the run game, but also getting out the quarterback. So I think when you have a guy like Danico who can do multiple things, I think that'll vary from week to week of what we're doing schematically with him to try to put as much pressure on the opposing team as possible. It kind of sounded like a third defensive end to me. Did it really? Yeah. I think he's going to rotate him around. Uh, I I mean, he said that we're going to try to move him inside in pass rushing situations. Yeah, I, for some reason, I just have this the feeling. I just have no, you this... didn't set the edge from a three-tech, you know? No, but I also still think that, you know, as much as he wants to be, you know, week-to-week week schematically creative and move guys around, I just feel like he's going to spend, a, I won't say a lot of time, but I think he's going to spend time in t- on the inside, and I think that, I don't know, maybe, I, I, I'm not trying to put a percentage on it, but I think that he's looking at, uh, he'll be in the rotation for both. He's probably the third yeah. pass rusher on the outside, but I think he might play a more significant role inside. I mean, it's definitely going to be matchup dependent, so I hear what you're saying. It's going to change weekly based on matchup and then, like, game script. If you're up by 14 points and the other team's going to be throwing the ball more, okay, now you can play him with the three-tech quite a bit. Uh, It sounds to me like D'Amico does like the options. And to your point, he did say he was a really good rusher from the inside before he said anything about the outside. Mm -hmm. So he led with inside versus outside. So I think that speaks to your point a little bit. Um I like the signing. I think he's a really good football player. I think that D'Amico likes to rotate a bunch of guys. I think he wants eight defensive linemen that he's rotating in and out. I think that they're kind of going to do a one tech by committee with, like, the settle guy, the Foley guy. Uh, there's another one that's escaping me that they kind of signed as well. They brought back the Davis. Big F? They have Heinish. No, if that's Foley. Oh. Uh, there was another one that they signed around the time that they signed Settle. I can't I can't remember the name, though. But I, I think that they're just going to do that. I honestly think oh, that the they're guy going from Seattle. to. Yeah, yeah. I think they're going to do that by committee. I think they're going to rotate like three different dudes there and just play the fresh hand, rotate them in and out. If somebody's playing well, ride the hot hand. I really don't think – I really don't think they're going to address defensive tackle. 
Not even in the draft? No, I really don't. Like, not not a guy who can be someone – it's just the feel I get. Like, the feel I get is that they've really spent most of their resources in free agency on defense, which is something I wanted them to do. Like, mm-hmm. if you go back pre-shows, uh, pre-free agency shows, I'm like, spend the money on defense and draft offense. Like, they've spent most of their money on the defensive side of the ball. So, the feel that I get is that they're going to draft skill guys. Uh, I think that they're going to draft receiver. I think they're going to add another running back. Because right now they have Mixon and, and Damian Pierce. Right. Like, yeah, I think they're going to draft a running back. Um Maybe even a tight end. Like, you, you know, you have Schultz, you have Brevin, you have Quentin Tarantino under contract. So, yeah, but, I mean, best available, stuff like that, too. But I think they're actually pretty content with their defensive line. Uh, obviously, you love the DNs. Autry's going to be in the rotation at the three-tech, especially in pass-rushing situations. D'Amico said that he wants to play six, seven, eight guys. They brought back Davis. They have Heinish. They signed three other one-techs that are in the mix there. I kind of get the sense that their defensive lines, for the most part, done. Maybe they draft one of the middle rounds that can kind of, you know, compete, but not someone that you're counting on starting day one. Yeah, I, I think that if a guy falls into their lap, it, it might be hard to pass on. But I, I think that the the there are some significant. I won't say there's one significant area or two that I think they'll be looking at. Uh, I think you're right. They'll still look at a wide receiver, but I think corner and safety are where they're going to yeah. look at uh, primarily right now because I think they brought journeymen in to, to replace. Uh, a Stevie Nelson type right now. And and whether they were drafted highly or not doesn't matter if you just have played. Who you are is how you've played. And, and, and how Akuda's played so, so far to this point ha- has told me that he's not Stevie Nelson yet. So uh, I think that they'll look at those two positions, sure. But if a sweat falls or there's a there's a guy that kind of falls into their lap, per se, I, I still, if I'm them, I still look at an interior defensive lineman. I'm not even sure they want sweat, though. Like... God, we've heard a lot of though. If he's the right, one guy, but that we've also just... heard Lance say that he's not a one tech, and they need a one tech. Yeah. So if he's not a one tech, they're just not going to draft a guy that doesn't fit. Yeah, that's true. I, I so just... like we love the idea of it because he was in Texas and he's got intangibles. I think he's. I think he went to. Did he go to Huntsville? I want to say he might have went to Huntsville. Um, so like, there's a lot of things that like, you love about the player, but if it just does not fit into your defense, like you're probably going to cross them off your board entirely. Yeah, that's that. That's interesting to me. I, I just if you get a guy that's three sixty five that can absolutely just bull rush guys on the offensive line, uh, and you you know D'Amico wants to be scheming things from a week to week basis. There's a guy that's a weapon that I think you could use, but uh, maybe then they just focus yeah. more I solely would l- on. Love to know how they view him. I would love to know how they view him pre draft, and we, we're not going to know the answer to that because they're not going to give away any intel. Mm-hmm. But I would love to be a fly on the wall to see their draft board to see if they think that that Schwett could be a one tech in this defense. Because a lot of people say no. Some people say, well, you, we think it can happen. He's such a good athlete, such a good player that he he's going to make it happen. I I am fascinated what they think of him. Yeah, uh, Mario Edwards was the guy from Seattle that they added to the the. Edge, he was a, he's rushing. a D end. I think there was another. I think there was a third defensive tackle, but I just can't remember. I could be wrong too. I'm yeah, I'm looking at the roster. And they resigned they resigned Barnett too. Barnett, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But those guys aren't defensive tackles. No, no. The the, the tackles that they list are McTelvin, A. A. G. M. Khalil Davis, uh, Fadakasi, Heinish, Tim Settle. That's it. Maybe I'm just maybe I invented that that other defensive tackle because Settle you know Settle was the guy that was the one that they signed right after they traded Collins. Jake Hansen. It's like and everybody's making the joke. Oh, they settled. No, Hansen's a linebacker. Oh no, yeah, but I'm just saying. I'm just thinking maybe guys were mis mislabeled on here. Marcus Haynes from the Broncos. It looks like. I've never heard of Marcus Haynes. Yeah. Uh, seven one three seven eight zero ESPN HRP listener line seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Brian makes faces on Wednesday. Why is Brian making faces today? It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5.
He's uh, blank. I'm uh, Branham. We are the bees on ESPN 97.5, ESPN 92.5. Brian makes faces on Wednesday. Before we get into Brian's faces on this Wednesday, um, someone texted, did you say the Astros game's at 6.05 tomorrow? I did say that. It was a bit last year when the Astros played during our show. We would have them start five minutes after our show ended. How do we want to handle that this year? Kind of like the uh, the way it gets on the way uh, it creates a ton of excitement and uh, overreaction from our from our listeners. Sometimes so you just want to keep doing it. I think we keep doing it. I mean, we we're going to be fair. We're going to still kind of wink, wink it, and let people know okay. like easy before you like totally one hundred percent buy in. But yeah, we should keep right. doing it. Well, I'm cool. I'm it's cool trolling. Bit. Yeah, I have no problem trolling. All right, Brian, why are you making faces today? All right, so starting off with the story uh, about Lyft drivers. Uh, Jeremy, I know you're obviously on the road quite a bit. Are you someone who has used Lyft on occasion? Yeah, certainly. Uh, Lyft, I try to use Lyft more than I use Uber, actually. Okay. Because Lyft gives me 5% cash back with the credit card that I use. Okay, okay, certainly a good reason to use Lyft. Well, hopefully you use Lyft uh, different than a Florida man that goes goes by the name uh, Jeremiah Charles. Because he carjacked a Lyft driver in Miami last month and then drove off in her Toyota Corolla. He uh, started punching her from the back seat until she got out. Thankfully, thankfully, she is okay. The story gets better. Don't worry. She's not She's not in a ditch somewhere. So she's okay. So, again, his name, full name, is Jeremiah Verdon Charles. How do we know his name? Any guesses? His lift profile. Yeah. Yeah. He. Uh, so that's exactly right. He ordered the lift under his own name. Oh my and then god! Is he from? Where is he from? Florida. Florida, of course. Oh, of course, he is. he's from yes, Florida. He is. Yeah. So he stole the car after booking a ride through the Lyft app, and just after, and the driver or uh, the cops got the information from the driver, and that's how they tracked him down. Uh, they arrested him at his home and found the car parked a block away. Uh, the dummy denied everything and claimed he hadn't even taken a lift that day. But again, they had <laughs> records. Why? Because he ordered the lift in his own name. If that wasn't bad enough, a community center's security camera also got him on video. So what a dumbass. Yeah, there's so, sometimes the smartest people. Uh, we see like the, uh, movies like uh, Ocean's Eleven where smart people try to do crime, but often in reality the the smart people aren't the ones doing crime. As and it's evidence a female in driver, case. and he's punching her in the back of the head. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he's boy. a coward on top of everything yeah, else. Nice. Yeah. Real, real, uh, real, real I think I would be. I think I would be a good criminal. I, I think I'd be a great criminal. So um, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't put the lift in your own name? Could you at least pass that part of the test? Yeah, if I'm trying to commit some sort of auto theft. <laughs> It's going to be someone that I have no connections with and I have zero technology on me. Um, yeah, because that's like, the other thing. I'd probably walk down have... the road and, like, you know, hijack a vehicle somehow. Um, I wonder if this was premeditated. I wonder if well, he, he... Bu- he booked it, so it sounds right, like it Right, but it didn't, he, the theft didn't have to be premeditated. Oh, okay. Like, I wonder if something something happened in the ride where like, he got mad maybe uh, and then started punching her and he's like, oh, I better cover this up and just didn't really know what to do. Like, I wonder if he knew before he ordered the lift if he was going to steal the car for some reason or if something happened in ride where it just triggered. I would imagine it was premeditated, but we don't know that for sure. Yeah, I'm just curious. By the by, the fact that he basically took the car home, it sounds premeditated. But I, I, mean, I what's 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 he trying to do though? Like, what's he trying to do I don't with know, the car? See, that's the thing. We, like, we glossed over the simple fact that you mentioned, like, not have technology on you. Whenever police try to solve crimes now, they just look at your cell phone data, see which towers yeah. are pinged off of. If he had, even if he hadn't booked the ride in his own name, they would have just been able to look at people who took uh, lift rides with her, look at yeah. the cell phone towers, and then f- figure that all out. It, it, you can't get away with almost anything nowadays. Yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe he got a text mid ride that his buddy's robbing a bank without a getaway car and needed a <laughs> lift, and he decided to step in. He took it literal. Yeah, and got a lift. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so another reason I'm making a face today. uh, Supposed to be the most magical place on Earth, but a tourist visiting the Magic Kingdom was arrested after, quote, forcefully snatching Mickey's ears from a woman's head because he thought the hat belonged to his daughter, according to an arrest affidavit from the Orange County Sheriff's Office. So this man, um, apparently... His daughter had lost a pair of Mickey ears while riding a ride and wanted to go back to the ride to look for the Mickey ears. This moron apparently thinks there's only one pair of Mickey ears in the world at Disney World. 
sees a woman wearing a pair of Mickey ears that look similar and then starts harassing her and then forcibly snatching the ears off her head, uh, creating a scene until a woman's uh, husband stepped in. Uh, the man was eventually arrested and uh, held on counts of robbery by sudden snatching, which I didn't know was a charge, but sudden, I'm glad it was. Sudden snatching? snatching? Yeah, what does robbery, that get you? Robbery by sudden snatching. That's interesting. People at Disney are, uh, I mean, it's supposed to be the happiest place on earth. Until something doesn't go their way. I've seen people in the gift shop fighting over those ears if it's the last ones out there. And you know they've got millions in the and back. That's the point, Joel. There's millions of them. Why yeah. does he think this lady's ears are his <laughs> daughter's? And when we were there, we saw people like literally tug a warring with the ears because it was the last pair on that particular rack. Well, go 50 feet down and there's another shop somewhere that's got them. But like people lose their mind at Disney. It's crazy. But that's <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Coog Blaze on Twitch. Can't hate that, Dad. You do not want a ticked-off kid at Disney That's World. also true, though. <laughs> yeah, he, like, like Joel said, though, walk 50 feet, you'll find another pair of ears. It's, yeah. you're and if you Disney really are hell-bent on finding yours, you yeah. can ask around. Uh, we're going to uh, we're gonna have to challenge Brian to not use a Florida story. Okay, well, I have a non-Florida story here. A Texas man uh, has Even legally better. changed his name to, quote, literally anybody else. And announced he is running for president in the 2024 election. Again, his name, literally anybody else. This is very well played. <laughs> very well played. I think he's got a dark horse shot at this. So uh, the man formerly known as Dustin E.B., he's a 35-year-old U.S. Army veteran and a seventh grade math teacher from the suburbs of Dallas. And now has a driver's license to prove his name change to, again, quote, literally anybody else. Uh, he said he wanted to change his name because he was unsatisfied with this year's presidential oh, candidates. Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Uh, quote, 300 million people can do better. It is not necessarily about me as a person, but it's about literally anybody else as an idea, he told a local news station. He needs 113,000 signatures from the non-primary voters to get on the ballot. Uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen, according to this story, but he went on to say, we don't have a neither option on the ballot, and this is ki this kind of fills that role. This, this first of all, is he getting Aaron Rodgers to be his VP? I He's getting literally anybody else. Uh, I'm. Uh, th this is. It's all fun and games when you do something like this. But I saw a story on the news a few weeks ago where the parents. I mean, years and years and years ago, twenty years ago, they they didn't have a name for their kid yet. So I forget if it was like to be determined or something like that. And that ended up on the kid's birth certificate. I, didn't like, I thought it was like baby boy. No, it wasn't baby boy, but it was something like that. It was like something oh, very, very generic. Both of them. Yeah. Now the guy can't collect unemployment, and he and still in the oh, records, wow. he hasn't been able to change said <laughs> name on birth certificate. It, it's Ridiculous. crazy. I wonder what her, what his students call him. He, it says he's a seventh grade math teacher. Oh, yeah, that's Do true. his students call him Mr. Else? Mr. Else. Mr. Anybody Else? Yeah. I like a good bit. So I, I, I like the bit here. I think the bit is funny. Um, Would you write him in in November? No, 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 I don't. I, I mean, I'm not. I don't talk politics. I'm not asking you to choose a side. But I think there's you. No matter who you want or you who you want to you expect or would like to have in the office, you're not got, get voting some guy in because his clown changed his name. I just the don't want to. I just like, don't want to vote for an 80 year old. It's, it's my only request. Fine, but this guy doesn't even have a platform. He's just got else. a cute little name change. Republicans wear sneakers too. Um, also, when you tell people you don't vote, if you're one of those people, people Thanks, get MJ. mad at you because it's like that's a that's a right, you know, like and you had all these people fight for your freedom and fight for your rights. Like there there is a there's a percentage of people that don't respect people who don't vote. That's that that's true. That's so like true. that's why I'm not going to say I'm voting left. That's why I'm not going to say I'm voting right. That's why I'm not going to say I'm not voting at all. I have friends in the military that are, and also people that have been in the military that said the way I was raised and the way I was taught through all my military experience, it doesn't matter who, you know, if they are elected, that is our commander in chief. That's who I follow. That's who I support. That's who I believe in. So they would, they would support a yes. uh, president, literally anybody yes. else. <laughs> yes. Let's do one more, uh, right. Brian. Let's do that. Um, I see your notes here. Yeah, I want to so do this Walmart Bezos or Jeff one. Bezos? Let's go Bezos. Jeff Bezos. So Jeff Bezos, this, there's a quote that came out from him, uh, I guess it was a couple years ago when he actually said it. I'm not sure why it came out now. Uh, but Jeff Bezos, uh, apparently he and his ex-wife let their children use, quote, sharp knives at the age of four because this is apparently coming from his wife. And apparently it wasn't just knives. He would let them 
the kids used knives at the age as early as age four. He would let them use power tools as early as age six or seven because, quote, I'd rather have a kid with nine fingers than a resourceless kid. <laughs> oh, you are an absolute dumbass, no matter how much money you make. I don't know what kids he's got but and what kind of training they've had. But there's no way in hell I'm letting either one of my kids, when they were that I'm about age, to say, don't you have a daughter about the same? I have an eight-year-old, and a four-year-old, and believe me, with the rambunctiousness and the the ability to have a, a, a no fear of pain, there's no doubt in my mind. If you put something sharp in her hand or a you or a power tool, everyone's in trouble. So you're not, you're not handing a butcher's knife uh, to no. your daughter when you get home tonight. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm a fan of this strategy. Uh, I think it's but part of the, the brilliance the that is Jeff Bezos. But isn't the kid more resourceful if he has all his fingers? Yeah. How do you how do you learn lessons through failures? Do you want and them to learn the lesson by losing a finger? Yeah, irreversible it's not, failures. It's not guaranteed like they're going to lose a finger. There's probably a pretty low chance that they lose a finger. They'll probably cut themselves and probably never have a trouble I, with a sharp knife again I feel like it's 99% with my daughter. Now, age four is stupid. Age four is way too young. Oh, yeah. That, that's but, the main um, point. But, I mean, you do learn from your failures, so I can understand where Bezos is – I, I would just here. like my daughter to learn from failures is. that are reversible. I'm not giving my eight-year-old a power drill. I'm yeah, sorry. Like, I'm just not doing it. How did you get to power drill, though? Because he that said he wants them to use that power was tools. Yeah, the, the oh, other all part, I saw was the sharp knife. I heard the sharp knives. Yeah, the other part of the quote it was uh, they would let his, the kids use sharp knives by the age of four and power tools by the age of six or seven. No. I think they're lying. I don't believe it. Yeah, because they were, they weren't even watching their kids. It was the damn nanny. They're That's doing yeah, I'm facts. calling BS. That's I'm calling fact. BS on this. Like this is like you would. This would be CPS. Like you're not giving a four year old a knife. Like we we ate. Oh, um, well, Bezos can buy CPS. What did we have? We had uh, we had chicken last night. We the eleven year old, the ten year old. He was uh, he was using a knife. It's been only the first time. He's ten. And he's like kind of like I'm looking at him in the corner of my eye. I'm like, uh oh, like we better we better have a plan of what we're going to do. So this is not just do. like a butter knife. This is like a, no, it's like, a steak knife. Okay, but I mean, he's he's ten years old. You know, he's he's of that age. A four year old, they still don't really have control of their their yeah, hands they're, yet. They're just as likely we're not to giving poke our four year old kid eye. scissors. Yeah, not yet. That's too young. That's too young. When what is the proper age to give him a steak knife? I, I think, think 10's the I think age. You hit I think it. 10's 10 or fair. 11's I think fair. 10's yeah. the age. Yeah. 10 or 11's yeah. fair. All right, seven one three seven eight zero ESPN. At what age are you giving your kid a steak knife? Uh, what's the Texans' weakest projected starter? Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Killer bees. ESPN ninety seven five and ESPN at ninety two five. It's time, basketball betters. It's March Mania. Brad, I'm here to tell you about BetUS.com. You know that I only endorse one sports book and casino, and you know what that is. It's BetUS.com. It's where you should be too. BetUS.com has been driving to the basket for over thirty years, three decades plus of betting. This year, BetUS has an epic three pointer, a one hundred and twenty five percent sign up bonus on your first three deposits. That's right, the industry's craziest 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits, plus 10% gambler's insurance, and even more, BetUS accepts crypto, offering a massive 200% crypto sign-up bonus, gambler's insurance, and crypto. You don't see that everywhere. March Mania basketball can get even more exciting with their live in-game betting. It's also a blast to check out their casino after the game, where you could get a 250% casino bonus. Get started by visiting Bet. BetUS.com or give them a call at 1-800-MY-BETUS to learn all about their bonuses and special offers. BetUS, where the game begins.
can't believe they made a movie like this. I, I, I get dis, I'm in disbelief every time I hear this rejoin. They said they were protecting the hive. It's a great movie. They can't, great. Get out of here. It's a great, great movie. Let's Rotten Strongly Tomatoes recommend. this. recommend. Let's Rotten Tomatoes Please this do. Movie. That'll that'll strengthen my point. I, what's I it, what's, what's that. it called? Uh, the Beekeeper. The Beekeeper Rotten Tomato. You want to guess before I It's before it's, I nor, it's north of 80%. I know it. Are you going off of the critically acclaimed or the uh, audience score? I think that was critic score. I don't remember, but they're both fairly high. The it tomato sounds meter, like an absolute clunker. Tomato meter seventy one percent. That's solid. The audience score is ninety two. There we go. I never trust the audience. <laughs> What's well, you had like seventy one? Seventy one's a good score too. Would you allow the first grade class to pick their teacher? Hell no. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, the, so the critic score doesn't matter. The critic scores matters. Yeah, seventy one percent is pretty. That's respectable. That, that, that is a certified fresh, sir. I don't watch anything below ninety because <laughs> like, I'm because I'm pretentious. <laughs> about to say, here comes the pretentiousness again. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm kidding. Uh, someone texted in three three one one. I worked at a children's hospital and they were named A B C D E, pronounced absidy. <laughs> Wow. This goes back, man. Wow. Every time we have this conversation, there are so many just misses on kids' names. Oh, yeah. My, my mom was a an elementary <laughs> teacher for years. Every year, there'd be at least one student there. You just you scratch your head as to how this, this uh, kid got named that. A, B, C, D, E, Absidy. There were the <laughs> twins that played basketball a few years ago that were Orangelo and Lemangelo, and if you just break it down, it's orange jello and lemon jello. Oh no. Oh yeah. Oh that's yeah. That's not that's not a good name. The kid that went to Carolina like that, that played for the Bulls, it was spelled Jameson, but he apostrophed the J A and arrowed the, the the James and it was James on. James on Curry. Always a really, really fun one when you're doing a game and you want to call him Jameson. You're like, it's really James on? Yeah, pronunciation guide comes in handy. Yes. What's the Texans' weakest projected starter? 713-780-3776. Who's it for you, Blankers? I mean, we talked about it, I think. Uh, I think the, the the weakest starter right now, and obviously it, this could be one of two for me, but I'm going to say Kenyon Green. I, I don't believe in Kenyon Green, whether it's because of the injury or because he is under underachieved. But I believe that with the importance that D'Amico has put on the running game, left guard is a massively important position. And I don't believe that Kenyon Green, just because he was a first-round pick, is going to be a guy capable of playing like a first-round pick. Yeah, I have Kenyon Green third weakest here. Um, I had a tough time coming up with my second and my third. Ooh, my, okay. my first one's my one-tech defensive tackle, and it's Tim Settle. Like uh, To me, Tim Settle is the weakest of the starters. Um, I mean, maybe maybe you could throw Kenyon Green into the mix there. Maybe I'm maybe I'm buying too much in where he was drafted as opposed to just like actual production. Mm -hmm. I have Tim Settle as the one tech. The one tech I have huge questions about, and, and I think that they're just going to rotate bodies. Quite frankly, uh, my second weakest I had the second corner spot. Mm -hmm. Whether it's Agreed. Jeff Fakuda, whether it's uh, C.J. Henderson, they're kind of the same profile guys that were high draft picks that are young that are borderline bust that they're hoping yep. D'Amico Ryans can figure out and play at a high level. I did have Kenyon Green third, and then I had uh, I had Jimmy Ward fourth, and I didn't think he played well that l last year, and he was always hurt. So I actually had Jimmy Ward uh, fourth. I guess you could throw in, like, maybe one of their third linebackers because Christian Harris, uh, Aziz Alshire, very, very good. But mm -hmm. then who's your third right now? Jake Hansen, Henry Toa Toa. They did sign Hewitt today, but he's more of a special teams guy. I guess you could throw him in the mix too. Yeah, I'd probably throw that guy into the mix over Ward. So those I, I was thinking five. Jimmy Ward. I was I'll thinking go, Jimmy I'll go Ward. One tech, corner two, left guard, um, third linebacker, and then se second safety with Jimmy Ward. Yeah, I was thinking about Jimmy Ward as well when you were saying trying to find three. I'm like, God, I could find Jimmy Ward and Jeff Okuda right there behind Kenyon Green for me. Because what about Settle? Yeah, you're right, but but. Again, it, it's unsettled right now, but I think it'll 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 uh, figure itself 2. out between 8. now and training. Yeah. I'll, I'll go. I'll go I, I don't 3. think they're 9. done. I don't 3. think they're 9. done finding another 
one tech or another defensive lineman. I hope you're one right. Way or the other. I, I hope you're right. Great, great blankers, settle list joke or whatever. Seven one three seven or unsettled joke. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Uh, Brian, what's your weakest starter? I I, th- I think you guys nail the the obvious ones. It's left guard. It's second corner. It's you know the the defensive tackle spot uh, next to Danico Autry. If Autry is even a defensive tackle, third linebacker certainly uh, a need as well. I'll go a little bit off the board. Just I, I think it's a concern, and we're it seems like people are kind of glossing over it but uh I, i'm not overly enthused about the wide receiver depth yeah. right now behind nico collins and tank dell Noah brown had a couple really good games but he also didn't stay healthy and we saw how how much that uh that 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 position group dropped off with one injury with tank dell last year it went from a strength of the team to something that was a real concern because no one was getting open outside of nico collins i semantic it like i thought about it but like third receiver is it starter yeah, I, mean, I went, well, a third wide receiver in a lot of offenses, and, and we'll see what the Texans run out. And they'll obviously they probably will be a little bit heavier with the 49ers scheme, but third wide receiver in a lot of a lot of systems as a starter. Yeah, how I much, thought. Uh, it, how I much thought did they play? Sixty percent on in this scheme? Eh, that might be high. Eh, I go sixty ish. Sixty ish percent. How many how many times do you think the Texans played a third receiver last year? Oh, how many snaps? Yeah, in, what like percentage 11, of snaps? Per, Eleven personnel, or, be, or I would say. Well, the the Tank Dell injury obviously changes things, but I would say fifty five percent. Okay, so we're 65. in the same wheelhouse. We're in the same, somewhere between fifty five to sixty five. Somebody, yeah. somebody sent us that information. Seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. So we're all on the same page there. Let's go out to the HRMP listener line. Kristen Umble uh, has Brian's back on oh, the no. Beekeeper movie. Uh, Chris, what's up? Yes, this movie is actually really good. I actually went into it thinking the same thing. It's not going to be that good. I saw the previews. I was like. Oh, man, and then my brother-in-law was like, you got to watch this movie. So I watched it. It's actually one of his best movies he's done in a while. What's that Like, storyline, action. It's pretty good, man. you got to check it out. Chris, it hey, how, Chris how old what? are you, Chris? Say what? How old are you? 38. 38. Do you ha- are you married? No. There you go. When's the last time you well, – Chris, when's the last time you saw an Academy Award-winning film? Uh, Oppenheimer? Okay. okay. All right. All right. And that What's was me you? voluntarily going into it. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Chris. Well Appreciate played. the call. Thanks for uh, having some fun with us. I guess I'm going to have to check it out. Like, if I'm going to talk this much crap about it, I mean, I'm going to have to actually from check the critics. it out. Come on, JB. 70, if it was like it, it, 71% is what makes me okay-ish with checking it out. I'm not a I'm not a big Jason Statham guy. Well, it, it, it came out in the theaters in December, so if it's not already out for a can low I find rental it? cost, it's got to be pretty close to it. Can't. What would you say Jason Statham's best movie is? He's known for uh, Furious 7. The Transporter okay. series? I can't the Meg? any of them. No, nah. no, I would say the, the probably Transporter 1 the, or just the Transporter series in general. Would this be was part best. of the marathon you watched on your day off a couple no, weeks I, ago? I should like, That should have been what I did. I, I did not do that, uh, but maybe the next time I, I'm, I'm forced to have a day off, it'll be a Jason Statham marathon. Stump me with that one because I <laughs> could Jason name a Jason Statham. Statham movie. So you haven't seen Death Race? You haven't no. seen Crank? No. <laughs> Has he ever won an award Crank sounds for like his a acting porn. ability? <laughs> Say, what was that, Jeremy? Has he ever won an award for his acting ability? Uh, pr- I'm probably not. Yeah, not on no, yeah, Nickelodeon. Not. I'm going to have to find this stupid movie and actually watch it and give you guys a review of this stupid movie. Uh, that 713. sounds like a great segment. <laughs> I'm all for that. No joking. Brand find new movie it. reviews. Where can that I watch a, it? That needs to be a segment. Tell me where I can watch it. People are sending in their bad names. Uh, we'll read some of these bad names on the other side. 713-780-ESP. And also, who was the worst coach for a Houston pro team over the recent memory, recent years? 713-780-3776. Killer B's ESPN 97.5, ESPN 92.5.
You're locked in with the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Uh, 2585 says the guy who directed the Beekeeper is the same director of Training Day. A uh, really good director, actually. Training Day is one of my favorite movies. It's a great so, movie. Good flick. That it's might not talk about me what into you it know, it's what you can prove. Love and, that movie. And Denzel's girlfriend in the movie was uh, Ava Mendez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a type. I don't deny it, sir. <laughs> hey, I, if, um, if that's the type, I'm on board. Yeah, she, no she doubt was, about she it. Was, she looked pretty good in that movie. Brian uh, told me during the break that I can stream Amazon, uh, the Beekeeper on Amazon for five ninety nine. I don't know if I want to pay five ninety nine to watch it though. I might, I might have to have a go. <laughs> you can expense me. it. I don't think I can. <laughs> if we make it a segment, come on, it'll be. I don't think I can expense. expense it. Yeah. I mean, we have to start a GoFundMe so I can watch the Beekeeper on Amazon. Everybody's saying that his favorite movie is or the the best state the movie is Snatch. Snatch, um, yeah, he was in a number of Guy Ritchie movies early in his career. I, I don't so know. So this if dude's I, been in Snatch and Crank. I, I'm just gonna step right past that, Joel. I'm just uh, asking a question. What's <laughs> kind, what's up with the movie titles? Forget the headlines. <laughs> Some people Jeez. like one syllable names. It's they, they think it's strong and it's catchy. I, I didn't include the the Guy Ritchie movies because I wouldn't make I wouldn't I wouldn't classify those as his movies. He was in those movies, but he wasn't the main guy in those movies. Gotcha. Um, have you seen Iron Claw? Someone said that's an awesome movie. I have not that's seen not Iron Jason Claw. That's not Jason Statham, no. though. Uh, I want to see it. My wife actually wanted to see it, too. Um, I'm going to have to check that one out. Uh, enough time, enough Jason Statham. We've talked way too much about Jason Statham on this show. Who was the worst coach that a Houston professional team has hired over the recent years? 713-780-3776. Who, who, do, who sticks out to you, Blankers? Man, to me, this is a two-horse race, and it's close. I, I think it's Steven Silas, and it's it's David Culley. And I think that both guys, when we start talking about resumes and comparisons, both guys never being a head coach previously, being in the league forever as an assistant coach, neither guy had any kind of – really, I don't think was the right guy for the job regardless. But when you look at how it all played out, we're so over their heads – I think, that, I think I'm going to say Steven Silas because he got more years to do it. I mean, Cully was one and done and with good reason. Silas probably should have been, but they kept hoping something was going to click and a switch was going to go on and they were going to change. And then you saw him stunt the growth of several of the young players, run an offense that anyone has seen at open gym, uh, not be able to discipline his players, and when others tried to have all hell break loose. And I just think Steven Silas was awful for the Rockets. I'll say him number one. Yeah, I don't think Silas is good, but I don't think he's even close to the same stratosphere as David Culley. I think David Culley could potentially be the worst NFL coach of all time. Um, they wanted him to be the raw, raw energy coach, keep the spirits high during a rebuild for at least two years, and they couldn't co-sign him for a second season. So they literally promoted his defensive coordinator as a quote-unquote interim head coach for another year before they finally hired D'Amico Ryans. Uh, Silas also, I think Silas would have been a head coach, or yeah, been a head coach in the NBA at some point had the Rockets not hired him, like I feel he would have gotten his opportunity at some point. Uh, he was going to get a chance at some point if the Rockets didn't make that hire. That was never happening for David Culley. David Culley was never going to be a head coach of anything. Secondly, David Culley, and look, maybe he's partly retired or whatever, but no one was going to hire David Culley again. Steven Silas got a job the very next year. I think it's David Culley in a landslide. Brian? Yeah, I'm going to have to lean David Culley for this, just for that, kind of that last portion there. Like, at least Steven Silas, I'm not saying he was the most qualified candidate, you know, that year or the most qualified candidate the Rockets ever hired or anything like that. But David Culley wasn't even being considered as an offensive coordinator at the point. I mean, he was coming off seasons of Baltimore as the passing game coordinator where they were bottom three in, in passing yards. And I'm part of that was Lamar. But he also was a part of the offensive staff and the passing side for the Kansas City Chiefs in a year where the wide receivers had zero receiving touchdowns. So he wasn't even considered a plausible or wor worthwhile candidate as an offensive coordinator, much less a coach. Uh, complete just... I don't even know what term you want to throw to David Culley, but uh, a puppet. A I would say incompetent. But I think both were because I think that when you look at it, 
Cully didn't have a roster of young players you were trying to develop, and the Rockets mm -hmm. did. So he could just be the bridge guy, and whether he failed miserably as he, he did. Well, he was trying to develop Davis Mills in theory. Yeah, yeah. I think to Blanker's point, I, I do think that Silas created more harm. Yeah, like, I, 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 would that. That. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. He had more talent that would like, you'd be in a much better spot now, and like it would have been a better situation for Adoka to to walk into. Now he has been able to overcome that. Uh, but I would say that he had more quality on his team that needed more development, whereas Cully didn't really have much on his on his team. Like they they weren't a good they w wasn't a good roster. But the biggest thing for me when it comes to Cully is like they they knew what they were doing. They knew why they hired David Gully. He was just a fall guy. He was a he was a fall guy. Mm -hmm. He was a bridge, but he was so bad he couldn't be the second year. Like think of that. Like okay, our process is a, is an organization, and you're you know you're Nick Casario. Okay, our roster's terrible. Uh, we don't think in windows, but we look at two year increments. He's literally said he looks at two year increments and two year windows. But he doesn't want to admit that now, but. Cully couldn't make it into that second year. Why? Because he couldn't co-sign him for a second season because Casario would have looked like a bad general manager to co-sign him for a second season, even though it was part of the plan for them to be terrible and for him to be the energy guy. But he was so bad at his job, he literally had to get fired after one year. But then, uh, but then Stone, crazy. But then <laughs> Stone crazy. hired a guy that he thought was the guy, that was qualified, that was the man, that was going to be developing these kids, that was going to do everything that, that – he needed a coach to do with this young roster of talent. And he looks terrible because Silas was the absolute worst guy for that job and did it for multiple years. Yeah, I, I can, I can understand the harm, but I mean, Silas got hired right away. Like, like he has coaching chops. Like he still he has relevance to the league. I mean, David Cole has, has a position. You know why? Because he came cheap and he's got a coach's dad's name and, and as an assistant coach. Some guys are just good assistant coaches. But, I mean, you mentioned yeah. that like Stone thought he was a credible candidate. The league wasn't laughing at the Rockets when they hired Silas the way the league was laughing at the, at the Texans when they hired David Coley. Like so, Silas probably had other coaching, head coaching interviews, right? Over the course interviews, of Interviews probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. Coley, did he? Yeah, no. I don't think so. No. <laughs> I don't I mean, think he would ever been he interviewed. He was coming off, you know, a bottom five passing defense like four years in a row in the Ravens, a Chiefs stint where his wide receivers caught zero touchdown passes. He was just a complete laughable candidate. But, but how did Casario even find him? Like, how is that even an interview? It almost felt like Mad Libs. <laughs> like they Why pulled a the name out of a hat. Was Jack involved in that at that time? Uh, I don't think he wanted me. He wanted Josh McCown, though. That's like, true. I don't that's think true. he was standing yeah, for true. David Cully. You know, like I, he because wasn't. The thing that bothers me is at least from Casario's perspective with Cully, he could admit his mistake and get it after one year. Stone let this guy go three. And, yeah. and and so that it was collateral. It just kept the damage just kept stacking well, that up part of it. As far as the GM decision, mm -hmm. I think you're right. It's worth the decision by the GM was worse from stone than it was from Casario because of the more longer term harm that he did to the young roster than certainly than the, what, what happened with the Texans. And you wanted, you had commodities that you wanted developed, right? right. The Texans didn't really have those commodities. Uh, two, five, eight, five, gotta be Silas. We knew Cully wasn't, wasn't going to be good. and was a stopgap coach, but we sort of had expectations with Silas and he felt miserably that's more like, like I think that kind of that, that answer is kind of Cully though like you knew that Cully wasn't good you thought Silas could be good that's more about expectation than actual coaching chops I think yeah no I, I, I hear what you're saying I, I think that Cully was just a guy that was never going to be on anybody's radar I don't think that he, he no matter when you looked at his career, I don't think there was ever a time when he was going to be a guy that general managers that knew this league very well thought should be a head coach. Uh, you know, Silas got a lot of credit for being the offensive coordinator for Luka and creating an offense around Luka. And I think that's why he got hired. So, you know, I, I think I think it's a two-horse race, like I said. I, I think you, you have a, a right to stand on that hill with, with Cully. Uh, I just think there's a lot that because of the fact that there was already talent on the roster that – was not developed and because of it set back the entire franchise that Silas was just bad. 6860, are we talking about the worst as far as uh, competency or are we talking about the worst coach in general? If it's the worst coach, I would put Bill O'Brien because he single handedly imploded a franchise. That, that was his GM ability, though. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yep. That's more GM O'Brien. I think head coach O'Brien was okay, he was adequate. Yeah, I think he was okay. Like, if you're going to, if you had to hire one head coach today, to coach your pretty good football team that's maybe playoff caliber, are you hiring Bill O'Brien or are you hiring David Kelly? No, it's Bill O'Brien. Yeah. So I don't think that Bill O'Brien's the the worst of those two. 
Uh, it's t- more difficult to do with the with different sports. Zero three one five says Kevin McKell was a bad coach for the Rockets. Eh, I don't like. No, nah. I don't like that at all. I don't like obviously, that take. everybody thinks it's because we're friends. No, it's because of the fact that with McHale, <laughs> I mean. And, and people, you can chuckle all you want. I'm I just really laughing because you like, ass. no, you just you kind of you did an accidental name drop and you didn't even mean. Yeah, to. it's because the guys on Twitch and especially certain guys on Twitch love to come at me and say that's the reason I defend him. No, it's because he, he got he got sideways with the best player by making one hell of a coaching decision in that Clipper series and benching James Harden for the bench guys that got you back from a twenty some point deficit to win a game that ended up getting you to win a series and James never forgot it and then wanted him gone. I, I think that. He he fought he fell victim more than anything else to prima donna superstars that had to have it his way or the highway, but overall I don't think McHale sometimes gets enough credit for what he got out of guys that didn't have the talent that some people thought that they did. No, I think that I think McHale was pretty good. Uh, I, I think I don't think McHale needs to be in this conversation. Uh, not it's it, it's not because. I work with a guy who's friends with Kevin McHale. I think Kevin McHale is a pretty good coach. Uh, 7503, David Kelly was terrible. He literally had a GM telling him what to do on the headphones. That's true. That's yeah. a fact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, so how far do we have to go back to where we get to an Astros manager Bo that Porter, would be part of the conversation? Too. Yeah, Bo Cecil Porter Cooper? was the first one that came to me. I was thinking Jimmy Williams. Jimmy Williams was awful. And that, he's that, crotchety, he was too. so bad. He I pissed think, off I think everybody. we have to go back to Jimmy Williams before we put uh, an Astros manager in the same conversation with Silas and David Coley. <sighs> See, because the, the rebuttal to general manager on the headsets was general manager that was telling the coaches what he could and couldn't say to his players with the Rockets that, that Silas yeah. was falling big, that was allowing to happen. Jimmy Williams was the coach the first half of the year when the Astros went to the NLCS yeah, and they got fired and then Scrap took over and they got to the NLCS. So you could probably, Jimmy Williams belongs on that conversation. He didn't make many friends when he was here. He he was overseeing the roster that went to the NLCS and to the World World (laughs) Series right after he left. I mean, it's a direct correlation of he couldn't do that with the same roster. 6517 says Brad Mills was bad. Brad Mills was bad. Yeah, that's true. He was no good. Man, they went through a rough patch there for a while yeah. with the managers. They went from Durker to Jimmy Williams. They brought back Phil Garner, who was good. Uh-huh. Cecil Cooper, not eh, really. okay. okay. And then they brought in Brad Mills, not good at all. Bo Porter was, Bo Porter was David Cully-ish. He Still had really a winning was. record, though. No, he didn't. Well, at least in one season. Maybe not, Mills, not he overall. didn't. You should, oh, maybe, Bo okay. Porter went 51 and 111. Bo Porter was the one that was taking the okay. yeah, I might be thinking, might be thinking of Brad Mills. Fired after that. I might be thinking of Brad Mills. He you're was their Brad bridge Mills. coach. No, no, Brad Mills was. You're not. You're, Brad Mills never had a winning season either. I think you're thinking of Cecil Cooper, who was 86 and 75 in his first year. There you go. That's what I'm thinking of. Okay. And then he was 70 and 79, got fired in year two. Brad Mills that's, got that's the job because he was Francona's bench coach. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that sounds right. I think that he, I, I believe that to be true. Uh, I have to go back and check that, but I, that does sound right. Seven one three seven eight zero ESPN professional. Oh, Mike, someone said Mike D'Antoni. Nah, D'Antoni was D'Antoni was good. They had some good years under him. The the style I, of I like D'Antoni. He was he you know he was all offensive minded. I mean, he even made sure that someone else was going to take the blame for the fact that he he knows his team don't doesn't play defense when they hired Bizdelic to be his defensive coordinator, but regardless of whether you like his his hell-bent offensive style or not, it worked, and it got the most out of James Harden. Yeah, I think you could say that D'Antoni wasn't great because of that, but I, I'm not saying he's bad. Like, he was at worst good. You know what I mean? But just coming off of what I said and what, what Mikhail had to endure because James was uncoachable, the fact that you got the most out of James Harden for the D'Antoni years was yeah. doing something. I mean, the Rockets, and you know, since the championship, the furthest they got were with D'Antoni as the coach. So... I yeah, Dan Tony doesn't deserve to be anywhere uh, near this list. Mikhail was in the Western Conference Finals with the the Rockets. Wasn't a Game Seven, was it? No, because uh, yeah, the first time they lost in we five lost to in, the Warriors, right? Did we lose in six? I thought they lost in five. No, because that's that's the series where Harden finished Game Six with the the record for turnovers. Okay, uh, at Golden Either State. Either way, they didn't get to Game I was, Seven. I was the at first that time. game. Yeah, it was Game Six. Yeah, I think the only year they went to Game 7 was the year with Dan Tony. With Chris Paul? Yeah. Well, Chris Paul minus a hamstring. They only went to the con- so they went to the conference finals twice in the James Harden era. Once right. with each guy, yeah. And they went to the conference semis a ton with Dan Tony, never under Mikel. And the year where they had Mikel, they lost the Western Conference Finals in 5. 
they lost four to one. They lost in five, and then yeah, game seven in the uh, the D'Antoni year, and that was the hamstring with Paul. And the what was it? Oh, for twenty six, one for twenty six. Uh, I think it was twenty seven in a row. Twenty seven in a row that they missed. Eek. It was twenty seven. Yep. Uh, three zero three nine two. There's no way you can compare Cully to Mikel. Cully looked completely overwhelmed on the sidelines. That's true. Someone said Dom Capers. I don't think Capers was bad. Yeah, that's not fair. Yeah, Capers. He was he was okay. He wasn't great. Again, wasn't good, all, the, all these bad. other names that we're talking about were at least credible, and it wasn't universally mocked by the entire league and all of the the fans of the league. David Coley is the one exception yeah. to that. Everyone knew that was just a ludicrous clown hire. For sure. Four five one five. Silas never coached the team he was hired to coach. That doesn't matter if we're talking coaching chops because Harden soon after asked out. D'Antoni was a terrible coach. Every year in the playoffs, he dropped from nine to seven players. By the end of the series, they were gassed and lost like four years in a row. But 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 playoffs. But playoffs. And then the final one here, uh, six five one seven. If anything, Cully overachieved with that roster. Cully won four. Lovey won three. <laughs> Those are facts. Those are facts. Seven one three seven eight zero. Cullian overachieved. I didn't think I'd hear it here with Texans talk. I think they hit the over that year. I think they hit the over. Well, that roster wasn't worthy of much, but he won more games than Lovey did. Yeah, he did. Those are facts. What does Joe Espada have to do this year to equal or surpass D'Amico or a, or Ime? We had that conversation the other day. Who's a better coach, D'Amico or Ime? What does Espada have to do to equal those two guys? Uh, 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5, ESPN 92.5.
Coming to you live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. He's Blank. I'm Branham. We are the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. We were having the conversation uh, two days ago, who's a better coach, Ime or D'Amico? Uh, we all said that Espada needs to, to earn it to be even in the conversation. He's third of the three. But what does he need to do to be in that mix, Blankers? I think to be in the mix, he's got to get you to the ALCS. He's got to be a guy that, you know, takes you deep into the, the ALCS and, and is, a, is a guy that continues uh, the train going down the, the, the track at the right speed. Uh, I just think that it's basically his to not screw up as opposed to the other guys that had to do so much right to get them where the Texans finished, what the Rockets are currently doing. This is a totally different scenario where you've got a guy that basically just has been empowered to not screw it up and keep it going forward. In order to do that, the expectations, whether realistic or not, are probably getting to the American League Championship Series again and, and not getting swept. But if you're in the series... Anything can happen, obviously, and, and short of injuries derailing anything. I think that's where the bar starts. I think he's got to get this team to the ALCS. Uh, I don't like looking at the result to determine if a guy's a good coach or not. Uh, I don't think that that always translates. Like, there's guys who win championships that aren't good coaches. Um, but Frank I Vogel. like your – what's that? Frank Vogel, Dave Roberts. I'm just going back Vogel's to the okay. LA talk. I don't think Vogel's bad. He's not doing so well in Phoenix this year either. No, he's not. But, I mean, they, he's he has a playoff team, right? So, like, that's kind of why the context matters because is Frank Vogel a better coach than Ime Adoka? Vogel has a title. Ime doesn't. Vogel's going to be in the playoffs this year. Uh, Ime might not be. So, like, like, I'm not a huge, like, okay, well, this guy finished third place. This guy finished fifth. The guy who finished third place is better. Uh, the context of this matters. Um, and the Astros are really, really good. I, I think the only way that a spotter really gets into this conversation is I, I think that – I think you might have to win a World Series for a spotter to be in this conversation because if you get to the ALCS and you don't win that, well, you know, you've been in the ALCS now. It would be eight straight years or whatever it is. That you're not pushing the Astros over the top with your managerial skills. Uh, getting to the World Series, I think it's World Series or bust. So I think it would take winning a World Series and then also making some critical moves that turn out right. Uh, whether it's a hook on a certain reliever, whether it's bringing in um, Hater for you know an inning and a third in a critical spot, and then it working. What look he had the he had the thing last year where people pinch. think that after Dusty was ejected, whenever he pinch hit a couple yep. of guys back to back. I can't was it was it Singleton? Singleton was one of them. Singleton in one of them. I think Singleton went first. No, no, it was Yiner to lead off because he liked the idea of Yiner without any pressure, and then Yiner got a, that single through the left side, and then Singleton walked ahead of the Altuve homer. So I think it actually for for Espada to like be in the conversation with Ime and with D'Amico, I actually think he's going to have to win it all and then also make some moves during the playoff run that work out. And we're like, oh, man, that, that Espada cat, he's pretty good at, at, at doing what he does. I think that's what it would take. I, I, to me, this comes down to exceeding expectations, like spe specifically when we're talking about what Yudoka and D'Amico Ryans did because obviously uh, D'Amico Ryans smashed any, any expectations even the most optimistic Texans fans have for them and in uh, Yudoka maybe hasn't smashed them in the same way but he's you know he's obviously exceeded the the Vegas uh, win projection uh for before the season so it to me, I don't think Joe Espada can get there. Obviously, if you win a World Series, and with Jeremy, what you laid out, the, the, the conversation will at least be there. But this roster, the way it's set up, I mean, we talked about it in segment one. They're right there with the Braves and the Dodgers as the clear, you know, favorites, the top contenders to win the to win the uh, World Series. They've been to the ALCS seven straight years. I think a lot of people would see the Astros winning the World Series, whether fair or not, uh, to Joe Espada is something they should do because the talent's there and it would be more on the roster than it would be Joe Espada. I just feel like in order – maybe I've set the bar a little too low. I think that because, like – and I had set, I set the table by saying, like, you know, these other guys are doing things that he didn't have to do. He's supposed to just not screw it up. But if – I think Jeremy's on it in terms of – Maybe he makes a move or two along the way, too, that he gets full credit for that is a difference maker because you don't want to be the A.J. Hinch on the other side of it that gets remembered no matter what he did for not bringing in Garrett Cole and, and the moves that he made. I, I think that it's probably that you get to a World Series. I think in order to be in the conversation with those other two guys, he probably has to win it. 
He probably has to win a World Series, and 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 I think I set the bar too low. Yeah, the bar. That's that's the thing is the bar with the Astros is so high. Yep. Uh, and and they've done it consistently since 2017 with managers that were not named Joe Espada. You know, they did it with Hinch. They, they won a title with Hinch. They did it with Baker. They won a title uh, with Baker. And, and Dusty still gets criticized, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. I, I think sometimes wrongfully, uh, honestly. 4683, Espada has to make the ALCS to match the expectations. I don't think matching the expectation puts him in the same cloud with D'Amico and, and Ime with their coaching chops, though. I think that's what the listener's saying, though. Like, just just to meet expectation is ALCS. So. Like, mm -hmm. you have to – I mean, because that's what D'Amico and uh, Yudoka did. They they went far beyond expectations. So, Joe Spada is going to match them and get in the conversation with them. He's going to have to exceed expectations, which, unfortunately for him, and it's unfair – I mean, winning the World Series may not even be necessarily exceeding expectations because that's, that's what the expectations are. I set the bar where I did for him to be acceptable, but if it's how he how he gets in the same stratosphere as the other two guys, he's got to win the World Series. I think he might. I think he's going to have to make a critical move here or there too. Like I think if you just roll the ball out and you win it all and without making like this genius move, I, I'm still not sure that he does. Eh, well, eh, but you think does. about it, Jeremy. The guys that live. Yeah, you are, would. The guys that are going to live forever in Astros lore are going to be the guys that won titles. So AJ's going to get his flowers. Dusty's going to get his flowers. I think if Is you Dusty win a title, getting flowers though, I think so because it was uh, his first ever World Series and because they won it. At least he got one. I think yeah, he's people, all people at the year oh, after he won it. People right, were ready to. Like, but that's not what I'm saying. Of, like, you know, when, see you later. But that's not what I'm saying. Once you win one in Astros lore. They well, will. They'll celebrate you at a different level. Sure, but that's not coaching chops. Like celebrating a guy for a champion is it doesn't necessarily mean you think he's a good coach or in this case manager. But if he does that, I think in a lot of people's minds he'll have done the same kind of things as the other two guys because that's how high they build a pedestal for guys that have won a World Series. Yeah, you can come back and say the next season Dusty wasn't as good, but Dusty's still uh, uh, beloved because he got him another title. I don't know. I feel like if you put out the approval rating of managers or coaches in like this little recent time with the with the Houston sports teams, I don't think the approval rating on Dusty Baker would be that high. I think it would because they want it and because whether we agree with it or not, and we had all those things that we could easily point out that he didn't handle right or wasn't what we agreed with. The fact is, is that at the end of the year, we were saying, you know what? Dust Dusty's Papa's gut feelings got him a title. So whatever he felt in his gut that he went his way with worked because they won. Yeah, but you saw the vitriol the next year. But they still don't forget, and they forgot a lot of the, the shortcomings in the year that he won it. And once you win it, they're never going to forget that. I think what you're talking about, Joel, though, is going to need some time removed. Like, I, I certainly think 10 years from now, you know, if Dusty – well, hopefully Dusty's still around in 10 years. But if Dusty celebrated with this team in 10 years – then yeah, people are going to cheer him when he comes out because he's a part of uh, the team that got their second title. But in the moment, but Jeremy now, called yeah. him. The, Jeremy, just so rightfully mad about so, Jeremy called him the greatest manager in, in, in Astros history. He because is we're talking about resume, but we're not talking about approval rating or his chops to be a manager. I think approval rating like, is won over by the people, title. How many people were sad that he retired last year, Blankers? I mean, we weren't. Uh, we no weren't, but, but I think no the, one was sad I think he retired this, because they were. Ready I'm not going to say no one. I think the average fan was very was small sad. percentage. I don't think the average fan was, was sad. I think very small percentage were sad. I think an overwhelming majority were happy that there was going to be a new manager for the Houston Astros. I I, I would disagree. I think seven one three seven eight zero ESPN. Ahead. Were you were you happy that Dusty left? Are you happy there's a new manager for the Houston Astros? Because that's the sense that I got whenever you know we lived last year and then when it all came to an end. Uh, I felt that really throughout the entire tenure of Dusty Baker. And the only time where I didn't feel that was for like the three-month cushion of them winning a World Series. That's us. No, it's everybody. That's reading the room. That's reading the text line. It's reading Twitter. It's not just us. It's it's getting a feel and a pulse of the city. I think once uh, once they won it, people change their opinion. And I, I think there are people out there that, that it's a different number than you think in terms of the fact that they love Dusty and they were sad to see him go. For, it's not uh, us. I'm not talking about us. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the listeners. I'm talking about the city. I'm talking about talking Astro about. fans. Well, you said us. Right, but Twice. I'm saying like Brian said, we saw it differently oh, because Brian. we were engaged in every pitch and every inning and everything else. Settle the argument, Hive. 713-780-ESPN. Were you 
sad to see Dusty go? Were you happy to see a new manager for the Houston Astros? 713-780-3776. It's the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, right now I want to take a moment for Vanderford Air. and It's more than air. Vanderford Air is in the website, but the bottom line is Vanderford does so much more. We know that the most critical things that we deal with, especially here in Houston, plumbing issues, air conditioning issues, HVAC issues, depending on the weather and the season and the time of the year. And the biggest thing you need is immediate response. You need people that are going to be attentive to how, what kind of an emergency situation or what you're dealing with and do their best to fix it and then guarantee their work. That's why you go to Vanderford Air because it doesn't matter what you're dealing with. If it's a plumbing issue, if you got leaky pipes or you got a pipe that explodes or something's going on, you need someone that's there as fast as possible. And when you hear that the companies you call or go, I'll be there in a day or two, you got to shut the water off, that's a problem. Air conditioning, especially when it's 100 out, you need somebody that's going to be there within 24 hours, as soon as they possibly can. That's what you get with Vanderford. Vanderford's going to make sure that they get there the same day in which you call within 24 hours. Not a couple days later, they're going to be there so that you are not dealing with misery for multiple days and possibly a week. That's part of their money-back guarantee. That's part of what they do for you. They do great work, and all of it's guaranteed. Best values at the lowest cost to you, a comfort assurance guarantee, a quality workmanship guarantee, performance guarantees that the repairs or the products that they and the parts that they use to replace or install for you are going to work at factory standards and be exactly what you expected to get with a 100% satisfaction guarantee or your money back being the best thing I can tell you. A 100% satisfaction guarantee or your money back means you're not going to pay if you're not pleased with what they've done for you. Check them out today, VanderfordAir.com. Better yet, just call them, 281-557-COOL, 281-557-COOL.
You're back with the Killer Bees on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Joel Blank and Jeremy Branham. Were you more happy or were you more sad when Dusty Baker said, I'm done? Oh, so Dusty will forever be remembered in a positive light. Normal fans don't care about Maldi Diaz, only diehards. Um... Well, click. There we go. Four six six one. Astros won the World Series despite Dusty. Uh, Four nine eight three. I think Joel's right on this. Casual fans don't even know Dusty is gone yet. Let's go out to the HRMP listener line seven one three seven eight zero three seven seven six. Josh, you're in the hive of the bees. What's up, Josh? Hey guys, how's it going? What's up, man? Hey, um, so uh, yeah, I, I think y'all are both right. Really, um, kind of, kind of like the other texture was saying. Um, you know, most most casual fans don't really care like Astros Twitter or radio guys care like we do. So, I mean, as a listener every day, I was ecstatic to see that Dusty was calling it quits. But I think, you know, as a casual fan, casual fans probably like Dusty. He's just an old grandpa sitting on the bench, you know, with a toothpick in his mouth. Isn't that assaulting, though? Like, hey, like only a casual would like Dusty. Like, I think that kind of proves the point. I think it's just a realism of, of the fact that we're not all – not everybody is as serious as we are about sports or a lot of the people that listen to our show. And a lot of people just get caught up in what the TV, you know, promotes. And obviously he got a whole lot of love on the way to trying to get his first World Series. That's that that's kind of where it came from. I just think that people – he's just – he's beloved. He's just a lovable kind of a teddy bear. You're right. I mean, look, we all know the mistakes in the coaching things that we picked apart – but I think that's what pe- a lot of people still remember the fact that he was Pawpaw that got his title here. Uh, 5535, I trust in dust. 6016, I was good with him leaving. 5240, bye bye, Felicia. 713 780 3776, were you happy or sad when Dusty retired? Let's go out to the HRMP listener line. Isaac, you're in the hive of the bees. What's up, Isaac? Hey, guys, how y'all doing? What's up, man? Nah, no, so I'm actually 80-20 on this. I'm 80% happy on the uh, Dusty departing and 20% sad. You know, I totally see, you know, him getting his ring and whatnot. But, however, I'm just excited for his father to get the manager job, man. I want to see what this guy's made of. Um, I am just excited for the team that we got. I see that we're stacked. Uh, And, first of all, you know, let's see what his father got, you know. Uh, Best of luck to Dusty and with the Giants and all that good stuff, but – we saw what he could do in Houston. We appreciate it, but it's time for kind of a little fresh start, even though they know it's fun for a long time. Appreciate the call. Uh, 5010, happy may be a little strong of a word, but definitely looking forward to someone new in there. 9240, last year's constant lineup changes. Maybe happy to see Dusty go. Uh, 3777, I was apprehensive about Dusty Baker when they hired him. Felt the same when he departed. 713-780-3776. Let's go back out to the HRMP listener line. John, you're in the hive with the bees. What's up, John? Hey, fellas, how y'all doing? You know, one thing I learned, you know, watching baseball all these years, when I compare when I compare A.J. Hinch rotation out of the bullpen, you know, to me personally, not knowing what pitcher to bring in, when to take a pitcher out, and that type of stuff, I thought, honestly, I thought Dusty Baker did a great job, and I thought that that is very, very important when it comes to in the middle of a game to know what pitcher to bring in, how long to leave him in there, and all that stuff. And, you know, a lot of people, they, I don't think they real. A lot of people don't understand that part of the game. But hopefully we're not going to find that out this season with the new manager that we have. I see he's doing all this moving around in the starting lineup and all that. And, okay, that's fine. But the guys, I don't care what kind of lineup you put up there, the guys still got to get the ball. But, yeah, I thought Dusty Baker was an excellent manager i'm gonna hang up and listen to you guys comment thanks a lot appreciate the call john yeah i think he was a good manager too i just don't think that people in the city were sad to see him go and maybe i am speaking a little bit more to the um more than casual fan uh but i guess that's who i deal with i don't really Mm -hmm. i guess deal with casuals uh 713-780-3776 let's go out to the hrmp listener line again josh you're in the hive of the bees what's up josh Hey guys, uh, long-time listener, love y'all, love y'all show. Uh, I disagree. I 
I really liked uh, Dusty Baker. Uh, I didn't agree with his lineups, uh, obviously. Uh, I mean, there was a, a lot of issues with the lineups that he put out every single week, uh, every single day, in my opinion. But I would have liked to see him get one more run at it. Uh, I know his pitching staff, Montero especially, just kind of crapped the bed in the playoffs and for the most of the season after putting together a career season for him the year before. I'd love to see him get one more chance, but, you know, I'll, I'm also very excited for what Joe Slotta can do coming up. Appreciate the call, man. I think, see, Jeremy, I think but depending on the demographic that we're speaking to, I think, you know, there, there's, a, there's, it could go either way because I think that the casual casuals, they are just drawn to the good story and the lovable, lovable Dusty Baker. I think for those of us that sp- spend a little bit more time, like the last call, like Josh, picking apart the lineups and seeing the mistakes that he made or the things that we didn't agree with or sitting Yiner too much or the Chaz issues or whatever it is, I think we were all excited in saying it was time for him to go. Yeah, I think people were happy with Espada. I think people, well, even before that, just new direction. Uh, I think the approval rating for Dusty Baker was pretty darn low uh, at the end of the last season. Five zero three zero. So happy to uh, to get a spotta. Six six zero seven zero. I was glad to see Pawpaw go, but respected the World Series. One 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 seven. I was freaking happy. Four six six one. Thrilled Dusty left. Uh, feel like his decisions or indecision cost us ten wins easy. Uh, four one two three. Blankers doesn't speak for the city. Could not be more wrong. Everyone wanted Dusty gone. I think it's been proven that not everyone wanted Dusty gone. But you know, where's the percentage lie? I think it's like seventy thirty. Uh, Brandon T. Thank you, Dusty. But I'm glad it's Joe now. Like that's kind of where I'm at. Like I did grow to appreciate Dusty. Like things that Dusty did that I didn't like were I. I think at the end of the day, a little bit irrelevant. Like I don't really care now. Maybe I did then two years ago what the lineup looked like on July 27th. Like, that does not really matter. Uh, what matters is trying to make your team as the best it can be by the end of the season and then going on a run and winning the World Series. Uh, and he did that. So I, I give a lot of praise to Dusty Baker for doing that. And Dusty flipped me. I became a Dusty guy. But I do think it was time, and I'm very happy that it's now Joe Espada. Yeah, I am too. I, I'm very excited. Uh, I, I was obviously very critical of Dusty through his years managing. I was trying to, you know, judge it from the perspective of the casual fan and the and the the, the fans all abroad, a broad spectrum of the Astros fans. But look, my own personal opinion is I'm extremely excited to see what Joe Espada can do because I think that he's the right balance between analytics and today's baseball. Where and he's also not afraid from time to time to still have a gut feeling. But I think he realizes that there's positivity in both of those things, and that he knows the game and the team well enough to make those calls. Four eight six five. I love Dusty. Was sad to see him go from a human perspective, but excited to have a fresh leader from a baseball standpoint. Happy to see a new leader. Uh, so happy to have a spotta. I've never even seen him coach a game. Um, love Dusty, but no one was sad to see him retire. I think Astro fans appreciate Dusty, but would say Hinch is better than Dusty because of Dusty's frequent questionable decisions. But nationally, Dusty's probably received his best because he won an untainted title. That's probably there's probably some truth to that. Uh, Dusty Baker inherited a great roster. It was more of a Barry Switzer situation. Huh. That's interesting. But don't forget the whole cheating scandal that he was hired, the initial reason why he was hired, too. Barry Switzer, no one was dealing with that. Yeah, I think that we overstate that. I know you do, and I don't. I, I think that he did it. I think if it was Buck Schulter, Showalter, who they were considering at the time, that might have been a complete disaster and dumpster fire. Why? What has Buck Joe Walter done that makes you think that would be a complete dumpster fire? Because he's a massive dictator. Because he's he's my way or the highway. Because he is very very. I think as much as we said Dusty's old school, I think he was a stricter version of old school. And I don't think that was the right fit. And because Dusty had the experience of dealing with a, a, a crisis type situation, I think he was absolutely the right guy to handle what they were dealing with from baseball, MLB's involvement, Crane's. Crane's opinions, everybody's, in, uh, you know, that had a say in everything that was going on. Hard to argue with the results. Uh, I mean, they it's hard to argue. I mean, he got you the title, got you to a couple, so it's hard to argue that. 713-780-3776. Time for our car wreck of the day. What are you nominating for the car wreck of the day? 713-780-3776. Killer Bees, ESPN 97.5 and ESPN 92.5. Guys, before we go to the break, a minute for my good friends, Chris, and everybody at X-Golf and Katie. X-Golf and Katie is absolutely awesome. If you're a golfer, you are going to love this place, and you are going to make sure you go there 
there frequently because it is golf at its finest indoors. It's the best simulators I've ever found because the putting is realistic. The chipping is realistic. You can actually chart your progress and, and, and track your shots. The shot tracker gets it down to the distance of every shot, the spin rate, uh, the direction of the ball. You can use your own golf balls if you want to make it even more realistic for you as you kind of tune up your game. And you can play over 50 courses worldwide if you want to play around in less than two hours. It's absolutely amazing. And the prices are less than getting around to golf at most, most courses. But it's also the combination of being a great golf simulator place and a great sports bar. Tons of TVs, great food and drink. It's the perfect mix of golf and a sports bar that you want to check out. Go there once. You'll be there multiple times. If it's raining outside, you lose your tee time, you can still play golf. Go to X Golf. You want to work on your game at night and you can't find a lighted range or figure out an option, you can go to X Golf and hit balls to your heart's content. Check them out today, X Golf Katie on the internet. They are absolutely fantastic. I'm telling everybody, now that they're open, you got to check them out. He's blank. I'm Branham. What are we nominating for the car wreck of the day? 713-780-3776. How about this, Jim, from uh, Joe George trying to math? Can you give up either the Bears or the Cubs? You can give up the Cubs. I don't watch the Cubs anymore. Good. Okay. You gave up the Cubs. Yeah, I don't have enough time in my life for that. See? There you go. What am I supposed to watch? Three, uh, no. 424. No. Is that math right? <laughs> That's not. No. 642. <laughs> oh, yeah, when I... 624 baseball games? Wait, what? What? Are you no. doing 162 what? times two? This has been a, just a banner <laughs> segment for math. <laughs> My first math was close. We, we went and, then I, and then I, it got worse. What? We went from ounce to line. Christ. 324 was the number you're looking for. <laughs> he was never in the same how ballpark. Did, he was did never Joe in the same Wrigley six, Field. How did Joe turn 162 times two into over 600? His first he, guess was over 400. I know. His first guess wasn't even better, and then he claimed it. Well, it was close to the, the first one. Closer yeah. doesn't mean it was any better. He How was never in the right hundreds. <laughs> he must have majored in literature. Oh. He still got to pass math. Communication Where the hell did degree. That come from? His dad was a teacher. Oh, oh man, that was a Joe. teacher. Probably got the. He was probably you know in cahoots with the math guy. Like, <laughs> how do you? He was never in the same hundreds. No, exactly. I mean, how at, would you? At, at, how the would very, you... at the very least, you should know 162 is less than 200. So if you multiply mm -hmm. it by two, it has to be less than 400. 400. I would very worst. 
Taylor is right now at a point where she's getting into fractions and everything else. Oh. I would love to have just called Taylor and go, Taylor, real quick, just for me, real quick, what's 162 plus 162? We should do... I bet you she'd say <laughs> at least something in the 300. We should do Blankster Daughter versus Joe math test. How would you have gotten to the to the answer if you were just right now on the spot, 162 plus 162? Well, because you know the hundreds, the hundreds carry, so 62 and 62 is exactly what you need to add to the 200, and you're, you're there. I would have done 150 plus 150 is 300, plus, plus 12 plus 12 is 24, 324. Yeah, I'm more with Joel. That, the way my brain works is I would add up 62 and 62, yep. figured out what that is, and then add 200 to it. I like to get a round number and then figure out the rest later. That's how, but that, but that at least gives we me kinda a ballpark. Both, I think we kind of both did that. We took the hundreds out of it. We knew there was 200 in yeah. the mix. But at 400. least you're not getting to 600. You get to 600? <laughs> They would have to play a 300 game season. He doubles down by going higher. They'd have to play every single day of the entire calendar year. That was incredible. That was. Priceless. Where's Bob Barker when you get that? Was one <laughs> mammoth <laughs> miss. Yeah. Price is right rules. He went over. Yeah. He, went over. Yeah, he doesn't win either showcase with that one. What are you nominating, Blankers? Man, there's a lot. I'm going to nominate the Milwaukee Bucks for having a 20-point lead against the Lakers last night without LeBron James and finding every way to lose, including getting to overtime and still losing. And Giannis missed an alley-oop dunk to win it. It was awful because I watched yeah. it. I saw LeBron do the – I saw the highlights of it. LeBron was doing the Counting little 10-second count late. Yeah. I was rooting for the Bucks actually. Just because, yeah, me too. You know, playing implications. Oh, and the uh, Miami Heat for not playing Jimmy Butler last night and falling and not or four starters and falling down and playing dead for the yeah, Warriors. Yeah, but the Thunder aren't playing Shea Gilgis Alexander tonight. I hear you. So it kind of evens out. Hopefully the Rockets can take advantage of that. No sh SGA. That'd be nice. I'm going with Draymond Green grabbing Patty Mills by the throat. This guy's a walking problem. That was a He's common a foul, wasn't problem. it? Yeah, they didn't, even, they didn't even upgrade it. It was a normal common foul. Well, he, like, him grabbed him by the neck and yanked him down. What's that going was, like, on in there? the first minute that and is, a half that, of the game. That wasn't is it? a was common foul early? for Draymond. <laughs> I didn't realize it was in the first minute and a half it of the game. It was really – I, I think I looked down the at the replay, and the scoreboard said, like, five to four. I'm like, why are we doing this now, at all, let alone at all? That guy's a mess, man. I would not want that guy on my team anymore. Sorry. Don't want him on my team. Brian, nominate something? Uh, well, besides Joe, I'll quickly go with Oregon State and Washington State. The fallout from the Pac-12 uh, dying. is they're gonna, It sounds like they're going to get their next TV contract on the CW. Yikes. Poor Oregon State and Washington State. So they'll be able to live in the ACC? I guess, yeah. How well, basically, they they, they'll be, in, a, they'll be in, a, in complete obscurity. No one's going to watch that. What are, they, like, what, what are they selling? Like one game? Beats me. Yeah. Um, they're, the the CW has been just trying their hardest to try and get into the sports game. They're just taking whatever they can get their hands on. No, I'm, I'm talking about the Pac-12. What are they I know. selling to, C, to the CW? They're selling one game, I guess. It's kind of cool, though, that Oregon State and Washington State get all these like uh, units from the NCAA tournament from these Pac-12 teams, and they all have to buy them out. So they're going to be sitting like on a mountain of money, and they just have like nothing to do with it because they're going to be playing non-Power 5 sports. It's kind of weird. All right, what's winning – it's got to be Joe. Yeah, it has to be Joe. But that's it. In a landslide. Yeah. Okay. I'm good with that. By the Joe way, George, watch Josh Giddy tonight, too, because Joe said Josh Giddy sucks. I don't like Josh Giddy. Josh Giddy doesn't have a jump shot. Josh Giddy's a good basketball player. I don't like his off-the-court decisions. All right, does it for us. Thanks to Brian for doing all the hard work. He's blank on Branham. Come see the boys tomorrow at the decoy. Coming up next, Glenn Davis, Soccer Matters, round two in the Killer Bees bracket. He'll be breaking down Copa America coming here in the summer. Talk to you tomorrow, Houston.
Ah, oh, the drama yesterday in Euro qualification. We'll talk about it tonight. Soccer Matters, Daspit Law Firm is on the air. And we are now through with the international window, so it's back to business in domestic leagues all around the world. Today we're talking Copa America, Premier League, the international window, thoughts and updates, crazy scenes with Georgia, Poland, and the Ukraine all qualifying for the Euros. Local action, Houston Dynamo back at home looking to make it three in a row, taking a full nine points out of nine after a stunning late goal to beat Colorado. We'll talk about the Dynamo and Dash tonight as well. Plus, we're going to break down Columbia, uh, one of the hottest teams in the world right now. I think it's 2021 20, games under Nestor Lorenzo. They have not lost the 58-year-old Argentine coach. And they will be coming to Houston. And as we all know, we have a lot of Colombian very, very, very passionate soccer fans in our city. So uh, that is going to be something special. Um, I'd be lining up for those tickets, frankly. Colombia, Paraguay, that's the second match we'll have here. But we'll, we're going to talk about the Colombian national team here tonight.